Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I saw something the other day that's as typical of New York as the Empire State Building. I was walking down 2nd Avenue when I spotted some kids around the fire hydrant. They had turned it on and the whole gang was splashing around, keeping cool. They'd done something else, too. They'd found a barrel... And I suddenly remembered when I used to play in the gutter with the same kind of barrel. It's open at both ends, and when it's held over the gushing hydrant, it acts like a big hose, and a lot of passing New Yorkers can end up pretty wet. I stopped and watched, and just like always, one of New York's finest showed up and the kids scattered. He turned off the water, and the fun was over. Oh, but not for long. Somebody was sure to give the kids a monkey ranch, and ten minutes after the cop had disappeared, the street would be flooded again. Yeah, kid can have a lot of fun, even in a big city. But it's unfortunate that every once in a while there's a boy who forgets to have fun and heads for trouble. Like a case I got mixed up in not long ago. It all started in a candy store under the L on 9th Avenue. I'm just closing up, boys. We want to talk to you, Pop. I told you I was closing up. Come back tomorrow and we can talk then. Eddie said he wanted to talk to you, Pop. You better listen. Hey, what is this? You kids get out of my store. You want to buy something, you come back tomorrow. You ain't been making enough on your number sales. We come to see why not. Oh, so that's it. First, they threaten to beat me up unless I sell the numbers. Then they get sore because I ain't selling enough and send young hoodlums to see that I do. Well... You go tell your boss that I'm through selling numbers to poor people who think they can get rich quick. You tell your boss if he don't like it, I'm going to the police. You tell your boss that. Sure, we'll tell him. But he wants us to tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you bunch of no goods. Now you get out of here. Oh, no, that ain't nice. Is it, Jim? No, that ain't nice at all. I told you to get out. If you don't, I'll call a cop. You ain't calling anybody, Pop. Here, what are you doing? You get away. Help, please. No, no, please, help. Shut up. Okay, Jim, make him shut up. Please, I'm an old man. Yeah, yeah, sure you are, Pop, but old guys like you need exercise. <laughs> Think he's had enough, eh? Yeah, grab some of them cigarettes and cigars off the counter. Yeah, sure. Hey, we better get out of here. Maybe somebody heard him yelling. Okay, grab me a box of candy, too. I got a date with Nancy tonight. I'll grab a couple. I got a date, too. Let's go. Down this alley. Yeah. Okay, okay, slow it down. Yeah. Let's get over to 27th Street. Okay. Come on, Mr. Parrish wants to see us. Right. Uh, hey, Ed. Yeah? You go up to see your brother today? Yeah. How's he doing? He's doing all right. Ain't he scared or nothing? <laughs> What's the matter, Eddie? Oh! Hey, what did I say? What did I say, huh? I told you once not to say nothing about my brother. I was just asking. I didn't say nothing, hey. You asked if he was scared, didn't you? Okay, okay. Well, he ain't scared. He's a big shot. He wasn't scared of the guy knocked off by the cops or nothing else, see? Not even a hot seat. <laughs> hey, that's the cop who spotted us. Come on. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, we filtered the choke on the way to your throat. Oh, for Pete's sake, Diamond, aren't you ever serious? Well, Lieutenant Levinson, what's the matter with you? Did someone swipe one of your ulcers? Now, stop that. I wouldn't call you unless it was something important. I know. You're losing Sergeant Otis to Barnum and Bailey. You stop that. Ringling Brothers? Don't be ridiculous. I'm not. What other sideshow could boast a pointed head with a gray suede face? Diamond. I have an important message for you, so for the sake of my sour stomach, act like a normal human being for five minutes. Ah, uh, sure to be a strain, but go ahead. Bill Garrett wants to see you. Bill Garrett? Yes. He goes to the electric chair tonight at 8 o'clock, and he wants to see you. Well, he can't sit in my lap. Now, look, I don't like the type any more than you do. He's going to die, so why the cracks? The guy he shot had a wife and two kids. Maybe you want me to make cracks about them? All right, all right, but will you see him? It's his last request. All right, sure. 
I'll call the warden and tell him you'll be up. Well, you be sure and put in the call. If Otis does it, the warden will get so confused they'll turn Garrett loose and toast me. Well, in my business, you get a lot of scurry ones. But you never know where they'll lead, so if you've got that nervous, got to get in trouble feeling, you follow it up. I put in a call to my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, and told her I'd be a little late, but to keep the bottle spinning anyway. Then I took off for Sing Sing. Hello, Garrett. Hello, Simon. I'm glad you got here. Wouldn't miss it. Neither would I, unless I could help it. Look, Garrett, I'm busy and you're on a tight schedule. Now, what's on your mind? Well, it's like this, Rick. The name's Diamond. Okay. I know you hate guys like me, but I ain't ashamed of what I've done. That's the way I lived. That's the way I'm going to go out. Now, if you want someone to listen to you feel sorry for yourself, you'll be along in a few minutes before eight. Uh, maybe I better forget it. You ain't got no use for nothing. I got use for everything that doesn't include guys like you. There's no middle with me, Garrett. It's got to be right or wrong. And uh, right keeps you out of trouble, huh? Well, not always. But it helps people to live together. Okay. I guess you know I got a kid brother. Yeah. He's going on 17, and it looks like the family's going to have another guy for you to hate. What do you want me to do? He thinks I'm a big shot. I want you to convince him I'm not. Oh? What's he done? I don't know, but he's just like I was when I was that age. Tough, wise guy. He wants to be just like me. Oh. Has he been up here to see you? Yeah, but that don't change his mind. Just makes him madder at the world. I ain't getting soft, see, but he's a great little guy and he's smart. A lot smarter than I was. It's just going to take someone to show him which foot to get off on. Ah, uh, okay, okay. What's his first name and where can I find him? His name's Eddie. He's got a club they call the Panthers. Uh, you know the kind. Yeah, with me it was the Brownies. It's over on 26th Street and he's got a girl he told me about. Her name's Nancy Hyde. She lives with a rant over 37th Street. Okay, I'll see what happens. He's tough. Oh, lots of guys are tough, Garrett. Sometimes if they get a break, they turn out to be so tough, they even get to be all American. Hey, I'd like that. I'd like to see the kid get to be all American. That might be a little difficult, but you never know. Maybe they've got television down there. The kid's around here, boss. Okay, Eddie, go on in. Thanks, muscle man. Hiya, Mr. Parrish. Hello, Eddie. We took care of old man Thompson like you said. Good, good. You, uh, beat him up bad? Bad enough. Yeah, yeah, we really waked him over. We got Shut up, I'll do the talking. What do you think's running this mob anyway? Okay, okay. <laughs> Get a load of that, Bart. We got a big shot. Yeah, yeah. You run your bunch pretty good, don't you, Eddie? I run the whole club. The Panthers got 23 members now. You hear that, Bud? Twenty-three members, and Eddie's the big boss. <laughs> I like that. I like you, Eddie. You and me and the twenty-three Panthers is gonna go a long way. Well, that's something I wanted to talk to you about, Mr. Parrish. We're getting awful tired of just beating up guys. We want to start doing something big, like knocking over gas stations or something. <laughs> so you want to start doing something big, huh? Like knocking over gas stations, huh? Yeah. Well, you got a lot to learn, Eddie. Well, I've been doing all right, ain't I? Well, you're going to do a lot better. How would you and the Panthers like to start making some really big cash? Hey, we'd like that. Shut up. We... <laughs> well, what does the boss say? The boss says great. What do we do? It's a cinch. Bart, go out in front and see that we ain't disturbed. Yeah, sure thing, boss. Bart carries a gun, don't he, Mr. Parrish? Yeah, Eddie. He carries a big one. I'm going to carry one someday. Sure you are. You're going to be a big shot. But you got to learn first. You got to start from the bottom to be a big shot. Now, here's the pitch. You get your gang together and explain that. The... Swipe cars, so we swipe cars. I don't know, Ed. Beating up guys is one thing, but swiping cars is pretty dangerous. Look, it's a cinch. We go out in the road someplace, and one of us thumbs a ride. Huh? When the car stops, we all jump in. Later on, we knock the guy over the skull and take the car. Oh, stealing cars is a tough rap. If you get caught, but we don't get caught, see? If we catch a stoop out in the road someplace, it'll take him a long time to get to a phone. We drive the car to Mr. Parrish's warehouse and collect 50 bucks. Easy. I don't know. You better know. 
You're in the gang, and that means you're in on it whether you like it or not. Okay, okay, Ed. You're the boss. Okay. They pull the first job tonight. The, the, I, I thought you had a date with Nancy. Oh, I got a date. I can break it. She does what I tell her. Yeah, but... Hey, what do you want? Yeah. This is a private club. I'm, uh, looking for Eddie Garrett. Who we'll wants him? Nobody for a present, but I'm still looking for him. Well, beat it. You smell like a cop. You got a good nose. That's pretty close. Hey, just some... Shut up. We ain't seen any. Uh, yeah, that's right. We ain't seen him. Okay, but if you do, tell him I got a message from his brother. From my... From his brother? Yeah. Tell him that if you see him. Oh, oh wait a minute. I'm Eddie Garrett. Good for you. Proud of it? Oh, you're a wise guy, ain't you? I'll tell you later. Your brother says he thinks you're in trouble, are you? Trouble? <laughs> that's a hot one. What made him think that? He runs around with it. He says you think you're a big shot. Maybe I do. Then you're in trouble, Sonny. Oh, what are you talking to this guy for, Eddie? He talks crazy. Why don't we throw the bum out? How are you going to do it? Grow 12 feet? Oh, you're a pretty wise guy, you are. You wouldn't act so wise on the other end of a shiv. Shut up, Jim. Come on, get out of here. What about this wise guy, Ed? You want to be left alone with him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, but I'd still like to wake this wise guy over. <laughs> Hey, hey, what's the idea? You tripped me. Ed, you see that? That's why this guy tripped me. You're pretty clumsy, Sonny. Now beat it. No, wh why you... You hate him? Beat it. You're lucky you didn't pull that knife, Jim. You look pretty silly with a broken arm. Yeah. Well, okay, okay, wise guy. I'll see you again. Now tell me what you want, and then you get out of here, too. Nice clubhouse you got. It's all right. It's, uh, six o'clock. So it's six o'clock. Doesn't it bother you? Two more hours and your brother dies. So what? So he doesn't want you to end up the same way. Don't you worry about me, mister. Your brother's worried about you. He wants me to help you. How about it? I don't need no help. You're a copper. Guys like you that sent my brother to the chair. I'm not a cop, Eddie, but I used to be. You ain't a cop? No, but if I was just a plumber and I had the chance to put your brother away for a killing, I'd do it. Yeah, I thought so. You look like the type. You're still a copper and you're no good. Now go on, get out of here. I don't need no help from a lousy copper. I don't need no help from anybody. Hey, Eddie, I... Oh, didn't know you was at the painting. This guy's just going. Come on in, boy. Let's go, Eddie. What do you mean, let's go? I want to talk to you. We'll go up to my place. I ain't going nowhere with a lousy copper. Copper? Yeah, yeah, he's been in here preaching to me. Better leave, Flatfoot. Come on, Eddie. No, I ain't going nowhere. You heard what the kid said. Now look. Yeah. Well, well, well. Guns and everything. Like it? Goes bang, bang. Hey, hey, wait a minute, boss. I don't want no killing. Oh, don't worry, Eddie. I'm just going to put the flat foot to sleep. Oh. Hey, you slugged him with the gun. Mr. Parrish wants to see you about tonight. Huh? Okay. He, he ain't dead, is he? No, no. I just tapped him a little one. Come on. Tap me a little one. <laughs> that was the biggest understatement of the year. He tapped me so little, my, health, my head felt like it was in sections. I lay there for a while trying to find the piece that did my thinking, and when I started coming out of it, it was like trying to open a beach umbrella in a 90-mile wind. I didn't know how long I'd been lying there, but when I finally opened my eyes, I, I saw something that made the beating a welcome relief. Hey, look, Lieutenant. He's with us again. <laughs> oh, no. Shut up, Otis. Rick, how do you feel? Uh, I wish I was dead. Oh, now it can't be that bad. No. Well, you lie down here and look up at Otis. Makes you want to slash your wrist. Hey, he's riding me again. You're all right. Here, try to, try to sit up. Without my head? Oh. Now, who beans you? A guy named Bart Lippett. He didn't know me, but I recognized him. Small-time muscle man. Works for Sam Parrish. A lovely group. So how the devil did you find me? Well, we certainly weren't looking for you. We came down to pick up Bill Garrett's kid brother. Pick him up? What for? Your job's ho homicide. Yeah, he and another kid beat up an old storekeeper last night. The guy's in pretty serious condition. Oh, no. How serious, Walt? Well, the doctors say critical, but he does stand a chance. Hey, now, wait a minute. Where are you going? What time is it? Seven o'clock. Why? I got an hour to keep a promise. I hope that storekeeper doesn't die. If he does, Sing Sing will be building their electric chairs in tandem. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. 
But first, traffic accidents claim a victim on the average of more than one a minute, all day, every day in the year. The difficulty is that people continue to think of the horror of accidents as always happening to someone else. It never occurs to us that we may be killed dashing out to lunch tomorrow. The National Safety Council reports that in almost every motor vehicle accident, there is one or more violations of the law. Speed, drink, and carelessness being the worst offenders. Every motorist and pedestrian is urged to support actively the safety movement in his own community. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. And now back to Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Well, the law was after Eddie Garrett, and I'd promised his brother that I'd keep him out of trouble. If the storekeeper died, Eddie was sure to get life. But if he lived and I could make him give himself up, I'd stand a good chance of helping him. I remember that Garrett had said Eddie had a girl, so I took off to 37th Street in a hurry. Yes? Are, uh, are you Nancy Hyde? Why? Well, I, uh, I'm looking for Eddie. Oh, uh, well, I, I haven't seen him. Hmm? Huh? You're a little nervous. Well, no, I'm just a little worried. About Eddie? Who are you? Oh, I know his brother. He wanted me to find Eddie. Oh, his brother. Well, I don't know where Eddie is, and you stay away from him. You uh, don't approve of Eddie's brother? No, and I'm not afraid to say it. Eddie's a good boy, but he worships his big brother, and he thinks he's tough. So you can just go tell his brother that Eddie's not going to turn out like him. Not if I can help it. Oh, he's not if I can help it either. I am a private detective, Nancy. My name's Diamond. You said that Eddie's brother wants you to find Eddie. He does, but he wants to keep Eddie out of trouble as much as you do. Oh, well, honestly, Mr. Diamond, I don't know where Eddie is. He called me a little while ago and said that he might be able to come over late. And he didn't say where he was? No. Hmm. Well, if he does come, try to keep him here, and I'll get in touch with you later on. All right, Mr. Diamond. I went down the hall and back down the steps in a hurry. When I reached the street, I stopped and waited for a cab to come along. I took out a cigarette was just about to light it when I spotted a shadow ducking in behind the doorways and making its way up the street toward me. I slipped back in the building and waited. Hey, what is this? Take it easy, Eddie. Oh, the copper. Let me go. That storekeeper you beat up may die. I'm taking you down to the station. What? That's right. He's in a bad way. Now, come on. Let's go. I might have known it. But you said you wanted to help me. That's a laugh. This is the only way I can help you. Oh, sure. Well, if the law picks you up, you won't, won't stand a chance. You may even get shot. Well, I'll take my chances. Not tonight, you won't. Let me go. Let go of my arm. Now, look, I don't want to hurt you, so stop kicking. Yeah, this is swell, this is. Everybody wants to help me. My brother's going to the chair, and if that old guy dies, I'm going to prison. Please let me go. I just as soon get shot. I ain't got nothing to live for. Now, take it easy, kid. The old boy might not die, then we can work something out. <laughs> what was that? That's Nancy. That's Nancy. Let me go. Come on. I turned him loose and we both went up the stairs three at a time We reached the door and I got that lousy feeling The screams had stopped and from the way she was yelling It would take a lot to shut her up Like dying It's locked Nancy Nancy She don't answer Look out She ain't here I Look in the other room Nancy Nancy She ain't here either Hey, what's the gun for? Get rid of the window, quick. What, what's the matter? That car driving off down there, you know it? Oh, why? Because I saw your girl being pushed in it. I couldn't take a shot because it might have hit her. He took it down the fire escape. Yeah. Eddie. Eddie, who would want to kidnap Nancy? I don't know. I don't know. You're working for Sam Parrish, aren't you? How did you know that? I recognized his muscle man just before he put me to sleep. I ain't saying nothing. Now look, you stupid little idiot. Aren't you worried about your girl? Yeah, sure I'm worried about her. What's that got to do with Mr. Parrish? Nothing, maybe. But if he heard that the law was looking for you, he might be afraid you'd talk. What were you and your gang doing for Paris? I, I, I can't tell you. Okay, okay, then you're on your own. If the girl gets killed, they'll let you cry about it for the rest of your life and sing sing. I'm through trying to help you, Eddie. You're too far gone. You're no good. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Diamond, please. I'll tell you, I don't want Nancy hurt. Please, I, I don't know what to do. Well, first, try to take it easy. And then tell me what you were doing for Sam Parrish. We used to beat up guys that wouldn't sell enough numbers. Mr. Parrish controls a lot of the numbers racket. We were supposed to start swiping cars. He was going to pay us 50 bucks a car. Oh, call him. Call him? Yeah. Here's the phone. But for Pete's sake, don't let on that you know anything's up. Okay. I want you to tell him that you've decided to give yourself up. Okay. 
If he's got Nancy, I'll kill him. You just be sure and tell him that you're going to give yourself up. He'll tell you whether he's got Nancy or not. Yeah. Mr. Parrish? Eddie, is that you? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Me and Bart have been looking all over town for you. The uh, cops are after you. I know. I'm going to give myself up. You what? Yeah, it's better this way. They might go easier on me if I do. Look, kid, you, you got to stop talking like that. You're going to be a big shot. You can't go turning yourself into the law. No, I'm going to do it. Uh, you come down here and talk to me first. Uh, where are you? It's no good, Mr. Parrish. I'm leaving for the station right now. Eddie? Yeah? You ain't going nowhere unless you want to see your girlfriend scooped out of the East River. You have got her. Sure, I got her. So you get on down here. I just left her and she don't look so happy. She's with Bart and you know Bart. Well, you dirty no look, good grease ball. You get out of my office in 20 minutes or I'll call Bart and the little girl dies. Now get down here. Hello. Hello. He's got her, Mr. Diamond. I gotta get down there or he'll kill her. Where's his office? He don't have Nancy there. He told me she was with Bart. I, I gotta go. You do and he'll kill you. Then he'll do the same with the girl. You can't take the chance. What are we gonna do? I only got 20 minutes. Does Parrish have another office or a hideout? No, no. Wait a minute. Yes, he does. Sure, the warehouse. He told me about it this afternoon. We were supposed to take our stolen cars there. Okay. I'll call Lieutenant Levinson and tell him to meet us there. You think that's where they got Nancy? I hope so. 20 minutes isn't much time. I put in a call to Walt and briefed him in a hurry. Then Eddie and I took off to the warehouse. It was at the foot of 14th Street, and by the time we got there, we had only 10 minutes left. The building was as dark as a foggy grave and locked tight. We found a window in the basement and finally jimmied our way in. You all right, Eddie? Yeah, but I, I can't see nothing. Come on. That looks like some stairs. Maybe we guessed wrong. Hey, what was that? I don't know, but there was a jockey on it. Come on. Hey, look. There's a light. Yeah. A little office in the back. Now, you stay here. There might be some shooting. Uh -uh. If Bart's in there with Nancy, I want in on it. This is no time to argue. Now, back over against the wall. Gosh, I bumped into some boxes or something. Oh, shut up. Look. It's Bart. Hold still. Who's there? What are we going to do? He's got a gun. Answer him. Answer him? Yeah, quick. Come on, come on. Who's out there? Uh, it's uh, me, Bart, Eddie. Huh? What are you doing here? We've been looking all over for you. I'm on the lam. The cops are after me, so I remembered this place. Well, ain't that nice. The boss been worrying about you. Come on back, Eddie. <laughs> Got a friend of yours here. Go on. I'm going to circle him. Uh, sure, sure, Bart. Uh, I'm coming. Come on over here where I can see you. Yeah. That's it. Okay, kid. Now, hold it right there. Hey, what's the idea? Well, the boss is afraid you'll do some talking if the cops pick you up, so I got orders to knock you off. Sorry, kid. You know how it is. Drop it, Bart. Hey, hey he wait. He said drop it! Oh, you, you love Duck, you... Eddie. <laughs> you got him. Yeah, thanks for the assist. Let's see if the girl's in the office. Yeah, they got a gag in the mouth. Nancy. <laughs> Oh, she's okay. There. Oh, Nancy, honey. Oh, Here, I'll get those ropes off you. Nan, I'm in some pretty bad trouble, but I swear if I get out of it, I'll go straight. Oh, you'll be all right, Eddie. I know you will. Oh, ain't that cozy. Look out, Eddie. Hold it right where you are. Well, things are really getting crowded. That's Parrish, Mr. Diamond. I guess. You shoot pretty good, Diamond. I saw you get Bart. I guess I'm going to have to pay you back for that. The law's on its way. So they find a more. Eddie! Oh, shoot, Nancy, please. Shoot me, but don't shoot Nancy. Here they come, Parrish. You seem pretty anxious, mister, so I'll let you have it first. No! No, you can't! Look out, Eddie! Oh, Eddie! You slob, Parrish! Oh, Eddie! Eddie, he's hurt, Mr. Diamond. Those Parrish, but his is permanent. Eddie. Eddie, where you hit? I think in the stomach. We'll get you to a hospital quick. You saved my scalp and you jumped in front of me. Thanks. How about Parrish? I paid him in full. What time is it? 8.35, Eddie. Oh. Funny, I don't feel so bad about my brother now that it's over. He'd probably be sore about me helping a cop. But you know, I don't mind. Especially when it's a 
nice guy like you. Well, Walt busted in. They got Eddie to the hospital. Otis tripped over a pipe and broke his big toe, so they had to throw him in the wagon along with Eddie and his girl. Eddie recovered all right, and so did the storekeeper. He helped beat up. The kids all got two years, sentence suspended, because my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, convinced the judge that the boys would become much better citizens if they worked out their two years on her farm upstate milking the cows. Before Eddie left for the farm, Helen had him over to the house, and he brought his girlfriend. Well, we got to be going, Mr. Diamond. i got to catch a train. Thanks for the swell dinner, Miss Asher. It was my pleasure, Eddie. It was wonderful. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Nancy? Miss Asher was telling me that you sing. Oh, Miss Asher is sometimes afflicted with an extreme case of blabitis. Well, hey, I'd like to hear you sing something before I take off. Would you, Mr. Diamond? Certainly he would. Do you want it after I tear out your pretty tongue at the lungs or before you, dear sweet little girl? Now, you mustn't talk that way in front of guests, Rick. They'll think we're married. Well, he's not as tough as he sounds. Now, come on, Mr. Diamond, give. Yeah, I'll give you a hit in the head. Hold on, after Eddie hears me, uh, he may realize that crime does pay. It's on your pretty head. Just sing. Stop making like a prima donna. What do you want to hear? Oh, uh, something romantic. Oh, <laughs> bless your little pointed head. You kids go sit on the sofa. Okay. Come on. Where are you now that I need you? Now that I want you so badly, I'm surprised. Where are you? Where did fate lead you? Funny how I dreamed you'd still be standing by. The pretty one. I had you at my beck and call. I called you any time at all. I guess I took you too much for granted. I never thought I'd lie awake and sigh. Where are you? Now that I need you, now that I love you so madly, I could die. Oh, how was that, kids? Rick, look. Well, how do you like that? They're stealing our stuff. <laughs> Come on, Eddie, break it up now. You got to catch a train. Mm. Eddie. Mm. Nancy. Oh, my goodness. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Sheldon Leonard, William Tracy, Mary Shipp, Sidney Miller, and Bill Conrad. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here, transcribed, is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. And now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
Hello there, this is Diamond. If you happen to wake up some morning and spot something walking in front of your house and it looks like Santa Claus with jaundice, don't turn the hose on him. He's not on fire. He's just wearing the newest thing in men's fashions. They call it the bold look. And it's supposed to be the masculine answer to Dior's new look for women. It's an answer, all right. Like walking up to your best girlfriend and slicing her down the middle with a broadsword. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, just close your eyes and try and picture yourself in the bold look. Imagine walking down Fifth Avenue, very casual, decked out in a new bright purple non-shrinking suit, pastel shirt, yellow maybe, hand-painted tie and argyle socks. Got it? What do you think? Pretty bad. About the only thing I can think of that's more gruesome is that little murder I got mixed up in last week. It started in a house out on Long Island. A guy named Harry Baker was getting involved with his private secretary. Here are the papers you wanted, Mr. Baker. Oh, thank you, Connie. What time is Mrs. Baker going shopping? She didn't say. This afternoon sometime. Where is she now? In her room. Come here, Connie. Harry, no. Supposing she comes down. I didn't see you last night. I missed you. I got hold of the man you wanted. His name's Nat Fox. He wants 500 for the job. Oh? Well, what's the matter? That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Connie, I had a lot of time to think last night. And? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know if this is the thing to do. You don't know? Oh, Harry, we've gone through this a dozen times, and I won't go through it again. If you haven't got the backbone... Oh, my dear, you know it's not that. No, I do not. I'm sick and tired of living this way. Not being able to be seen with you, watching you being pushed around by that old shrew... Oh, I'm not going through the whole thing again. Please, Connie, can't we wait for a while? My wife's well past 60. Sooner or later... And in the meantime, you live off the skimpy little allowance she doles out to you. No, Harry, no. I want us to live like two normal people. If you're going to start changing your mind just when it looks like we can have all these things, I'm through. Now, Connie, wait a minute. No. If you want me, then you've got to go through with it. Well? You know I want you. I love you more than anything in the whole world. Well, get that old biddy out of the way, or I promise you, you'll never see me again. <sighs> All right. Oh, don't look so worried, darling. Nothing's going to go wrong. I already fixed it with this Nat Fox. You'll be in the department store at the same time as your wife. Oh, Harry, think of the wonderful life we can have. All that money's going to be ours. We can go to Europe and live the way we should. Yes, sir. Uh... No, I'm a little worried about this Nat Fox. Uh, I'll give him the $500, but if he finds out what happened, he'll be in a good position to blackmail us. Don't you worry about Mr. Fox. He's my affair. You just leave everything to me. Well, well, well. Hello, Otis. Uh, what do you want, Diamond? I thought I'd drop in and see the lieutenant. Aren't you glad? You want me to make you feel good or do you want the horrible truth? The truth, Otis. I'll steal myself. You turn my stomach. I couldn't without a bulldozer. Ah, uh, very funny. <laughs> when are you going to go on a diet, Sergeant? Eh? You're beginning to look like Dumble with a goiter. Uh... Hello, Walt. Oh, No. Who's dead this time? No, don't be silly. I just came down to talk to see how you were. I don't believe it. Say something without corpse in it. Your smile is like the first dawn of an Indian summer. You said Indian. So what? If you said it, he's dead. All right. If that's the way you feel about it, goodbye and good luck. Oh, now, wait a minute. Stop being an idiot. That's all right, Walt. I understand. Now, now come back here. You know very well I'm glad to see you. And you think just because I come down to see you, I've gotten mixed up in some kind of a murder. Oh, I... Fine friend. Now, you stop acting like that. You're a worse ham than Otis. Not dead if. I'll never send you a good dead body again. Is that a promise? Is what a promise? That you'll never send me a good dead body again. Oh, want me to break the law, huh? Hold out police evidence. Of course not. You know I was only kidding. Just like the police force, making fun of a corpse. I have never made fun of a corpse. So that's what's the matter. What? Too serious. That's what's ruining your stomach. Oh, now, stop that. You know what's wrong with my stomach. I've been working too hard, that's all. So the next time I find a corpse, you'll want to take a vacation. This precinct is more corrupt than I thought. What do you mean, corrupt? Just what I said. 
I find you a corpse and you won't even look at it. You want to go on a vacation. I don't want to go on a vacation. I'll look at the corpse. What corpse? The one you wanted me to look at. There you go, acting like I've gotten mixed up in another killing. Trying to make it look like the corpse is mine. What? Well, it's not my corpse. It isn't? No. Well, whose is it? Well, you know. You tried to frame me with it. I did not. Don't you try to shove that body off on me. Yeah, what is it? Oh, hello, Helen. It's for you, Rick. Thanks. Hi, baby. Uh, hold it a minute. Walt, you better do something about that body. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. Otis, put in a general alarm. Diamond's found another killing. Oh, wait a minute. No, Walt, it's your killing, remember? Oh, yeah. Forget about the general alarm, Otis. I've got... Oh, Diamond. Sure, Helen. I'll meet you at the store. Oh. Sure, sure. I love you. Bye. Oh. Walt. What a funny look. You're all red. Oh. Walt. Walt, you're turning blue. Oh. Well, I got to go shopping with Helen. I hope you find the body. Bye. Lieutenant, I'm still waiting. Sergeant. Yeah, Lieutenant? Shut up! I don't know why I do that to Walt, but I always get such a kick out of tying him up in knots. When he takes the bait, he goes for it hook, line, and sinker. It's a good thing Helen called and asked me to go shopping with her, or he might have blown a fuse. I don't generally like the idea of shopping, but she said it was Francis's birthday, and any kind of an afternoon with Helen could always work its way into a wonderful evening. What do you think I ought to get him, Rick? I'll get him some shirts or something. Hey, look at these. Rick, get away from that counter. What's the matter? My hip's too big? Oh. Oh, I wonder if these come in baby blue. Rick, now stop that. People are looking. Is there something I can do for you? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You seem to be interested in the lingerie. Is there something I can show you? Oh, uh, I'm looking for something for a birthday. Oh, well, then may I suggest a nightgown, perhaps? We have some lovely numbers. Uh, This is for a butler. A butler? Uh, Yes. Oh, then you were thinking of getting something for the lady, too. Uh, No. Just seeing whether the baby blue went with my eyes. Well, really. Oh, come on, Helen. Rick, she must think you're crazy. Five minutes more and there wouldn't have been the slightest doubt. (laughs) This is fun. Rick. Hmm? That woman. What woman? The elderly one over there with the mink stove. Oh, yeah. I just saw her put a box of stockings in her purse without anyone seeing her. You saw her? Yes, but the clerk didn't. And she left the counter without paying. I know. You know? Oh, sure. I spotted her five minutes ago. Not a very good shoplifter. That's stealing. Shouldn't we tell the manager or something? Oh, the store detectives are sure to have her spotted. Why don't they arrest her? Point of law, baby. They can't put the arm on her until she steps out of the store. Now, look. She's going out the front door. Just watch. She's out. She's just standing there on the sidewalk. Oh, that's funny. They must have spotted her. She was too careless. Look, that big car is pulling up and she's getting in. They're driving off. Well, maybe the store dicks were looking out the window. Well, I'm going to tell that clerk. I remember her description. Oh, now, Clerk! Helen. Yes? Oh, did your husband decide that they did go with this baby blue eyes? He's not my husband, and that's not why I called you. Uh, she thinks yellow goes with my complexion better. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, stop it, Rick. That woman who was just at your counter. Uh, which one? We've only had about 600 this morning. Now, don't be flip with me. The elderly woman who was just here looking at the stockings. The one with the beautiful mink stole. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Then you noticed her. Of course. That was Mrs. Baker, one of our best customers. Well, Mrs. Baker is a shoplifter. Oh, you must be mistaken. I tell you, I saw her steal some sacking. I tell you, you were mistaken. Oh, now, look, look. I, I was going to stay out of this, but what Miss uh, Asher says is true. I saw her, too. Miss Asher? Yes. Oh, you have an account with us, don't you, Miss Asher? Until you started telling me I was mistaken about that woman. Oh, just one moment. Oh, Mr. Pennywig! Mr. Pennywig. What are you doing? I'm calling the manager. The manager? Yes, Miss Asher. I would prefer to have him explain it to you. Yes, Miss Phillips. What is it? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Don't ever put Miss Phillips in the toy department. She's so nearsighted, she's liable to think the electric train is the 8th Avenue subway and climb on it at 5 o'clock. I what? beg your pardon? Uh, Mr. Pennywig, this is Miss Helen Asher. Oh, how do you do, Miss Asher? I heard a lot about you. You're going to hear a lot more. Oh, is something wrong? Yes. Yes, something is wrong. Miss Asher here spotted a woman stealing some stockings, and when she reported it to your clerk here, she said she was crazy. 
I saw it, too. Is this true, Miss Phillips? Uh, yes, sir. It was Mrs. Lillian Baker. Oh. I was just trying to do the store a favor, but since you don't seem to think that the customer means anything around here, I'll see that my account is closed out. Oh, now, oh. just one moment, Miss Asher. Uh, may I talk with you in private? I don't see why. Come on, baby. I know a joint on Broadway where we can get things without the lip that goes with it. Come on. Oh, please, Miss Asher. It's about the shoplifter, Mrs. Lillian Baker. You can tell me right here. I must rely on your integrity to keep this a secret. You see, we know that Mrs. Baker stole those stockings. She steals something nearly every day. What? She's very wealthy, very eccentric, and very much a kleptomaniac. Oh. Her husband handles all her affairs, and he's instructed us to watch her and send him the bills for the goods she steals. Oh. Well, can't you break her the habit? Her husband must lock his pants in the family vault every night. Yes. <laughs> She's under a doctor's care, and he advises letting her continue, but without her knowing that anyone else has found out her secret. Uh, she's quite old, you see, and her husband assures us that discovery might be very disastrous. Oh, I see. Well, I'm very sorry. I didn't know. Well, I'm not. This pixie behind all the unmentionables can get a person steamed up enough to cause a minor explosion. <sighs> I was just doing my duty, sir. Mr. Pennywood. Mr. Pennywig. Now what? Uh, yes, uh, well, what is it? Oh, Mr. Pennywig, we've had a jewel robbery. What? Yes, sir. Three of our most priceless gems are missing. Oh, dear. Mrs. Baker? I don't know, sir. We watch her very closely when she's looking at jewelry. But five minutes after she'd gone, we discovered the loss. Was it of any consequence? Was it? $300,000 worth. Oh, oh. Hey, wait a minute. Who else was in the jewelry department? Oh, several people. I'm so upset. Take a look over there. Where? Over there. The man in the wide pen stripe near the linen counter. Excuse me, I've got to go call Mr. Baker. Now, wait a minute. Yes? Maybe Mrs. Baker didn't lift those rocks. That man over there, was he in the jewelry department? Why, come to think of it, yes. Oh, now wait here. Rick! Hello, Nat. Hey, what are you doing? Now, take it easy. I just want to see what you got in your pockets. Well, well, Richard Diamond. You must think you're still on the force. Someone just lifted some stones out of the jewelry department. You still in the racket? In a star like this? Are you crazy? No, but I thought maybe you were. Now, let's see your pockets. You ain't no cop. Go on and peddle your papers. It's you look pretty silly with a broken arm. Okay. Okay, you don't have to get rough. I'm clean. Now, yeah, well, that's better. I'll turn them inside out. Hey, what's going on here? Now, uh, meet Nat Fox, one of the better-known jewel thieves. Yes. He was in the shop about the time Mrs. Baker was. Oh, I've quit the rackets. I, uh, I just like to look now and then. Oh. Well, at least he hasn't got them on him. Oh, oh. oh what are we here? Gum wrappers. I like to chew gum. Ah, well, you chew a lot of it. Better call the law, Mr. Pennywig. Or if you say right away. Go to the devil. Why, Rick! He's getting away. Stop him. Oh, relax, relax. We can always pick him up. I want to take a look at your jewelry department. <laughs> Nat Fox didn't have the jewels on him, but as he did have a lot of gum wrappers, the first thing I wanted to do was to case everything in the jewelry department. It was an old stunt. The thief chews a lot of gum, palms some jewels, and sticks them in the gum. Then he sticks the gum under something, and a confederate comes along later and scoops it up. If the thief gets spotted at the scene, he's clean, just like Fox was when I searched him. Well, I looked under everything, on everything, in everything. There was a lot of gum, all right, but no jewels in any of it. Rick, couldn't someone have picked it up already? Well, that's the only thing I can come up with, unless this Mrs. Baker really did steal them. Well, uh, the police will be here in a few minutes. No, uh, a clerk. Yes, sir? Uh, can you remember who was in the jewelry department when you discovered the jewels were missing? Well, this Mr. Fox and Mrs. Baker had already left. But I believe they were several women. Yes, there weren't any men, just several women. Uh-huh. Well, thank you. Come on, Helen. The robbery detail can take it from here. Well, uh, thank you very much for your help, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, where can the police get in touch with you if they want to ask any questions? They know me. And if you ever need any guidance, just look me up in the book on the private detective. Can't miss it. The one of the biggest ad. <laughs> Helen and I got out of there just as the prowl cars were pulling up at the curb. I stuck my tongue out at a few old friends and climbed into her king-size convertible. We took a couple of turns around Central Park, and she dropped me off at the 5th Precinct and my dear old buddy, Lieutenant Levinson. Don't you, dear old buddy me. You get out of here. Temper, temper, temper. I will not be subjected to any more of your fiendish humor. I won't go through another one of these routines of yours for promotion. <laughs> I promise I'll be good. Oh, no, you don't. That's the most dangerous thing you could say. 
Yeah, what is it? Suicide, Lieutenant. See? See? Look what happens. It already has happened, Lieutenant. She did it 20 minutes ago. I wasn't talking to you, Melonhead. Now give me the dope. You got him. You shut up. Yeah, Lieutenant. Oh, not you, bird brain. Let's have the report. Oh, Mrs. Lillian Baker jumped three floors from a balcony. Husband Harry Baker made the report. Port Washington, Long Island. Thank you, Sergeant. What, did he say Mrs. Lillian Baker? Yes, he said Mrs. Lillian Baker. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get out to Long Island. Well, let's go. I'll grab my coat. Now, wait a minute. What makes you think you're coming along? And why in blazes are you interested in Mrs. Lillian Baker? If you know something, by heaven, I'll... Walt, Walt, you're turning blue again. Come on, I'll tell you on the way. I briefed Walt on what had happened back at the store when Helen and I saw Mrs. Lillian Baker lift the hosiery. We reached the Baker estate about three o'clock in the afternoon and drove up a long circular driveway to the big house. The husband, Mr. Harry Baker, met us at the door. Oh. Oh, please come in, gentlemen. Thanks. You, you'll have to forgive me, gentlemen, but I'm still a little upset. My wife was a sick woman, but I never expected her to do anything like this. Where's the body? Out in the garden. Right this way. Have you any idea why your wife committed suicide, Mr. Baker? Oh, yes. There's the body. You don't mind if I go back inside, do you? I want to ask you some questions, then you can. I understand that your wife was a kleptomaniac. Is that right, Mr. Baker? Why? Why, yes. How did you know? Mr. Diamond here saw her steal something from the store today. You mean the jewels? No, no. I mean the stockings. Did she steal the jewels? Why, yes. I, I found them under her mattress after the store called and told me of the loss. She was a sick woman. She's been stealing things for years, but... She didn't think anyone knew about it. I had an arrangement with the stores that I could take care of all the things she took, but those jewels were too much. I had to confront her with the evidence. And she broke down completely when she discovered we knew her secret. Harry. Oh. Wow. This is my private secretary, uh... Lieutenant Levinson. Richard Diamond. Oh, Miss Constance Loring. Lieutenant Levinson, Mr. Diamond. How do you do? Well, pretty good. I'd like to tell you about it sometime. Don't uh, dead bodies make you a little nervous, Miss Loring? What? Miss Loring was here when my wife jumped. She's already gotten over the initial shock. Oh. Uh, she's been in the library calling some of my firms to tell them I won't be at work for a while. How long has she been here? Why, all afternoon. She's been taking some dictation. With her hat on? Oh, well, you see... Ah, uh, forget I... it. Uh, tell me, did your wife jump from that balcony, Mr. Baker? Yes. Hmm, three floors. About a four-foot railing around the balcony. If you think that there's been any foul play, you can check with her doctor. He'll tell you she could easily take her own life if her secret was discovered. I'd like to talk to him. What's his number? Evergreen 54469. Dr. Leonard Bischoff. Thanks. While you're calling him, Rick, I'd like to see those stolen jewels, Mr. Baker. Certainly. Right this way. Phone's right over there on the stand, Mr. Diamond. Would you open the safe of the Lieutenant, Connie? Uh, Mr. Loring. Dr. Bischoff, please. Richard Diamond. Yes. Hello. Dr. Bischoff, this is Richard Diamond. Here they are, Lieutenant. Now, you can easily see why I wouldn't, or should I say, couldn't pay for them. Mm. Is the store coming over to pick them up? No, I told them I would bring them down. What's this all over them? Well, I, I don't know. They're all know. sticky. Got something all over them. That's uh, probably gum, Walt. Gum? Yeah, the kind you chew. Oh, by the way, Baker, you were right. Dr. Bischoff says your wife was a sick woman, but he didn't think she'd care it to such extremes. Well, we never know what we will do under such stress. No, I, uh, I guess we never do. Oh, Walt, can I use the car for about an hour? It'll take you that long to clean up things around here. Well, you got something? Yeah. Mr. Diamond, if you think... I don't think, Mr. Baker. I find out. Oh, Walt. Yeah? Bye. I went out fast and climbed to the prowl car. I grabbed the two-way radio and put in a call to Sergeant Otis. He gave me the address I wanted, and ten minutes later, I was rolling up in front of an old brownstone where Nat Fox, the not-so-ex-jewel thief, was now living. I went up and knocked on his door. Well, there was nothing like finding out. Well, what do you know? Mr. 
Mr. Baker's residence. Let me speak to Lieutenant Levinson, dear. He's right here. Hello. Walt, I'm over at Nat Fox's place. Now, don't say anything. Right. You remember I told you I spotted him right after the theft and shook him down? Yeah. Well, he's through giving the police department headaches. What do you mean? He can't explain the two bullet holes in his head. I called the station and had them send over the wagon, then I took off for the department store. I was sure that Mrs. Baker hadn't jumped, and I was pretty certain that whoever had knocked off Nat Fox was in on the Baker killing. Oh, hello again, Mr. Diamond. Have you heard we found out who stole those jewels? Nat Fox? Why, no, it was Mrs. Baker after all. Mr. Baker called us back and said that he'd found the stove. Oh, well, that's dandy. Well, I'm going to take your clerk who was in the shop at the time of the robbery. Take him? Yes, I want him to identify someone. I'll have him back in about an hour. Oh, well, I suppose it'll be all right. Uh, George? Yes, sir? Uh, I want you to go along with Mr. Diamond here. He wants you to identify someone. It's official, I guess. It's official, all right. When you point out a thief and a killer, it's always official. Rick, what took you so long? Walt, this is the clerk from the department store where the jewels were stolen. How are you? What's he here for? I want him to see if he can identify someone. Oh, uh, where are Baker and his lovely secretary? In the library. Come on. Now, uh, look, George, I yes, want sir. you to stand outside this door until I call you. Then I want you to come in and see if you've ever seen anyone in the room besides myself and the lieutenant. I'll do my best, Mr. Diamond. That's all I want. Come on, Walt. What are you up to? Surprise. Well, hello. Why, hello, Mr. Diamond. Uh, come in. Thanks. How are you, Connie? I see you've taken off your hat. You're very observing. I sure am. Why did you kill your wife, Mr. Baker? What? All right, I'll word it a little different. Mr. Baker, why did you kill your wife? Are you insane? Everybody asks me that. Uh, maybe I should see a good doctor. Yes, maybe you should. Like Dr. Bischoff, maybe? He's the best in town. Mr. Diamond, you're being ridiculous. I was with Mr. Baker when his wife jumped. You shouldn't have said that. It makes you an accessory. What do you mean? I mean you're lying if you try and tell me Mrs. Baker wasn't killed. She jumped. Over a four-foot railing? Yeah. What are you getting at? How old was your wife, Mr. Baker? Close to 70. Why? Pretty good health, physically? Why, yes, of course. You say you were in the house and neither one of you gave Mrs. Baker a push off that balcony, Connie? Of course. Are you sure you weren't out putting two bullets in a cheap thug named Nat Fox? I don't know what you're talking about. Rick, what is this? Who has the money in the family, Mr. Baker? Why, my wife did. And who does it go to in the event of a death? To me, naturally. Naturally. Walt, Mrs. Baker couldn't have taken those jewels. She was too much of an amateur. Helen and I spotted her swiping stockings at 50 paces. Whoever did lift those rocks was a professional thief. Well, why couldn't my wife have hired Fox to do the job? Who said anything about Fox doing the job? Why, you did. Harry! Uh, shut up. Uh-uh. I just said that Nat Fox was dead and that I thought Connie killed him. I didn't kill anybody. You were just coming back from it when you bumped into us. You hadn't even taken your hat off and you were still carrying your purse. I was just going out. Uh, let me see that purse. You stay away from that. Anything in it? Yeah, well, no gun, but she probably threw it in the river. Nice handkerchief. I'll sue you, Diamond. Look at the handkerchief, Walt. Sticky. Give me that. Sit down, lover. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was a chair there. It's sticky, all right, Walt. That's gum. And gum on the jewels. She must have picked them up. Yeah, right after Nat Fox stuck them somewhere. Oh, you're both crazy. She was here with me all day. Yeah. Now, George. Yes, Mr. Diamond. Who's this person? You just relax. I want to find out what's going on, too. Well, George? Yes, sir? A girl was in the shop right after Mrs. Baker. That's a lie. I wasn't. I wasn't. I didn't kill anybody. One of you hired Fox to steal the jewels, then you picked them up and brought them to Baker here. You killed Fox to keep his mouth shut. I did not. Yes, she did. Harry! We might as well tell them. You're right. But I didn't kill my wife. I can't get first-degree murder. Why, you dirty old man. You did kill her. You told me you were going to. You were up there and you pushed her off. Try to prove it. She jumped. No, she didn't. There was a four-foot railing all around that porch. Well, she could have climbed it. That's right, Rick. She could have. But you should keep in touch with her doctor, Mr. Baker. When I was in the store today, I spotted your wife with a cane. A, a cane? Yes. Dr. Bischoff said uh, she didn't want to tell you about it because she didn't want you to worry. Didn't want me to worry about what? She had arthritis, Mr. Baker. Dr. Bischoff said she could barely walk upstairs, let alone climb over a four-foot railing. 
He also told me that under the conditions, her age and everything, she couldn't have lasted more than a year. You were in too much of a hurry. Okay, Walt, you run with the ball from here on. I got a date. Rick? Hmm? You didn't tell me what you did after you left me this afternoon. Oh, I just fooled around with Walt for a while to kill the time. By the way, what did you finally get for Francis? Oh, I got him something in the newest fashion. It's called the bold look. What? It was pretty ghastly, but he loved it. Oh. Tell me what you got him. Well, a purple suit. Non-shrinkable. Yes, how did you know? Uh, it figured. Go on. A green shirt, one of those hand-painted ties. Rick, where are you going? Oh, I can't stand it. Oh, that's wonderful. What is it, Rick? What is it? I thought you were supposed to be bugged on South Pacific. Oh, is that what it's from? Yep. It goes on next to closing, right after Fink's Mules. It does? You better get those tickets again. See what it's all about. Well, give me a preview. You'll hate me in the morning. There's an answer for that. Yeah. Younger than springtime are you. Softer than starlight are you. Warmer than winds of June are the gentle lips you gave me. Gayer than laughter are you. Sweeter than music are you. Angel and lover, heaven on earth are you to me. And when your youth and joy invade my arms and fill... Hey, what's that? What? That, standing in the corner. Oh, Francis. That's Francis, Rick. What are the odds? Oh, yes, sir. It's me. Now, Rick, be careful what you say. That's the new bold look. Well, turn it off. It's getting bilious. Uh, don't you like it, sir? Now, Rick. Hmm? No. Well, uh, uh, Francis, I, uh, I think it's... Uh... Yes, it certainly is. I think it's rather gay, don't you, sir? The gayest. Oh, my goodness, I forgot something. Does it look like a stomach pump? Forgot something? Yes, miss. The outfit wouldn't be complete without them. Well, hurry up. I'm going to black out any minute. What did you forget, Francis? The spats. Spats? Yes, sir. Seersucker spats. And they were lovely. <laughs> You have just heard transcribed Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Lorene Tuttle, Joseph Kearns, Peter Leeds, and Joe Forte. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I'm a private detective. As long as I've been in this business, I've found only four things that really make this racket worthwhile. Women, money, women, and more money. Don't, don't misunderstand me, I've got other habits too. I, uh, I drink lots of milk, go to the fights, 
danced the uh, meanest rumbo west of Ebbets Field and write fan letters to June Allison. But no matter how you slice it up, it still boils down to the same ghastly facts. To drink the gallons of milk, you've got to have loot. To go to the fights, you've still got to have it. But you add a little, uh, a little something, or a big something, as the case may be. That's right, a woman. Then if you're going dancing, you like to go to a nice place. Nice place? That's an 8 by 10 dance floor supported by bodies of patrons who couldn't pay the $12 minimum. So now you get into more money, and there you are. Women, money, more women, and more money. About the fan letters to June Allison? No, oh, who knows? She never writes back anyway. To show you how I make this money that gets me into so much trouble, let me tell you about a case I got mixed up in. It all started last week during a seance. Quiet, please, quiet. Now, if you will please place your hands on the table, Mrs. Van Dyke. Lightly, just the fingers touching. Oh, Dr. Langley, I'm so excited. Please, Mrs. Van Dyke. The professor must have complete silence. Oh, I'm sorry, but... What's he doing? He's going into his trance. Uh, Dr. Langley. He's contacted the outer circle. I feel your presence. Who are you? Doctor, doctor, that voice is calling me. Not too loud. You'll break the contact. But men is my first name. Listen. Spirit, speak again. Who are you? I am Lillian Van Dyke. Oh, that's Mother. 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 Mrs. Van Dyke, you must relax. If you continue to disturb the contact, your mother will leave. I'm sorry. Oh, Spirit, I feel that you have a message for someone in this room. Spirit, have you such a message? I have. Then speak. My oh, Yes, Mother. You are in grave danger. God yourself. Rely on Dr. Langley. He will help. Yes, Mother. What else? Mother? Oh, contact has been broken. The mother will not return again today. Oh, will I be able to speak with her again, Professor? I must speak with her again. She said I was in some kind of danger. If you will return here tomorrow, Mrs. Van Dyke. Mother said to rely on you, Doctor. I intend to. I assure you, your confidence will be rewarded, Mrs. Van Dyke. In the meantime, I suggest you go home and get some rest. Yes, this experience has been rather trying. Goodbye, Professor. I shall see you tomorrow. Until tomorrow, dear lady. Coming, Doctor? Uh... I wish to consult with the professor for a moment. I'll be right along. Very well, doctor. I'll wait in the car. Goodbye again, professor, and bless you. Goodbye and bless you, you old goat. Take it easy. Really, she gets out the front door. Okay. Now, look, Langley, when are we going to pull the job? I'm getting tired of drumming up banshees for old money bags. Let's get those jewels. Look, tomorrow her mother is going to tell her that someone is after her precious jewel collection. Tell her? She'll lock him up in Fort Knox if that happens. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Professor. What if her dear old departed mother tells her to leave them with me for safekeeping? I get it. By the time she gets wise, <laughs> we'll be in Mexico. <laughs> right. I'll see you tomorrow morning before Van Dyke gets here. We'll plan what we want the voice to say. And for Pete's sake, tell that old witch to sound like a ghost for a change. She came on today like Apple Mary with a hangover. <laughs> That's right. Come on in, but watch the clothesline. Oh, you've been washing. Aren't these a little loud? You should stop around when I'm doing socks. <laughs> My name is Van Dyke, Mr. Diamond. Nancy Van Dyke. Miss? Mm-hmm. Well, bully for our side. What can I do for you, Miss Van Dyke? I'm worried about my aunt, Mr. Diamond. Why? Is she playing shortstop for Brooklyn? I don't think I understand that. You're not alone, but I have to keep trying. Uh, why are you worried about your aunt, Miss Van Dyke? Well, lately she's been seeing a man who calls himself Dr. Langley. Uh-huh. Are you of the Long Island Van Dykes? We used to live on Long Island. Why? Well, if you're the same family, you say piggy bank instead of U.S. Mint. We are quite wealthy. Uh-huh. That's like saying Scarface had a gun collection. You, uh, think this Dr. Langley is after your aunt's money, is that it? Yes. He's been taking her to see a clairvoyant, and she claims that he produced her dead mother and that she talked with her. Maybe she's been getting tips on the market. 
My aunt says that this apparition, or whatever it is, warned her of impending danger. What's the medium's name? He calls himself Professor Leonardo. Uh Uh-huh. What else did the ghost have to say? Well, she said, or it said, to trust Dr. Langley, and that's exactly what my aunt started to do. She even consults him on matters of business. He completely sold her on this phony Professor Leonardo, and unless I miss my guess, he's got a wandering eye for her jewelry collection. She had it out, and she was showing it to him last evening. What do you want me to do? I want you to prove that this Dr. Langley and the professor are charlatans. Well, in my business, charlatan is a nice word. These guys are either legit or phony. So if you want me to find out, the fee is 100 a day in expenses. Well, I'll give you a retainer. Is 200 all right? Have you ever seen 200 that wasn't? What's your aunt's name and address? Uh, Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke, 326 Park Avenue. There's your 200, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. If you prove these men are phonies, please report it to my aunt. Then stop by my place and I'll pay you the rest of your fee. 741 Madison Avenue. Oh, uh, 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 Miss Van Dyke, did you ever model bathing suits? No, Mr. Diamond, but I have a very nice one. I got it in the south of France last season. I'll show it to you sometime. I hope it won't be on a hanger. Goodbye, Miss Van Dyke. Well, I had 200 fat clams in my little hot hand and an assignment that didn't look like it was going to be too tough to crack. I needed some information on the professor and the doctor, so I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson's office. Yeah, what is... Oh, no. What do you want, Shamus? Why, Sergeant Otis, what will the lieutenant say when he finds your big feet all over his desk? He won't say nothing. He ain't here. Well, how'd you ever figure that out? Where is he? Out of town. Doing what? Doing his vacation, that's what. Don't tell me you left you in charge. Yeah. What's the matter with that? Hmm. If you've got a few days, I'll tell you about it. Leaving you in charge of homicide is like stopping a leaky faucet with bubble gum. I ain't in charge of homicide, wise guy, but I could do it if I had to. He just asked me to watch his office and take the call. He'd get better results with a parrot. Well, I want some information, Sergeant. Who do I see? Me. I could see more in a barrel of mud. Now, you better lay off, Gumshoe. I got instructions to throw you out if you get out of line. Oh, Sergeant, Sergeant, it's nothing personal. You've got beautiful eyes, and, oh, I love all three of them. It's just that you're, you're obnoxious. Well, okay. But you start calling me any nasty names and you go out of here, I... Uh, 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 Sergeant. Well, you do. Now, what do you want? I want your file on bunco artists. Okay. You come look up some of your relatives? Oh, that was a real garter snapper, Sergeant. Yeah, here's the file. Uh, you can do me one more favor. Look up uh, Professor Leonardo. He's a spiritualist. Oh, drunk, huh? Well, I'll get the file. Oh, no, 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 Sergeant. In the phone book, he's like a fortune teller. Oh, one of them guys. That's right. Well, well, well. well. You find something? Yeah, I was looking for this guy, too. Let's see. Dr. R.L. Langley. It is Dr. Fred Bishop. It is Dr. Leopold Karnowski. Hey, this guy's been busy. Two convictions. Bunko artist. According to this, the guy goes after old dames and gives them a good fleecing. You're positively brilliant, Sergeant. Ah, oh, it ain't nothing. It is when you do it. Did you find the phone number of the professor? Uh, yeah, right here. Professor Leonardo, fortune teller, and clairvoyant. Okay. Oh, want to use the phone? Uh, sure. Only leave a nickel. I wish I had your nose full of them. Professor Leonardo's psychic sanctuary. Uh, my name's Applenocker, Harold Applenocker. I'd like to make an appointment with Professor Leonardo. Just what seems to be your problem? Well, uh, you see, it's like this. I, I have a thousand-acre hog ranch in Kentucky, and last week my brother Oni got lit up on juniper juice and fell in the water. It was a pretty deep one, and he done drowned. I was wondering if you could fix it so I could talk with him. Who recommended you to us? Ain't nobody recommended nothing. I just looked it up in the phone book. Well, the professor is rather busy, and his time is expensive. I'm afraid... Oh, shuckins. I ain't worried about money or nothing. I make 40000 a year just off in the hogs, not to mention the still I got going in the back on the hills. Still? Yeah, I got it camouflaged. Only time a revenue ever got suspicious was when he saw the moon on the door. It was backwards. The 
price is $50 a reading and 100 if the professor is able to contact your brother. Fine, fine. I'm going to be busy at the stockyards this afternoon, and uh, I'd like to drop around this evening if I could. How would 8 o'clock be? Just dandy. Goodbye, then, Mr. Applenocker. Uh, bye, you all. Hey, what's going on? I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have my fortune told, Sergeant. If you want to want to come along, you can put your shoes if you want to. Come along, come oh, on, George, come you're along. you're nuts. Oh, you're just lonesome. Bye, y'all. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for 975 Park Avenue. The way the case looked to date, I was going to be working that night, and my lovely redhead would be unhappy if she had to sit home. Sometimes you get a case that's fun, and this looked like one of those times, so I decided to take Helen with me to Professor Leonardo's. Rick, a fortune teller? Yeah, he brings the dead back, too. Want to go? If he doesn't dig up some of your old jokes. Oh, you are a vicious female. <laughs> Just for that, old Harold Applenocker is going to show up alone. Harold Applenocker? Yep, raise hogs. You know, this little figure went to market. <laughs> Rick, that tickle. Don't you and Sergeant Otis ever wear shoes? Oh, I like to run around in my bare feet. It's hot. Oh, it's only 90. What would you do on the Sahara? Don't answer that. What time are we due at this spook parlor? Oh, 8 o'clock. That's two hours. In the meantime, let's start a little seance of our own. First, you start by holding hands. Rick. Yes. Oh, are you Mr. Applenocker? Oh, yep, that's me, and this here's my girl, Little Bell. Howdy! Yes. Well, won't you come in? Professor Leonardo isn't back yet, but if you'll just be seated in here, he should be in at any moment. Well, just look at this here room. What are all them figures all over the wall? Uh, them's... Uh, <laughs> those are the signs of the Zodiac. Hey, look at there, Harold. That's a goat. Well, so it is. Bless my little pointed head. Used to raise goats, too, along with the hogs. That's the professor now. Good evening, professor. Good evening, good evening. Oh, this must be Mr. Applesocker. Uh, Apple Knocker, professor. And here's my girl. Lulu Bell. Yep, that's right. Howdy. Yes. <clears throat> well, Mr. Applenocker, I understand you want me to contact your dear departed brother. Well, he wasn't so dear, but he sure done departed. Fell in a pig waller. Of course. Now, if you'll just take these chairs around this table. Where do you want them to go? No, no. I mean, sit in them. You right here, Mr. Applenocker, and you right next to him, uh... Uh, Lulabell. Yes, Lulabell. Howdy. Yes, howdy. I, I mean, if you please, turn off the light. Yes, Professor... Hey, little bell. Yeah? This is fun, ain't it? Yeah. Now, I must have complete silence, please. <laughs> Did you laugh, Mr... De Lula Bell? Yes, Lula Bell. Howdy. Uh, never mind. Now, silence, please. I'm going into a trance. I call to the world beyond. I wish to speak to the spirit of only Apple Hanger. De Apple Knocker. Correction, the name is Apple Knocker. <laughs> Lula Bell. Howdy. I feel your presence. Who are you, spirit? Speak. I'm only Apple Knocker. Well, Oni, how the deuce are you? Please, you break the contact. Well, ain't it okay if I ask him a few questions? It's not the usual procedure, but we seem to be establishing a precedent tonight. Go ahead. Hey, Oni, you remember Lula Bell, don't you? Yeah, howdy, Lulabelle. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance again, Oni. <laughs> Mr. Applenocker, you must not laugh at the spirits. Uh, the apple hunker. Apple hunker? And Lulabelle. Yes, yes, I know. Howdy. <laughs> now, wait just a moment. What's going on here? Turn on the lights. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? These two people are laughing. Oh, I'm sorry, Professor. But I think you've been taken for that well-known ride. You mean this is some kind of a practical joke? I don't know how practical it is, but it sure got a laugh. <laughs> Professor, that accent. Yeah, they went out when poor Oni jumped up from the pig waller. Oh, I see. Well, look here, young man. I don't see the humor, and it's going to cost you just $100 for this laugh. Oh, it is, huh? Yes, or you're going to walk out of here on crutches. That's the funniest thing you said all night. What do you want, anyway? I just wanted to find out how phony you were. Now, you ought to be ashamed taking advantage of old ladies like Mrs. Van Dyke. Professor. Shut up. Who are you? The name's Diamond. Look me up sometime. I'm in the phone book under detectives. Come on, Helen. I've 
Gotta go see the old girl and wise her up to this louse. Helen and I left the professor and his witch and went out on the street. I hailed a cab and put Helen in it and sent her home to wait for me. Twenty minutes later, I was ringing the doorbell of the Van Dyke residence. I stopped ringing and tried my knuckles, and that's when I noticed that the door was ajar. I pushed it open and walked in. I stopped cold in my tracks. The hair on my neck jumped off and hid in the corner. Lying on the bed was what looked like a body. I couldn't tell because it was covered with a sheet. I was sure of one thing. Whatever it was, was bleeding all over the place. And the first word that came to my mind was murder. I pulled the sheet back and took a look at what could only have been Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke. She was about 60 and she was wearing a quilted house coat. She didn't have to worry about trying to button it because it was pinned together at the neck with a long knife. Well, Diamond, you sure can dig him up, can't you? Huh? Oh, Otis, how did you get here? After you left the station, I called the lieutenant and told him you'd been in and you was acting screwy. He told me to tell you. Now I'm glad I did. Oh, mess, isn't it? Yeah, stabbing through. Looks like she was getting ready for bed. That's a towel around her head, ain't it? Could be her hair, but I doubt it. It says Adam's Hotel on it. Uh, let's take a look around. Oh, hey, got a load of this. What? Over here on the dressing table. Hey, ain't that a wig? It sure is. I want to look at the body again. You can't do that. You ain't supposed to touch anything. I'm just taking off this towel. Hmm, well, well, well. She's bald. Yep, nearly. Otis, check on Professor Leonardo and Dr. Langley. Uh, they the guys you picked out of the rogues gallery this morning? Yeah. I already did. The doc lives on Child Street, apartment 209. You mean you did all that by your little lonesome? Well, when I talked to the lieutenant, he told me to, just in case. You continually amaze me, Sergeant. Yeah. Now call the wagon and get the coroner over here. Then get some of the boys to pick up the phony professor. Where are you going? Over to the good doctor's house. The body's been dead about an hour. That would, uh... Oh, that would make it between seven and eight. Now you see if the professor's got an alibi and I'll check back here. Hey, I don't know whether I'll let you go or not. Sergeant. Yeah? Bye. I went out and grabbed another cab for Charles Street. It was dark out, and the heavy fog was rolling in and staking a claim on the city. By the time I reached the doctor's, it was thick enough to be sliced up and sold in large economy cartons. The doc didn't answer my knock, so I went in anyway. I stumbled into a little two-room joint that looked like a chick sales architectural achievement. The doctor was not home, and neither were his clothes and toothbrush, so I started casing I tore the place apart and came up with a big fat zero. But that was before I looked in the waste paper basket. Among the trash, I found a rental bill for a hangar and an airplane at the flyaway airport on Long Island. I grabbed the phone and called Sergeant Otis. Yeah? Otis, this is Diamond. Oh, the boys are here now. You were right about the time of death, around 7.30. What about the professor? Uh, we sent a car over to pick him up, but he skipped. We got some dame, though. And she told us that the prof was given one of them C answers from 7 to 8. Did you check it? Yeah, and you was. Good. Now check and see who gets the dead woman's money in the event of her death. Well, how am I going to find a lawyer this time of night? Just find him and meet me at the flyaway airport on Long Island. Okay. Did you get the doctor? That's what I'm going to do now. And if this fog keeps up, I've still got a good chance. <laughs> Sometimes a case starts off like a party and ends up like a funeral. This was one of those times, and when it happens, you're never really prepared for it, so you've got to work fast. I used my last ten bucks, uh, besides the two hundred the girl had given me, and got to Flyaway Airport in a hurry. The fog was so heavy, I had to almost kick it aside, but I finally found the row of hangars and started looking. I reached the last hangar when I spotted the plane. It was sitting on the strip, and as I moved nearer, I could see the man. Who's that? Who is that? I got a gun out, Doctor. So just stand the way you are. Who are you? What do you want? I want that little suitcase you've got. I want to take you back to the police. Police? Oh, what on earth for? Mrs. Van Dyke is dead, been murdered. Oh. Oh, now, come on, stop that. Well, I, I know nothing about the killing. I swear I had nothing to do with it. What's in that suitcase? Why, just some clothes. Not the Van Dyke collection of jewels? Of course not. What would I want with them? Miss Nancy Van Dyke seemed to think you did. Oh, that's absurd. Here, here, you can look at the bag if you like, sir. Well, I'd like. Let's take a walk over here where we can see some light. If you insist. Where are you between 7 and 8 this evening, Doctor? Why, 
I was at home. Ah, now you're a two-time loser. If you're lying, they'll wash your mouth for 20 years. You know about my record, do you? Looked it up this afternoon. Well, I suppose I may as well tell you. I wasn't home until nearly eight. Where were you? Mrs. Van Dyke's apartment. I was supposed to put her jewels in the downstairs vault. What happened? She was dead when I got there. You sure she was dead? Yes. She was lying on the bed under a sheet. Pulled it back, saw she'd been stabbed in the throat. I left, packed, came out here. I knew I'd be accused, but I didn't do it. Hold it. Here's a light. Well, if the jewels are in this bag, you're going to be in a tough spot. You're welcome to look. Thanks, Lord. Oh! Whatever it was, it caught me across the back of the head, and I went down like a dead palm tree in a hurricane. It wasn't the doctor who had lowered the boom, but someone who had sneaked up in the fog and gotten around behind me. I wasn't knocked out, and I could still hear things, so I just lay there and listened. Oh, thank goodness you came along. He was going to take me to the police because someone had killed Mrs. Van Dyke and stolen her jewels. He thought I had them. What are you doing? No! 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 I rolled over and looked at the doctor. He was very dead. I got up as fast as I could and started after the killer, but in that fog, it was like looking for a hangnail in a mine shaft. I went into one hangar after another, and I guess if you keep after it long enough, sometimes you get lucky. I went into the last hangar and stopped to listen. Okay, you, come on out. If I have to come in after you, it's going to be the hard way. Well, you're the boss. Now, why don't you stop it? You can't see me any better than I can see you, but I've got the door covered. Now, come on out. If I guess right, that's one big sergeant, and he's so stupid he's liable to shoot you. Diamond! Diamond, where are you? In here, Otis. Watch your step. We're playing cops and robbers. Yeah, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Uh, oh, stop. You all right, Otis? Yeah, but this cement's hard. Crawl over here. Okay. Hey, who, who's shooting? Well, one of two people. Just shot Dr. Langley back on the airstep. Yeah? Why don't you blast him? I guess I'll have to. He doesn't want to come out. Uh, Otis, uh, uh, crawl over about 12 feet and make him shoot. Me? Yeah, I want to get a good line on him. He's behind those oil drums, and I've got to stand up to do it. Oh, all right. Hey, Diamond, now? Yes, Otis, now. Okay, like I said, you're the boss. I've been hit. Come on, Otis. Good shoot. Uh, glad you liked it. Well, how about you, Professor? I'm not happy. I got all three of them. <laughs> you won't be around long. Why, why did you hit me, and why did you kill the doctor? I wanted the bag. I thought the jewels were in it. Aren't they? No, I opened it back here. I thought the doctor was double-crossing me. Well, if you ain't got the jewels, why'd you try to kill the old lady? I didn't. Oh, come on. This ain't no time to lie. He isn't lying, Otis. You told me yourself his alibi was good. Hey, that's right. Then who did? The one who would benefit most by the death of the woman. The one who had a perfect setup because two con artists could be blamed for it. Let's go. Yeah, what about this guy? How do you feel, Professor? Oh. Like I said, Otis, you keep. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Mr. Diamond, you come to see the bathing suit? I hope it comes in stripes. What? This is Sergeant Otis, homicide. Homicide? Has someone been killed? Your aunt. Oh, no. Isn't that touching, Sergeant? Yeah. But that horrible doctor. Well, you've got to arrest him. Why would he want to do it? Why, for the jewels, of course. Now, now, put your hat on. You must have known that the doctor was going to get the jewels tonight, so you killed your aunt, knowing he'd get there and wouldn't have an alibi. Why, you're insane. The trouble was, he got so scared he ran off without him. So he had no motive. But it was a professor. Strike two. He didn't have them either. You're crazy. You can't prove a thing. I didn't stab my aunt. Uh, oh, who said she was stabbed? <laughs> well, well, I just... Something else tipped me to you. The minute I took a good look at your aunt, I knew it couldn't have been a man who'd done the job. Why not? You're just presuming. Because there were no signs of a struggle. Your aunt must have known the killer pretty well. She knew the doctor very well. Well enough to meet him with a towel around her head and her wig in plain sight on the dresser? What? Yeah. And I got in touch with a lawyer, and he said you was the sole heir to the estate. Were, Sergeant. Oh, yeah. You were the sole heir, and I'm arresting you because I were there and saw the wig. <laughs> Mr. 
Rick. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it fun at the fortune teller? Yeah, he's going to have to think up a new racket. Like contacting the living. What? No, forget it. What's to eat? I'll go look in the icebox. Bring some milk, will you, dear? Mm-hmm. If you'll play something. I'll try. Oh, no, not again! Oh, swell. Can't you get on the night shift or something? I can't get anything around here, especially sleep. Now, please, will you kindly shut your big fat face? What do you mean? I haven't sung anything yet. Oh, but you will. I just know you will. Well, if you insist. Oh, no. Please, please. I'm a nervous man. Oh, it calms you right down. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame me. Can't you see when you do the things you do? If I can't conceal the thrill that I'm feeling, don't blame me. Oh, that's pretty. Don't stop. Oh, I, I must. Food looks too good. Did I hear you talking to someone? Mm-hmm. Listen. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I don't hear anything. Oh, that's funny. He was there a minute ago. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I still don't hear anything. Rick, who are you calling? Sergeant Otis. I'm afraid the guy next door just cut his throat. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Peggy Weber, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evenings. Shows like Hollywood Calling... Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, and the Ethel Merman Show. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, if you've ever got a few idle minutes and you need a good chuckle to keep you going, just turn to the personals in any of the local papers. Now, I'm a guy with a strange sense of humor, and it really takes something right out of left field to get a spasm out of my funny bone. Well, just listen to this one out of the Little Rock Bugle. Oh, yeah. Bachelor, sincere young man, four feet ten, 190 pounds, handsome, out of work for a year, desires to meet woman who can straighten him out. (laughs) See what I mean? If this guy does find a woman who can straighten him out, she'll probably do it with a flat iron. Oh, and, uh, and get this one. Young man with large personality... Desires to meet woman with big bank account and small sense of humor. Object, murder. 
Oh, excuse me, that's merger. Oh, and here's a real wizard. Attractive, intelligent girl, 30 years old, with bubbling enthusiasm for life. Neither smokes, drinks, nor stays up late. Vegetarian and hates comic books. Would like playmate who enjoys active recreation. Hmm. There'll be a month of fasting after that one. Oh, yeah, I knew I had something else. That case I got mixed up in last week. If you think those personals are silly, will you hear about this? It all started about 11 o'clock one morning in my office. Mr. Richard Diamond, private detective? Uh, I was out with a hula dancer last night. Wait, I'll look in the mirror and tell you. Come on in so you can see, too. <coughs> my name is Jerome J. Jerome. Well, I'm not going to ask you what the J stands for. You are Mr. Diamond, aren't you? It's my face all right, but I'm sure the rest of me is on vacation. Don't you feel well? I don't feel at all. Ever danced the hula for six hours straight? I'm a past master of all forms of dancing. Care to waltz? What? Forget it. What can I do for you, Mr. Jerome? It's not what you can do for me, Mr. Diamond. It's what I can do for you. Well, that's a switch, but let's give it a whirl. What can you do for me, Mr. Jerome? I'm a millionaire, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little pointed head. <laughs> I'm also a G-man. I knew this would jump the track sooner or later. Tell me, if you're a G-man and a millionaire, where do you work? The U.S. Mint? I write songs, too. By the light of the silvery moon, I Mr. want to... Mr. Jerome. Yes, did you like it? You didn't by any chance write Swanee River? No, I believe Stephen Foster wrote that. You don't say. Yes, he stole the melody from me. I think we'd better waltz after all. Oh, Mr. Diamond, that's ridiculous. I'm glad somebody noticed. But you take a good zippy foxtrot now. Oh, now, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Oh, you follow beautifully. Oh, I went to Vassar. Now, slow down before I pick you up and stuff you into a bottle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, would you mind telling me how long you've been hiding out with the squirrels? Squirrels? Oh, I have a mink farm. You should do well. Look, Mr. Jerome, I think maybe you better go soak yourself in some hot tar or something. I came here to do you a favor, Mr. Diamond, and I do not intend to leave until you hear me out. Oh, well. Okay, what is it? You need a bodyguard. Operator, give me Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, please, there's no need to call Bellevue. Oh, stop being so narrow-minded. They'll give you a nice, quiet room, all by a little old lonesome. Well, go ahead and call them if you want to, but it will do you no good. Why not? They'll just think you're crazy. I'm on the staff there. Oh, yes, I should have known. I think you're making fun of me. I came up here because I knew of your reputation as a detective, and I want to help you with your work. You, you get in trouble, don't you, all the time? Uh, habitually. Well, I want to protect you. Now, that's nice, but I really don't need a bodyguard. Hmm... Early stages of schizophrenia, also a slight persecution complex. Have you seen a good psychiatrist, Mr. Diamond? It's certainly a thought. Well, when do I start work? Well, you see, it's like this. I'm awfully sorry, but I have my own nutcracker. Oh, no, no, no. I mean as your bodyguard. I'm afraid the requirements are too tough. What are they? Well, first you have to find a freshly murdered corpse. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. Oh, I've got that. You got what? A freshly murdered corpse. That's one of the reasons I came up to see you. I thought you'd like to know. Oh, well, now, I'll tell you what you do. You go back and see if the corpse is still there. If it is, call me at once, okay? All righty. I'm off. Amen. Uh, Mr. Diamond? Yes? Remember, hopping hot toads have no hair. Oh, no. Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. I thought you'd better know something. I can only be your bodyguard for a week. Uh, I'm getting married. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? It's Miss America. But don't breathe it around. I want time to check her measurements. I'll send you a fruitcake. Just bring it in. You're invited. Goodbye. Diamonds Rest Home. We specialize in nervous disorders, ingrown scalps, and the world's largest bowling alley. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. If you'd seen what just walked out of here, you'd go back to yo-yos. Well, what did just walk out of there? I'm not sure, but he had lovely blonde hair. He... Did? Yeah, all over him. Rick, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about nothing in the world. Come on, tell Helen. Well, I've got to get it all straight first. If I figure it out, I'll come over and we can throw sesame seeds at each other. Oh, I'd love to. When will you be here? As soon as I shine up my elk's tooth and lock the office. Bye. Bye. <laughs> 
Well, I usually get some screwy ones, but this one was the topper of the season. I had a hunch that Jerome would be back, so I locked the office and did a quick sneak down the back stairs. I grabbed a cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting in Helen Asher's study at 975 Park Avenue. Do you think his story about the body had any truth behind it? Well, he told me he was a millionaire, a G-man, owned a mink farm, and was going to marry Miss America. (laughs) Now, tell me you think there's some truth behind it, and I'll have you committed. Well, all right, but if he continues to pester you, you you ought to call the authorities about him. Yeah, I guess I'll have to. Poor little man. Hmm. It's a poor little man like that who ends up hanging his grandmother on a meat hook. Oh, he doesn't sound dangerous to me. Ah, sometimes the harmless ones work themselves right into a storm. Now, take me. You'd never guess that somewhere in the back of my head a square knot is being tied. Rick, not that bad. See? You didn't know it, but at high noon I grow fangs and long claws. Now, stop it. You do that every time a good-looking girl walks past. Rick! Ah. Ah. <laughs> you complete ah. idiot. <laughs> ah. Ah. Rick. The phone's ringing. Oh, I hope it's happy. It might be something important. Oh, Rick, you're mussing my hair. No, no, stop that and answer the phone. Oh, you woman are fiend. Uh, Harold Applenocker's happy home for hogs. Rick. Who is this? What's the matter with you all? Ain't you got your ear trumpet tip right? I know it's you, Diamond. No, it ain't. This is old Harold Applenocker. I'll let you talk to my gal, Lula Bell. Say hello to the lieutenant, Lula Bell. Howdy. Now, Diamond, you stop that. I just got back from my vacation, and things are already so confused I may turn in my badge before the day is over. Well, come on down to the hog ranch, and I'll cook you up some hocks. Now, come on, Diamond. I'm not in the mood for any of your wild humor. Oh, what's the matter with you, Walt? Did you catch any fish? Oh, wait till I tell you. I got one that was so big... Is that why you called me? Huh? Oh, oh, no. Some guy's been pestering me for the last half an hour. Wants to know where you are. Says he's an old friend. Oh, his name wasn't Jerome J. Jerome, was it? Well, that was the first name he gave me. The last time he called, he said he was a G-man. That's Jerome. Want me to tell him where you are? You do it. I'll handcuff you to Sergeant Otis. Oh, don't say that name to me ever again. Why, Walt, you sound bitter. That hornet head worked nights just messing things up in homicide. Lieutenant Walter was taking calcium shots. The chief has locked himself in his office. Won't even open the door for food. Well, if Jerome calls again, tell him I've joined the South Siberian Balloon Corps. Now, wait a minute. Well, what do you want now, bonehead? Uh, it's that Jerome guy. He wants Diamond again. Says he found the body right where he left it. What? Diamond! Now, you wait a minute, Walt. What are you doing? Oh, picking up my eardrum. You better watch that yelling. You'll have an office full of hogs. Keep Otis out of this. And I'll yell if I want to. Now, you get down here and explain about this body. Walt, I don't know anything about the body. The Jerome guy is off his trolley. Yeah? Well, if there's the smallest possibility of a corpse turning up and you're involved, it'll turn up. Walt, you say it, but you don't mean it. I don't, huh? You get down here in ten minutes, or I'll have a warrant out for you, and I mean that. Now, step on it. By heaven, I'll forget modern police procedure and drag out the rubber hose. Why don't you use Sergeant Otis's tongue? You could beat an elephant to death with it. I'm not kidding. I've heard two words, diamond and body. And that means overtime in this department. Now, get down here. All right, but you're mean. Oh, and Diamond. Yes? Pick me up some bicarbonate on the way over, will you? I'll get you something. But don't spill it on your car. It'll take the paint off. Bye. Rick, what was that all about? Oh, Levinson's got heartburn again. That nut that wandered into my office told Otis about the body he says he's found. Oh, Walt didn't believe him, did he? Walt's been a cynic ever since we were introduced. I'll see you later this evening, honey. All right, Rick. What do you want to do? Helen. What? What you said. I had a mental picture of Walt eating his way through his desk, so I got some bicarbonate at the drugstore and hurried over before he got to the wiring and shorted out the whole department. As usual, the king of the forest met me in the squad room. Well, you're in Dutch, Shamus. I guess you're right, Sergeant Otis. How about lending me your wooden shoes? Oh, what do you mean, wise guy? They ain't wood. And why do you use a crowbar instead of a shoehorn? Yeah, very funny. You better go on in. Lieutenant's liable to start breaking things. I hope he doesn't use his bare hands. Yeah? Why? Well, your head's liable to get in the way, and you'll be crippled for life. Uh... All right, Walt. Stop chewing on that desk. Here's your bicarbonate. What are you talking about? Now you listen to me, Diamond. That's like telling a man to turn up his hearing aid in a bombing. You can stop being cute. 
That guy, Jerome J. Jerome, phoned just before you came in, and he sticks to his story about the body, but he won't tell us where he is. You don't really believe him, do you, Ward? He's nuts. Well, he did say something about playing quarterback for Notre Dame. But if you're mixed up in this, I can't take any chances. Oh, don't be an idiot, Walt. This little guy, Jerome, came waltzing into my office this morning and... Uh, the... Lieutenant. Oh. What is it? Uh, that guy, Jerome's on the phone again. He wants to talk to Diamond. Rick, pick up that phone and find out about that body. Oh, now, come on, Walt. You can use the extension in here. Go on. I promise you, you'll be sorry. You pick it up and say hello. Not to this guy, you won't. You come back with hopping, hop toads, have no hair or something. Hello, Jerome. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Good, 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 good. I've been trying to get you for some time. The body's here, all right. Where, Jerome? Can anyone hear? No, Jerome. Well, I thought maybe they had the line tapped. They do that, you know. Yes, Jerome. Now, where are you? I'm at the Osterham place. And if you don't want this corpse, I'm calling in Hawthorne of the death squad. Jerome, please. Now, where are you? The Osterham place on 74th Street. I'll be right over and don't let the corpse get away. Oh, it won't. I'm sitting on it. Oh. Well... Did you find out where he is? Oh, he said the Osterham place on 74th Street. What the devil's that? The Osterham place? That's old man Hoster Osterham's home. You know the eccentric old millionaire that died last year? Oh, how did Jerome get in? It's been turned into kind of a museum. The old boy had quite a collection of rare antiques. And when he died, he left the house to the city as sort of a show place. You mean he's open to the public? Yeah. Well, well, let's go. Jerome's probably found a mummy for us. <laughs> On the way over, I told Walt about Jerome's sweet little visit in my office, and the lieutenant was all for stopping off for a straitjacket. When we got there, we looked out of the squad car at an old three-story brownstone. But more interesting was the sign that hung from the door. Closed Saturdays. And you guessed it. It was Saturday. We got out of the car and went up. Well, don't just stand there. Try the door. I'm with you. Got an axe? Ring the bell. If Jerome's in there, he'll probably answer. Oh, anything to make the police force happy. Mr. Diamond. What is that? That is Jerome over in the window. You will have to climb in here. Come on, Walt. We can't do that. Who's that with you, Diamond? Oh, uh, this is Lonely Levinson, Jerome. He collects bodies. Oh, good. He'll just love this one. Climb in. Coming on? Oh, go ahead. If there's a corpse in there, it's in the line of duty. I'll give you a boost. I can make it. Watch your real old fat baby. You shut up. <laughs> there. All right, Red Heart, you're next. Up, up, and away! Oh, I'm glad to see you both. I was getting tired of sitting around with her. The conversation was so one-sided. Sitting around with who? Her. Rick. Yeah. Do I qualify, Mr. Diamond? Mm, young girl. Been dead quite a while. Uh, uh, Jerome. Yes, boss. Oh, old Ricky, how you found it? Well, this room is supposed to be sealed up. Sealed up? Yes, the building is a museum. Uh, not a very good one. I have much better things in my apartment. Uh-oh, we're I... losing him. Uh, uh, Jerome, how you found her? Oh, 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 oh. Well, when the building is open to the public, they take you on tours. When we passed this room, we noticed it was sealed. I asked why, and the guard said it was because the late Mr. Osterham had stipulated in his will that the rest of the house could be shown but not this room. It was his private study. And he said if he ever wanted to come back, he didn't want a lot of people cluttering it up. Uh, who broke it in? I did. You did? Don't they have burglar alarms in this museum? Mr. Diamond, Lonely Levinson has an extreme case of supersensitivity. Does he always snap like that? Only when he hasn't been fed. Why did you break in? You should be careful, Mr. Lonely Levinson. You bite someone. Have you been checked for rabies? Now you listen to me. Walt, Walt, Walt. Uh, uh, Jerome, why did you break in? Well, it's perfectly obvious. When the guard told me the story, I played along with him. Of course, I knew it was just a trick to throw me off. Yeah, of course. Oh, would you mind turning your head? It's much better if you just chew on that curtain. Well, I, I waited until they closed the place. Then I came back, jimmied this window, and found the body. Then I came to you, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> Simple? Oh, sure. Rick, what are you doing? Oh, just looking at the dead girl. Come here. Ah, you find something? Yeah. Got on an anklet. Name is, uh... uh strike a match, will you? Oh, wait a minute. There. Oh. Adelaide. Looks like she's been dead quite a while. Yeah. Hmm? But Jerome, when you found... Hey, Jerome. What? He's gone. Oh, we're a couple of swell sleuths. 
If he's not out on the street, must have climbed out and run for it. I'll send out a general on him. Yeah, I would if I were you. A guy like that shouldn't be running around loose. He's allowed to wind up on Stromboli. Well, Walt put out a general alarm on Jerome and then called in the rest of the experts to give him the dope on the dead girl. I didn't wait around because I had a hunch that Jerome would find me again. I was right, because at that moment he was sitting in my office behind my desk. Diamond detective agent, sir. Rick? Who is this? Oh, now, stop clowning. This is Helen. Never heard of you. Why don't you dames leave me alone? Uh, by the light of the silvery moon. I guess I'll have to write some new lyrics. Oh, dear. Yes, what is it? Well, you sure got there in a hurry. Who is this? Now, you stop that, Diamond. You know very well who this is. What do you want, stupid? Stupid? Yeah, rhymes with Cupid. Could do a song on it. Like to hear my latest? I've been working on the railroad all the living long devil day. Is this? What kind of a song do you suppose I could write with stupid and Cupid? Dear? Oh, hello, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's going on? Well, hello, Jerome. Taking my calls for me? Yes, and wait till you hear the pixie I've got on the line. <laughs> Here. Uh, thanks. Hello, Walt. Rick? Yeah, you were talking to Jerome. I just came in. I might have known it. Don't let him out of your sight. Uh, of course not. Now, uh, what did you find out? Oh, oh, yeah. The dead girl is one Adelaide Smith. Had a record. Blackmail artist. Been dead about three days. Working for a Patrick Mahaffey attorney on Pine Street. She was strangled. Mm, blackmail artist, huh? Very smooth, or used to be. Any line on Mahaffey's background? We're checking into that now. Well, find out one thing more for me, will you? If I can, what? Uh, when that museum was open to the public. Well, that's easy. I'll call you back. Now hold on to that Jerome guy. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, uh, Walt. Yeah? Jerome's gone again. What? Bye. <laughs> Sorry to bust in, but you seem to be missing your secretary. Come in, come in. My secretary just walked out the other day. I haven't had time to get another from the agency. Are you uh, Patrick Mahaffey? Yes. What can I do for you? Uh, was your secretary's name Adelaide Smith? Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, from the police. They just put a tag on her down at the morgue. Good Lord. She, she isn't. She certainly is. The morgue is very choosy about its tenants. Oh, that's terrible. What was it, an accident? Well, if it was, the insurance companies are going to have to set up a new system. She was strangled. Oh, how horrible. Uh, yes. You, uh, you're an attorney, aren't you, Mr. Mahaffey? Why, yes. Are, are you from the police? I just left them. What kind of an attorney? Why, just general law. Ever do anything you could be blackmailed for? What? Why, why, of course not. Ever have any business with the Osterham estate? Mm, no. No, I never handled any of the Osterham business. Why? Oh, uh, oh, nothing. I'll see you later, Mr. Mahaffey. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt Diamond, what did you find out about Mahaffey? Rick, there's something fishy. You gotta stop going to these cheap restaurants. Oh, be serious. That Mahaffey guy was executor for the Osterham estate. What? Yeah, funny coincidence. Coincidence, my shoulder holster. I just left him, and he told me he'd never even heard of the Osterham estate. Now, why would he do that? He's certainly smart enough to know we could check. Maybe he wanted time enough to skip. You think he's mixed up in the killing? Oh. Did you find out when the museum was open to the public? Yeah, the city completed the alterations two days ago. And, if it means anything to you, that room was sealed up on the last day. Oh, thanks, Walt. And something else. We checked in the dead girl's bank account. She had 22000 in it. A lot for a secretary, huh? Yeah, but not too much for a high-class blackmailer. Do one more thing for me, Walt. Find out if Osterham had any heirs. Now, what good will that do? I want to find out just how many people would know about that sealed room before the public got wind of it. Okay, I'll have my happy picked up right away. No, no, no. Don't do it yet. I want ten minutes with him. Where, uh, where's his house? I got it right here. 93rd Street, West End Avenue. But I don't see why you won't let me grab my happy. We know he's lying. You just check on that will. I'm going to throw you a killer. <laughs> I left the phone booth and headed for West End Avenue and Patrick Mahaffey's residence. Strangely enough, it was on the west side of town. And when I got there, I spotted a green sedan in front of the house. I started up to the front door and Mahaffey met me halfway. He had a suitcase and he was in a hurry. Oh, it's you. Uh, your memory's getting better. Come on, you don't want to leave right now. Let's go back inside. But I have to catch a plane. I'm leaving town on business. Oh, I'll bet you are. Let's go. Now, wait just a minute. You have no legal right. Do I have to show you my biceps? 
Oh, well, all right, but make it brief. I'm late as it is. Now, just what is this all about? I thought you said you didn't have any business with the Osterham estate. Why, that's right. I checked. Oh, hmm. Just exactly what was your capacity? Well, I, uh, I handled the incomes on the trust account. I was also the executor of the will. You wouldn't be handling it now, would you? When Mr. Osterham died and I executed his will, my job was done. Were there any heirs? Two. Neither of them were able to hear the reading. Who did hear it? Just an official from the city. Why weren't the heirs present? Because one of them couldn't be found. The other one was in a kennel. In a kennel? A cocker spaniel. He received $10,000. Oh. I bet he rolled right over on his back. Who was the other heir? Mr. Osterham's nephew. He hasn't been heard from in ten years. He went to France to study hat designing, but hat jobs were very scarce, so he just vanished. He was rather eccentric. Oh. Now we come to the jackpot question. What you got in the bag? What? You look a little green. Open it up. Now, look, you can't do this to me. It's against the law. Where's your warrant? I got a fistful of them, see? Oh. All right. There. Dump it out. But I've got to catch a plane if I dump Dump all this... Dump it out. Well, well, well. Yes. It's a lot of money, isn't it? Sure is. Isn't it lovely? Well, I'm glad you like it. Go ahead. Take half. I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Why not? Because I'll hate myself for the next two years. Put it back in the bag and let's go. But I'm offering you $100,000. You must be a fool. Oh, this is a very elementary deduction. Come on, you can figure it out and sing sing. I don't think so. You should have looked in my pocket, too. Oh, I hope that's an old pipe you're pointing at me. I hate to disappoint you. It's a 38. <laughs> now you're turning green. Now you better answer it. It's the police and they know I'm here. All right, but you say one thing wrong and I'll have to shut you up permanently. Yes? Is Diamond there? Yes. Let me talk to him. All right. You were right. It's for you. Go ahead, talk to him. But I warn you again. Hello? I'm getting tired of dialing. Everything all right? Just dandy. What did you find out? There were two heirs, and get this. One of them was a... Cocker Spaniel. Yeah, how did you know? What else? Well, that guy Mahaffey's a crook. We checked and found out that there's only about 10000 left in the trust fund. The bank says Mahaffey had power of attorney, and he'd drawn out about 200000 You got him there with you? Yeah, but it's all in the way you look at it. Oh, it's like that, huh? Well, see if you can stall him. There ought to be a prowl car nearby. Goodbye, Walt. Did you get the information you wanted? Yeah, you killed the girl. Probably because she found out you were dipping into the till. You paid her 10000 and got her over to the museum and strangled her. I took the money, yes. But you're just guessing about the murder. Uh-uh. No one else but you knew about the closed room until after it was sealed and the public was told. The girl was killed the day before the room was sealed. You figured she'd never be found, but a little guy named Jerome J. Jerome went in and found the body. And if I'm right, little Jerome is really the missing heir. Impossible. Wasn't the museum rigged with a burglar alarm? Yes. Well, we found Jerome inside and the window open. He'd climbed in, but the alarm hadn't gone off. Simple. A member of the family might still have a key. He found the alarm and disconnected it. I don't believe it. But you must, Mr. Mahaffey. What? No, it can't be. Oh. Well, (laughs) you really throw a beautiful left jab, Mr. Dime. Oh, thanks for turning his head, Jerome. Now, would you mind telling me something just to sort of clear things up a little? You mean, am I really cracked? No. Like Mr. Mahaffey said, uh, just a little uh, eccentric. You see, I found out the money was missing, so I looked up the girl. She told me for 20000 she'd show me the thief. She told me to meet her at the museum that night, and the thief would be there. When I got there, she was dead. Well, I knew I couldn't solve the case myself, and if anyone found out who I really was, I might be held. So I became Jerome J. Jerome and hired Richard Diamond. Correction, I was not hired. Correction again. You'll receive a very substantial check as soon as the estate is settled. And thank you. Thank you. Oh, you might do me one more favor. If you know anyone who would like to buy a hat, I have got some dillies. I'll speak to Hedda Hopper in the morning. Well, it's... It's lovely, but... But you don't like it? Well, yes. Uh, well, what's the matter? I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is? It's a hat. A hat? Certainly. Here, here, give it to me. Now, look, you put it on this way, <laughs> see? 
Well, what are you laughing at? Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> I might even do a Hildegard if I got the right bookings. A pair of long gloves. <laughs> All of a sudden, my heart sings. <laughs> when I remember little things. The way you Rick, used now to... now stop it. I will not. I may have found a way to make a million. You're just jealous, that's all. I've got the hat and I'm pretty. Just sing a song. And finish it for a change. Oh, I'd love to. I don't know from nothing, baby. All I know is I love you. I don't care for nothing, baby. If I knew you cared for me, too. So won't you make your mind up, baby? Tell me that you love me, please do. For I don't know from nothing, baby. All I know is I love you. We bought a sponsor. All I know is I love you. Well, there you are. I finished it. Are you happy? Oh, well, yes. But where did the band come from? Did you like it? Yes, it was great. Well, if it's great, don't ask questions. Uh, thank you, Von Monroe. Uh, honey, the name is Diamond. Oh, Mr. Monroe, I just love your record. No, no, baby, the name is Diamond. Mr. Monroe, ever since the first time I heard you sing, I've... Come here, I want to tell you something. Racing with the moon... Sailing through the midnight blur. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Joseph Kearns, and Stanley Waxman. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandbell. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the current screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is John Storm inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> You don't have to go to Alabama. You don't have to eat ham hocks and butter beans. All you have to do is enjoy Phil Harris and his ever-loving wife, Alice Fay, when they return to NBC tomorrow. For 30 minutes of southern fried joy, lend an ear to Phil Harris, Alice Fay show, returning tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. Your tune for the stars on NBC. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know this business I'm in can get pretty silly sometimes. I can go along for a whole month and get by on nothing but meals at the automat and a dozen laughs a day. The funny ones usually pay just as well as the tough ones, but eventually somebody starts something that's about as funny as an open grave. So then I put on a long face and start carrying my 38. I don't worry about those times because I don't think about them. I just know they'll be around, and I know I won't have to bother about it unless I get my hundred a day in expenses. That's, uh, the equalizer. As long as I get that ever-loving loot in my little hot hand, Lucifer can walk in with a machine gun, and I'll arm wrestle him for the price of a hot dog. Last week, I stopped in the middle of a real yocker and realized that I'd been giggling over time. That's right. The cycle had caught up with me. And the label on my future had changed from fun time to trouble. And no guarantee as to the date of expiration. Uh, what started all this? 
Well, one morning on 53rd Street, a couple of guys were just pulling up in front of a garage. This the garage? Yeah. Go on, drive in. Here comes a guy. Yeah, this is big luck for us. The guy coming is the guy I want. I don't want he should see me yet, so you keep talking to him and I'll get out this sign. Tell him to look at the motor or something. There's something I can do for you, mister? Yeah, take a look at the motor. It's been missing. Sounds all right. It don't drive like it sounds, so take a look at it. Okay, sure. Uh, race it once. Huh? I said race it once. He down here so well. Huh? Hello, Billy boy. Where did you come from? How did you get here? One at a time, Billy. I came in the car, got out the other side. You're looking good, Billy, real good. What do you want? How did you find me? Can't you ask just one simple question? You get so all mixed up, Billy. Look, leave me alone, please. Sure, Billy, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> all alone, you louse. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, our 30-day test revealed that not one single case of throat irritation was due to strangling. Oh, Rick, you're awful. Oh, how can you say that? I'm lovely, I'm engaged, now you steal wool. Oh, you idiot. Ah, you peaked. Hello, honey. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight? Sure, what'll we do? You get here about eight, I'll think of something. Oh, let's stay in. I've got that awful broke feeling again. Oh, is business bad, Rick? Well, it's pretty bad, but it gives me a chance to get some exercise. Exercise? Yeah, I found a Japanese beetle in the desk the other day. Been giving me judo lessons. I'll just pretend I didn't hear that. Don't knock it. Vaudeville's on the way back. Leave it alone. Let it live. Helen. I'll see you about eight. Uh, uh, wait a minute, honey. I think I forgot to shut something off. People are running in. Clients? I'll find out. Oh, uh, would one of you gentlemen mind dropping a few hundred dollar bills on the floor? Well? Uh, I'll call you right back. I don't think they're spendthrifts. All right, Rick. Bye. Bye, honey. Well, now, lads, what can I do for you? Your name Diamond? Yeah. Would you mind closing the door? I've got a beetle that'll break my arm if he catches cold. Hey, this guy's screwy, boss. Shut the door like he says. You got a beetle, huh, funny man? Yeah, and I'll bet you eight to five he can throw you. Well, if you have got a beetle, he must be running around your head, but I ain't got time to find out. You know something? I, uh, I don't think we're going to get along. You may be right, funny man. It depends. On what? And whether or not you turn the bundle over to me. Look, Rockerhead, if you're looking for your laundry, you got the wrong bin. I don't like the way this guy talks. No, but first we ask him nice. We want the bundle, funny man. You just said that. I say it again for you. Then if you don't get it, I make you understand. Like how? You couldn't point out Clyde Beatty in a lion cage. Here it is. Now try hard. I want the bundle. I know this will throw you, but what bundle? He's going to be difficult, boss. Shut up. Look, Shamus, some of my friends think I'm kind of good-natured, but sometimes I fool them and get nasty. You should be ashamed of yourself. You want to know what bundle? I tell you. Maybe you snap out of it. The bundle the dame gave you, the 200,000. 200,000? 200,000 what? Girdles? That does it. Vern, see why the Shamus is lying. Now, wait a minute, Buster. You go on the muscle with me, and I'll tear off your biceps and stuff them in your fat face. Vern. Yeah? Oh, nuts. Why is it that 38 always changes my mind, and I want it to be so virile? I'm going to use this gun unless you tell us where you got the 200000 Now, this is getting silly. No, it ain't. Mm. Well, it's getting bloody, see? Hey, now, what's going on? I told you, funny man. I want what you got. Well, what I got hurts, and you're welcome to it. You sure ask for it. No. Oh. Come on. You save your head from getting squashed, and me and Vern save a lot of time. Where you got the dough? Look, I didn't know what you were talking about when you started, and I'm just as stupid now. You are that funny, man. Vern? Hey, wait. Now, oh, oh. A gun barrel can cut you up pretty bad. You want to see how bad, or do you want to tell us? You think I like the massage? I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't like to be kept waiting, you. I don't like it none, see? Now you spill your gut so my boy chops you up like hamburger. Open your yap and sing. Sing, you hear me? Okay, but you won't like it. 
I can't begin to tell you. Close this lousy mouth. Close it good. Oh, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, oh, oh. Now, funny man, you got a wise crack? You gonna still make like a hero? Answer me, funny man, or I step on your face. Boss. Shut up. But, boss. Yeah, 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 what do you want? He don't hear you. He's out. Huh? Oh. Well, what did you satin so hard for, stupid? Maybe you turned him off for good. Nah, he'll be around in a couple of minutes. Then I can work on his ribs. He'll tell us where he's got the dough. Ah, I don't know, I don't know. You don't know what? He's got the dough, you sure know that. Yeah, the dame says she'd give it to him. You think uh, maybe she crossed you? You think she skipped? I think maybe we'd better find out. This shamus is pretty stubborn and pretty clean. I think we find out. How? You watch. I'll search the joint, then we'll get out of here. What about the shamus? Ah, he'll make it all right. I want him around for a while. After we find the dough, you can put him back to sleep. Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond? Hmm? Mr. Diamond, wake up. Oh, it's all right, honey. I'm not coming in. Mr. Diamond, wake up. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Oh, what a nice sweater. <laughs> How do you feel? Well, a quick comparison might be a garter snake and a log jam. You don't look very comfortable. Why don't you sit up? Afraid my eyes might fall out. Oh. Better? Yeah, yeah. Know any shaggy dog stories? I could use a laugh. How did you get like this? It wasn't easy. How long have I been here? I just came in. I was going to call the police when you started mumbling. Mumbling? Yes, you said something like, Oh, it's not so late, honey. Can I come in for a drink? <laughs> You must have been dreaming. Uh, I'm glad I woke up. She probably didn't have a drink in the house anyway. Uh, pardon me, honey, but I gotta run some water over my bumps. You don't look so bad, considering. Oh, considering what? The people get run over by trucks every day? When you start feeling better, I'd like to talk business. Oh, well, with business, I straighten right up. What's on your mind? Oh, that sweater. I want you to guard something for me. Why, you're the type that goes bear hunting with a switch. Is that supposed to be nasty? Well, take a guess. I just get mauled up by two gorillas, and before they get nasty, they mention some dame and some money, and you know anything about it? Why should I? Well, I wake up, and there you are. I thought maybe you'd stop by to see if the boys get a gold star for the work. I don't know anything about it. Now, do you mind if I sit down? No, no. I'm sorry, I haven't got anything more comfortable. The termites just walked out of my couch. What do you want guided, lover? I can't tell you what it is. But it's in a locker at the 42nd Street subway. I want you to pick it up and keep it with you until I call for it. I get 100 a day in expenses, and when I don't know what I'm doing. The fee looks like a skyrocket. Here's $500. Mm-hmm. When I pick up the uh, item, you get 500 more. Ooh. And I'll be back in two days. Well, I was going to start looking for the guys who gave me this headache, but $1,000 makes me <laughs> impatient. You uh, uh, got the key to the locker? Yeah, right here. By the way, do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? Well, not in the office. Don't you think I ought to know your name? You get the item and I'll introduce myself in two days. And I do keep a drink in the house, Mr. Diamond. She got up then and walked out of the room like Eve with half an apple. I put some iodine on my face and headed for the 42nd Street subway. All the way down, I kept thinking about those two mugs who'd worked me over, and for the life of me, I couldn't guess why. I didn't know it then, but if I could have guessed, it probably would be for the life of me. I reached the subway and went down. I found the locker, opened it, reached in and pulled out a small black leather bag with a lock on it. Out of curiosity, I tested the weight and finally decided I must be guarding a sack full of spider webs. I tucked it under my arm and turned to go. But sometimes things don't always work out the way you plan them. Okay, Shamus, let's have the bag. Oh, when am I ever going to... Make Eagle Scout? I should have smelled something. Hello, Vern. I'm in a hurry. If you're wisecrack, you get dead. Give me the bag. Where's your friend? Out collecting heads? I guess I gotta kill you. We guess again. Here's the bag. Okay. I should make a hole in you just because you ain't honest. You had the dough all the time. You mean in that bag? Oh, now don't tell me it ain't in it. Well, if it is, Buster, it's all in one bill. Feel the weight. Hey, it is too light. Why, you lousy, no good gumshoe. This time I don't play around. Frank wants that dough and you're going to show me where it is. Oh, I wish you'd get yourself a 22. Those big guns make dents in my back. I'm going to count three. 
and you're going to tell me where the dough is, or I'll kill you all over the place. You couldn't make it a hundred, could you? It's so much fun when you're past 50. Be funny. You're only killing one guy. One? This never happened when I went on next to closing. Two? Oh, now, wait a minute. Look. You look. It's your last chance. Drop it, Byrne. You're boxed up. Hey, who's that? The Marines. Why, you dirty... Oh! <laughs> Rick, Rick, are you all right? Oh, Walt, I know you're bashful about these things, but you're going to be kissed. Oh, now, stop that. Otis, have your boys keep the crowd back. All right, all right, keep back. Come on. What about the gunner? You shot him good, Lieutenant. Well, I'm glad you noticed your mallet head. Now, what about him? Uh, he's dead. How did you find that out? Twenty questions? Oh, yeah? Well, I guess we saved your life this time. Well, I hope I can do the same for you sometime, Sergeant, but science will hate me. Oh. Now, don't you start blubbering again, Otis. I couldn't stand it. Go get the wagon like a good boy. Okay, Lieutenant. Now, what's this all about, Rick? Believe me, Walt, I don't know. How did you get here? We got a call from a dame about ten minutes ago. Said you were coming down here and some guy was going to kill you. Well, well, well. Now, don't you well, well, well me. I want to know what this is all about. Well, let's get on to headquarters and I'll tell you just what I know. Well, are you coming? You, you mean you're going to cooperate? Well, certainly. Oh, all this. What's the matter, Walt? I feel a little faint. Would you mind helping me up the stairs? I think I've been working too hard. Walt and I left the subway and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way over, I told him about the girl and about the two hoods who'd worked me over in my office. When we reached the station, he shoved the rogues' gallery at me, and I started going through the miles of photographs. Well, the guy we shot in the subway was one Vern Geronda, small-time torpedo, but we can't find out anything else. Can't you find the other one in any of those pictures? Well, I've looked through them all. All I know is his name is Frank. Maybe he hasn't got a record. Yeah, try this stack. It dates back to the year one. Well, you can bet on one thing, Walt. The girl who called you was the girl who was in my office. She was the only one who knew I was going down to the locker in the subway. But how did she know this Vern Geronda was going after you? Well, she must have known he was going to tail me and that he was after something. Something that could have been in that black bag. It was a plant because she knew it was empty. I think she'd planned that when, when this Vern caught me with an empty bag, he'd get rough enough to shoot, and if you were there, you'd have to stop him. You mean she wanted him dead? Well, that's my guess. Dead or in jail, but out of the way. That 200,000 is probably behind it. Walt. Uh, you find something? Yeah. This is the other guy who came into the office. Yeah? Let's see. Hey, what do you think you're doing? What's the matter with you? This is the man. You're crazy. Now, you listen to me. If you're trying to start one of those routines Oh, again... now, wait a minute. You asked me to pick out the hood that was in my office, and this is the boy. A little younger, maybe, but you know darn well I wouldn't make a mistake on identification. Now, this is screwy. This is ridiculous. Where's my bicarbonate? Oh, what is wrong with you? Rick, that's Frank Purcell, and he's been dead for two years. What? Oh, wasn't he the guy who went over a 50-foot cliff with his whole gang? That's right. The car burned. The only guy they didn't find in the wreck was Billy Crump. He disappeared completely. Well, this one got out of it, too, and stayed around long enough to pay me a visit this morning. And his first name was Frank. Oh, that's impossible. The boys chased them right after the holdup and shot out one of their tires. Watched the car go over and saw it turn. Didn't they knock over the payroll at the Martin shipyard? Sure, got away with 200... Uh, 200,000 dollars. Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, yeah. What is it? Uh, I'm that killing down at the garage. The dead guy was just identified as being wanted for armed robbery. Killing? Yeah, pretty bad. Somebody shot up a guy that worked in the place. Well, who was it? Her name was Crump. What? Yeah, Billy Crump. Stuck up some shipyard about two years back. Oh, and... shut up. Oh, I was only telling okay, you. Okay, okay. What else on it? He has a wife, lives at 64th Street, apartment 205. That's all. Well, don't just stand there, you applehead. Go get the car. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Rick. I'm waiting. All right. All right, I apologize. Oh, you really don't have to, Walt. I was as confused as you were. Was? But you're not now? No, I don't think so, Walt. But let's get over to see Mrs. Crump. She can do a lot of straightening out. I hope Mrs. Crump is in. Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you, Lieutenant... She calls herself Stewart, Mrs. Edna Stewart. What? Yeah. Her husband used the alias instead of Crump. Oh, well, that's all right, Sergeant. Maybe when you start pounding a beat again, you'll think of those little things. Uh, 205, wasn't it, Walt? How about it, Sergeant? It was 205, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Lieutenant, 205. That was it. I remember. <laughs> I might make a few months. Shut up, Walt. Hold it down. I'm sorry. Hold this. 
Yeah, Lieutenant. Shut up. Here it is, Walt. I'll give it a knock. Go ahead. Mm, looks like no score. Try the door. Why, Walt, without a warrant? Now, don't you start that again. If Frank Purcell is still alive, we're going to grab that 200 grand. We've got to work fast. Besides, I'm not trying the door. You are. Well, it's open, unstained, and honest. I suppose you'd like me to trip you just so you can say you fell in by mistake? Oh, come on. Pick up your big feet, Otis. That would be hard, even for Samson. Oh, yeah. Now, you listen to me, wise guy. I'm getting sick and tired. Of... Oh, holy cow, ten. It's a body. Rick, how about it? Quite. Mrs. Crump. Mrs. Crump, Mrs. Stewart, the girl in my office this morning, no difference. I figured she might be the one in your office when I heard Crump had a wife. She must have had the 200 grand and Purcell killed her for it. Well, you can bet the cash wasn't in the apartment because she was too smart to keep it here. Well, there are no signs of a struggle. From the way she's lying, she was probably sitting at this desk. A writing pad on the desk, Lieutenant. Keep your paws off of it. Well, she was writing something. Hmm. Went through to the bottom sheet. Yeah, numbers. Otis, start casing the place and have a conscience when you pass the icebox. Uh, okay, Lieutenant. Too many numbers for a phone. Walt, Walt, what are we looking for? Why, Purcell and the 200000 Okay, now, we don't know where Purcell is, but that 200000 had to cool off until Crump could spend it. So? Now, where would be the safest place to keep that much cash? The numbers. Safety deposit box. You have just won yourself, Sergeant Otis. I should cut my throat first. Now, it's a cinch Purcell has gone down to the safety deposit box. Hey, I found a couple of plane tickets, Lieutenant. And it, and it looked like they'd started to pack. Yeah, let me see them. Uh-huh. Two for Mexico City and good for the first. That ties it. Would you mind whispering in my ear or am I asking too much? Walt, when Mrs. Crump came to my office, she made it very clear she'd be back in two days. That's the first of the month. I don't know how long she'd been there before I woke up, but she was interested in my office and she was coming back in two days. Now, if she wanted to hide something, the best place would be somewhere that had already been searched. Uh, uh, Otis, do you think you could dig up a safety deposit box under the name of Crump or Stewart? Here's the number. Mm, I can try. Stout fellow. Now, Walt, if Frank Purcell did kill the girl and then headed for the deposit box, I don't think he found much. And the only other person that Mrs. Crump contacted... And that he suspects is uh, yours truly. Uh-huh. And he'll tell you, or worse. I hope so. But I want ten minutes alone in my office before he catches up. Now, what is get going and call me at my place? Right. Now, Walt, I'm going to walk around for about half an hour and see if I can pick up a tail. Then I'll lead him to my office. I'll get there at uh, exactly 2.30. You get there ten minutes later. I think I'm going to need help. I still wish I knew what you were up to. Now, as soon as Otis finds that deposit box and tells me if Mrs. Crump was at the bank around 11 this morning, I'll tell you the whole thing. And if I'm lucky enough to stay alive, you'll have Frank Purcell to fill in the details. I left Walt and started walking. If Purcell was after me, he was too smart to let me spot him, so I just kept going until I'd used up the half hour and I was on my way up to my office. Purcell wouldn't follow right away, so that gave me the 10 minutes I wanted. I went in and looked around. Nothing had changed. Desk, chair behind and chair in front. Small closet with sink, hat rack, and bookcase. I went to work at the bookcase first. Nothing. So I took the desk apart. I kept going. Closet, under the rugs, still nothing. I took a breather and tried to reason it out. If I had suspected something in the beginning... Where would be the last place I'd look? Something I never used. I didn't have a vacuum cleaner, so that was out. Then I remembered something. Something the girl had said that morning. Do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? I looked up at the big light bulb hanging from the ceiling. A little lost weekend, but it was worth a try. I walked over and snapped on the light switch. Ah, score for Diamond. With the light on... The bowl became transparent, and lying at the bottom, I could see the outline of a large bundle. I forgot to smile because the footsteps coming up at the hall sounded like company. I turned off the light, went over to my desk, and sat on with a very comfortable 38 between my legs. Well, good afternoon, rocker boy. Did you forget your bucket of blood? I forgot something, sure, funny man. I forgot to leave you dead. Don't look so unhappy. You tried. I've been getting a big run around all day. 
So I brought me something to slow things down. You want to see it, or do I keep it in my pocket? Well, if it's a mouse, I'll scream. In this pocket, I got six ways to kill a louse. If you ain't seen a louse, just grab a mirror. Oh, my George, my George. That was a good one. What's the matter? Was the deposit box empty? Oh, you know about that, do you? I figured you was working with a dame. Well, uh, you got a silent partner now. You're right. Last time I saw her, she was speechless. I'm going to do the same for you, funny man, but I make a deal. You say no or even maybe, and I'll kill you where you sit. You say okay, and I'll let you keep going till you choke on one of your jokes. You tell me if I'm right, and I'll give you a quick answer. You've been after Billy Crump ever since the shipyard robbery because he got away with the money. You finally found his wife, and she got scared. She bought two tickets to Mexico. I'm going to do it. Great. You tell a good story. When Mrs. Crump saw all that lovely cabbage, she got greedy. She got a hold of you and made a deal. Yeah, she was a pretty smart chicken. I knock off her husband, Billy, and she splits the dough with me. And if I guess right, at 11 o'clock this morning, while you were killing Billy Crump, she was grabbing the 200000 So that's how it goes. But after we rubbed out Billy, she called and said the dough was planted with you. She wanted the dough herself. She used me to lead you to the subway. Right. Where were you? Upstairs. I figured something was up. Well, nice little plot. You kill her husband, the cops kill you and your torpedo, and bless her little heart, she winds up with a pot of gold. No, she winds up dead. The dough wasn't in the box, so she planted it somewhere. We saw her coming in here after we worked you over. Now, I think she stashed the bundle here while you was out cold. So, uh, do I get it, or do you die? What are you going to do about that big, bad policeman outside the door? I'm going to laugh at him because he ain't there. Walt, stop snooping. Come on in. Hi. Well, what do you know? You wasn't kidding. This might mean a promotion, Purcell. Want to turn around and be a good boy, or do you want it the hard way? I stay the way I am. You're in a tough spot, Mr. Copper. If this funny man's a friend of yours, he's going to get it the minute you try your luck. Rick? Yeah, Walt? He's got a point. I might be lucky and get him just right, but it's a long shot, and if I miss, he'll pull the trigger on you. You're pretty smart for a copper. Walt? Yeah? The way it looks, we could be here all night unless somebody gets shot. That's the way it looks. What do you think, Purcell? Like I said, the cop guns me, I gun you. <laughs> Silly, ain't it? Be a lot sillier if I had a gun. Funny man, that would be a riot. Well, start laughing, pal. <laughs> ah, you sure ruined that desk. Ah, well, I couldn't help it. Had the gun between my knees, I, I move, he shoots. Had to try it right through the desk. Oh, what are you sweating for? Me? I could use you for a shower. How's Purcell? Unhappy. How about it, Purcell? I ain't giving odds. Hey, funny man. You know something? You ain't so funny. Oh. Uh, get the phone, Walt. Yeah? Lieutenant? Oh, no. Yeah? Uh, I found the box. The crump dame was in the bank at 11 o'clock this morning. I found it pretty quick, huh? Hooray for you. Wait a minute. Rick, you were right about the... Hey, where did he go? Who, Lieutenant? King Kong. Now, you get your big fat head over here. Lieutenant. What is it? Okay if I turn on the side ring. Oh. Here's the iodine and bandages, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. And stop squirming, Rick. Oh, honey, I know what's coming when I leave here. I'm going to look like an advertisement for a snappy funeral. You baby. It's just a little iodine and bandages. Oh, get her. You use enough iodine to stain an elephant. And so much bandage, you could roll up a herd of mummies. All right, then get infected. I am infected. Now, Rick, stop come that. Here now, come here. <laughs> I've had a tough day. I've been beat up, shot at, and been insulted by Sergeant Otis. I, I need some relaxation. I want to play. Uh, should I leave, miss? You stay right where you are. I think there's a wolf loose. Uh, Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. Have you studied your lessons on how to be a private detective? Oh, yes, sir. I'm up to Chapter 8. But have you read Chapter 8 yet? Uh, well, no, sir. Oh, that's too bad. I was going to give you some first-hand advice on that chapter tonight. Oh, oh, I'll go read it right away, sir. Uh, may I, Miss Helen? Go ahead, Francis. I can't win. Oh, this will be jolly. Now, 
come here, you. But, Rick, stop it. Get away from that piano. No. You are my sunshine, my only oh, sunshine. Oh, you make me on, happy. Come you on, come on. Oh, well, you know what they say about music soothing a savage beast. Oh. You don't like it, you sing something. Oh, what for? You don't even look a little wild. Sing something, I'll get as wild as you want. Oh, now there's a statement. Go on. All right. Little girl, you're the one girl for me. <laughs> Little girl, you're as sweet as can be. Just a glance at you meant love from the start. And oh, what a thrill came into my heart. Little girl, with your cute little ways, I am yours for the rest of my days, and this great big world will be divine, little girl, when you're mine, oh. Now get wild. All right. Come here. Ah, a little wilder. There you go. Uh, Mr. Um, I'd like to ask your opinion. It is in Chapter 8 that Hamas... Oh. oh. <laughs> well, look at that. And I'm not blushing. <laughs> oh, I must be getting used to it. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Fegley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Gene Bates, Robert Carroll, and Ted DeCorsia. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Now here is Dick Powell. Uh, say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been enjoying our show, and I sure hope you have... Be sure to listen on Monday evenings beginning October 3rd instead of Saturdays. Did you get that? Beginning October 3rd, we will be heard on Mondays instead of Saturdays. And check your local paper for the exact time. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. The Judy Canova Show returns to most of these NBC stations next Saturday in this time period. Richard Diamond, private detective, moves to Monday evenings beginning October 3rd. Next week, tune in at the same time for the Judy Canova Show and hear Richard Diamond, private detective, Monday nights beginning October 3rd. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. The Ethel Merman Show, previously scheduled for this time, will be heard at a new time and date to be announced shortly. Transcribed is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. Hey, I got a beef. I went shopping for my girl Helen Asher the other day. You know, stuff for dinner. This town's gotten hotter than the blast furnace in Death Valley, so you gotta pick out things that make for a cool meal. Like salads, cold cuts, beer... Real picnic style. Well, I figured I could whip up a fancy tossed salad or something. Until I got around to the tomato counter. Have you glommed onto the price of tomatoes lately? Now, what's with that? So the cost of living is inflated. So a T-bone makes like it just arrived direct from the Sultan's classiest cow. Okay, a T-bone, I can understand. But what's with a tomato? When it costs so much, it should be hanging from a charm bracelet instead of lying in a salad bowl. Who needs it? So I bowed from the waist and figured you could still do a lot of things with a plain head of lettuce. Oh, uh, I got another beef, too. 
Why can't people start their killings in December when it's cool? Now, about a week ago, I got mixed up in a case, and before it was over, I took so many salt tablets, I am now the best-seasoned private detective in New York. It started last Tuesday morning about 11 o'clock in an apartment on the Upper East Side. Ginny? Yeah, genius. No cracks. No cracks. We're both waiting for old Gibson to turn us into the cops, and you say no cracks. This whole rotten mess is your fault. Well, how did I know the old goat wouldn't fall for it? Well, he didn't, so we better start packing. What for? Because I don't want to play hostess to a lot of little men in blue. I'm allergic to handcuffs. Relax, will you? They won't find us. They can trace me from the other apartment. How? Gibson don't know your real name. Do you leave anything in the other place that will lead him here? No. Cleaned out everything except the clothes. I didn't have time to move them. <laughs> I noticed you got away with a mink. What do you want me to do? Leave it behind? No, no. We can hock it. Hock it? Yeah. You want to blow town? It takes cash. Cash I ain't got. You're telling me... Look, baby, if Gibson does go to the police, I'll have to hock the coat so we can blow this joint, see? All right. You go get rid of it, and I'll start throwing some things into the suitcase. Uh, who's that? How would I know? Maybe it's a landlady. Oh, I forgot. The painting is floor today. Yeah, I saw the painters in 206. They'll probably start in this room in a couple of hours. Okay, okay. Duck that coat. I don't want the landlady to spot it. Yeah. Yeah, but... Gibson. So you really are married, huh? Who is it, Hawk? Hello, Virginia. Mr. Gibson. Yes, I waited around in front of the other apartment and followed you here. I wanted to be sure to send the police to the right place. Look, Mr. Gibson, look. You look whatever your real name is. I don't like being blackmailed or threatened. But please... No, Virginia, my mind's made up. In a way, I'm sorry for you, but you didn't think about me. I'm past 60, and I'm tired of being made a fool. Well, look, why don't you give her a break, Mr. Gibbs? No, I'm not asking for That's me. That's very just... noble of you. You should have thought about that a few hours ago when you accused me of making love to your wife. You're not really married. Well, you... There is no need of displaying your indignation. There'll be plenty of time for that when the police arrive. Huh? Yeah. Come in. Hey, hey, hey. How Come dare on. you? Take your hands off me. Look, you ain't calling nobody. You gonna listen to me? You take your hands off me! What are you gonna do, Hog? I'm gonna change his old goat's mind about calling the cops. You can't threaten me! No! Oh, you struck me! How'd you guess? Hog, take it easy. He's an old man. Your concern is misplaced, my dear. I can take care of myself. What? Why, you. Give me that can. I'll be glad to give, give it to you across your shoulders. Give me that. Hog, be careful. Hit me with a can, will you? No, young. I'll shut you up for good. Oh, Harvey! Uh, Harvey! Uh, Idiot. Huh? You big stupid idiot. Look what you've done. All right, so what? No better next time. Throw some water on him. Well, did you hear me? Throw some water on him. What's wrong? <laughs> come on, come on, Gibson. Come on, come on. Holy cow. Is he? Yeah, yeah. <gasps> oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. Why'd you have to hit him with a cane? Now you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. We're in trouble, baby. We, we. Stop that crying all over the place. Help me get him out of here. Oh, we're gonna do it. It's broad daylight. Yeah. Can't get him out of the building like this. We'll have to wait till the night. We can't leave him in here. Why not? The painters. What do you mean? What? They'll be here in a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now what, genius? Shut up. Shut up, will you? I've got to think. Diamond Detective Agency, murders financed while you wait. Oh, you idiot. Oh, is this Toodles Asher, the belle of Park Avenue? Oh, this is Helen Asher, the girl that goes steady with the Diamond Detective Agency. Ah, sounds like a fine organization. Are they reliable? Very seldom. Oh. I'll tell you better as soon as I find out what I'm going to do tonight. You're going to give your butler the evening off, and the Diamond Detective Agency is going to march through your front door, single file, and show you a shortcut to spend the bottle. <laughs> what time does all this begin? How long will it take you to pucker? About two seconds. Well, I won't get there until eight. Don't hold it, or you'll end up looking like a Ubangi. You're terrible. Yeah, but I'm pretty. So is a baboon. Oh, what you saying? You won't be late, will you, Rick? I don't know. After that last crack, I think I'd better start going steady with King Kong. Rick. No, I'm mad. Ricky, I love you. 
Only because I can hang by my tail and my fangs have that toothpaste smile. I think you're the most wonderful man in the world. Well? I think you're the handsomest, the strongest, the smartest. Well, all right. Now tell me something I don't already know. Rick. Bye, baby. See you at eight. Bye. A, I'm adorable. B, I'm so beautiful. C, I'm... Now, look, honey, I can't make it till 8 o'clock. I got a fan dancer who's a client. She wants to go out and trap an ostrich this afternoon. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Huh? Oh, yeah. Is this Mr. Diamond? Yeah, what's the matter? You sound like you're standing on a body. Oh, Mr. Diamond, please, you've got to help me. I I just don't know what to do. Now, take it easy. Who is this? (gasps) What's wrong? I thought it moved. What moved? The man sitting in my chair. Well, that happens now and then. Why shouldn't he? Oh, well, because he's dead. What? Yes. I came home this afternoon from girls' camp, and when I unlocked my door and went in, I found this, uh, corpse sitting on my Hepplewhite. On your what? Hepplewhite. I don't know how he could have gotten there. Hepplewhite? No, the dead man. What about Hepplewhite? Who? The guy this corpse was sitting on. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a chair. Hepplewhite's an old antique chair. Oh. uh, Oh, now I'm so confused. Well, move over, honey. Now, take it easy and give me one thing at a time. Who's the dead guy? Well, I don't know. I never saw him before in my life. Okay. Now, why haven't you called the police? Well, I thought about that, but I'm a school teacher, Mr. Diamond, and I was afraid of the scandal. I read a lot of detective stories, and the first thing that came to my mind was calling a, a private eye. Private eye. Mm-hmm. You had the biggest ad in the phone book, so naturally... Naturally. Well, give me your name and address, and I'll be right over. Oh, um... Esther Blodgett, uh, 419 East 79th Street, uh, apartment 108. Okay, Esther. Now, don't let anyone in and don't touch anything. Oh, oh, I know that, silly. After the initial shock wore off, I found myself in complete control. (gasps) What's the matter? I'm so nervous. I just lit a cigarette. It tasted so good, I offered one to the dead man. Well, if he takes it, remember how you did it. I'll be right over. Hmm. Hepplewhite. Oh, is Walt going to have fun with this? Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Diamond? No, this is Black Beauty. I just did a mile in 112, and I want to report that I've been doped. Very funny. I thought so. I didn't win the race, but I was the happiest horse on the track. Now, put the lieutenant on the phone. Uh, Lieutenant Levinson. Diamond, Walt. I don't want any. You take your killings to another precinct. Oh, now, don't be a sore head. Giving you business is just my way of showing my friendship. Can't we just be buddies at a distance? I'm getting tired of chasing corpses. Well, grit your teeth and get over to 419 East 79th Street, apartment 108. Homicide? Yeah. A dame named Esther Blodgett reported it. She lives there. Who's dead? Well, I don't know. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. A guy named Hepplewhite. Hepplewhite? Uh, you ask Esther about it. She'll put you straight. Are you coming over? Yeah. Bye. As I went out of my office, I thought about Esther Blodgett and wondered how mad she would be when the police turned up. I had to call them whether she wanted a scandal or not, because homicide comes first in my book. I'm an ex-cop, and I still follow the rules. It's not a conscience. I just like staying in business. So when someone turns up with a killing, I always let Lieutenant Walt Levinson know about it. I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in Esther's apartment along with Walt, the dead man, and Hepplewhite. Oh, you're a swell fellow, you are. What's the matter, Walt? I've been going through that Hepplewhite routine for the last 10 minutes. I just found out it was a chair, that one right over there, the one that stiffs in. Mr. Diamond, why did you call the police? I thought you'd ask that. Because that man's been murdered, Miss Blodgett. That's what good citizens do when they find a dead man in the apartment. But but, but the scandal? I'm a schoolteacher. What will my students' mommies and daddies think? Honey, just confuse them with that Hepplewhite routine. What did you find out, Walt? Not much. The coroner will be here in a few minutes. Looks like someone gave him a pretty good beating. What's that all over his clothes? Uh, isn't that blood, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, he's been bleeding all right. I mean that brown stuff, Walt. Looks like lint or something. I noticed that, too. I don't know what it is. We'll have the lab analyze it. Tell me, Esther, you said when you came in you unlocked the door. Yes, that's right. Are you sure it was locked? Why, yes, it, it has a catch lock. Besides, you have to turn the key and then use the other hand to turn the knob. Did, and... did you touch anything? Open any windows? I touched nothing. Oh, Well, that's a good one, Walt. Yeah. A corpse sitting in a room with the door and all the windows locked. Do you always lock the windows when you go out, Miss Blodgett? Well, I've been away for several weeks at a girl's camp. Aren't you a little old for that sort of thing? Oh, I've 
been counseling one of the teachers who goes along to take care of the young girls. Mm. What do you think, Rick? Well, he wasn't killed in this apartment. No, no signs of a struggle. There's only blood around the chair and on the body. He must have been carried in. There would be blood trails on the floor. Not if he was carried in something. You uh, say you never saw this man before, Esther. Never in my life. Mm. Any identification in his wallet? Yeah, name's Gibson. Leland Gibson. No money taken either, so that eliminates the robbery angle. Any address? Yeah, he's got an old driver's license. 12 East 64th Street. Pretty classy district. Judging by his clothes, he was well fixed. Tailored, good store. As soon as the coroner arrives, I'm going to check this apartment building. Maybe somebody heard something or saw something. Uh, well, uh, let me check the 64th Street address for you. This is a police job. Why do you want to check it? Oh, because poor Miss Blasey looks so unhappy. I am, Mr. Diamond. I am very unhappy. She was? So she's unhappy. If you want to check the place on your own, go ahead. But I'm sending some men over anywhere. Mr. Diamond, I like you. Well, thank you, Esther. No. I, I want to hire you to catch the killer and, and free me from this awful policeman. Awful policeman? Do you know how I got this way, Miss Blodgett? Oh, I'm sure it wasn't easy. Good for you, Esther. I got this way because of this, this private detective. Just call me blue eye. Ever since he stopped working with me and left the force, I've gotten mixed up in more screwy cases than an alcoholic in a whiskey truck. There isn't one week that he doesn't turn up with one or two killings. My, he gets excited, doesn't he, Mr. Diamond? And in his spare time, he intimidates my sergeant. Just call me Rick, dear. I've taken enough bicarbonate in the last year to stop Vesuvius erupting. And if he doesn't give me a little peace and quiet, I'm going to end up solving a killing of my own. Rick, my, that's a nice name. How did you ever get to be a school teacher? You don't look the type. Are you listening to me? Oh, what makes me so different? I've seen signs on highways that say it better than I can. What are you two babbling uh, about? You mean the ones that say, uh, danger, stop, look, and listen? Well, that fits, but I was thinking about curves and soft shoulders. Oh, no. Now you listen to me, Diamond. This is serious business. A man's been killed in soft shoulders. I uh, mean, Miss Blodgett's apartment. If you want to take her on as a client, go ahead. But any questions from here on in will have to be gotten down at police headquarters. You are taking me in, Captain? Lieutenant. Yes, you'll have to come down for questioning. Rick. You go along with the big bad policeman, dear. I'll have you out in no time. Well, all right, if, if you say so, but this has never happened to me before. Oh, now, that's unfair. Oh. Walt, stop blubbering. Yes, Walt. what is it? Oh, you get out of here. Oh. Otis, where the devil is Otis? I left Walt jumping up and down in front of Esther and the corpse and headed for 12 East 64th Street. It was an old brownstone in one of the wealthier districts. And when I rang the doorbell, I got another surprise. Yes? Yes. Don't tell me you're a school teacher. I beg your pardon. You forget it. It's, uh, it's the landmarks that threw me. What do you want? Oh, do you know a Mr. Leland Gibson? Yes, he's my father. Now, just who are you? Name's Diamond. I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you, Miss Gibson. It's Father. Something's happened to Father. May I come in? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, yes. Now, please, what is it? What's happened to Dad? Well, uh, he's dead. Oh, no. No. Uh, look, I know this is tough, but you've got to help me. The police will be here any minute. The police? Yes, your father was murdered. Oh, I knew something like this would happen. You did? Well, tell me about it. Well, I, I don't mean that I expected Dad to be... <laughs> okay, now, just take your time. Cry it out. I, I'm sorry. Have you a handkerchief? Uh, sure, here. Thank you. Now, think you can talk about it? Dad left the house about three weeks ago and moved into a hotel. Did you have a fight or something? Oh, no, no. Everything was fine, but... No, no, hang on. <laughs> Things couldn't have been better, and he was in wonderful spirits when he left. No arguments, no hard feelings? He didn't leave mad? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Then, uh, have you got any idea why he suddenly packed and moved into a hotel? Well, I'm not sure, but I think it was a woman. A woman? Yes, he... He told me one day that he'd met someone he liked very much. The day after that, he moved to the hotel, but I never saw her, and he never said anything more about her. Weren't you a little worried? Naturally. Father isn't a young man, and you... I mean, wasn't. Uh, just one more question. What hotel did he move to? It... It was the Adams on Madison Avenue. He used to go there three nights a week for dinner and a game of bridge before he decided to move in. Well, thank you. Are you all alone? Yes. Got any friends you can call? A few, I guess. 
Well, call them. It's better not to be alone. And ball your head off. It'll do you some good. I'll, I'll send you your handkerchief, Mr... A diamond. A Richard diamond. It's in the book. For some reason, I've got a talent for leaving people emotionally disturbed. Walt hops around like a rabbit in a cabbage patch, and Otis always tears his hair out by the hands full. Miss Gibson was less active about it. She just tried to smile and shed enough grief to fill the tub. I grabbed another cab and headed for the Adams Hotel. Yes, sir? Do you wish to register? No, but I want to find out about someone who did three weeks ago. Oh? Yeah, oh. Uh, Mr. Leland Gibson. Why, yes, he's staying at the hotel. From now on, that's past tense. Ah, uh, I uh, don't understand. He hasn't notified us that he's leaving. Well, that might be a little difficult. If you'll run down to the morgue, I think you'll find out you're stuck with an empty room. The morgue? Yeah. Mr. Gibson has taken over one of the slabs, rent-free. Oh, my goodness. What happened? He's kind of dead. When did you last see him? Early this morning. He left the hotel around 10. Know where he was going? Why, no. Do you remember him having any visitors in the last three weeks? A girl, I mean. No. Are you looking for a girl? Uh, Yeah. Mr. Gibson's daughter seems to think he was running around with a woman since he moved into the hotel. Oh. You say that like you knew what I was talking about. It was common gossip around the hotel. What was? Well, Mr. Gibson has been coming to the hotel for many years. He used to eat dinner here three nights a week and then play bridge with some of the hotel regulars. Now, about a month ago, we took on a new waitress. Uh Uh-huh. It was very obvious that Mr. Gibson was quite taken by her. Uh, So much so that he moved into the hotel and ate at her table every night. Oh, what was her name? Virginia Pelgrim. Uh, Quite good-looking. About 5'3", dark brunette, very well... uh... Mm, I'd like to see her. That's impossible. She left the hotel about a week after Mr. Gibson arrived. Oh, swell. Wasn't Mr. Gibson unhappy? Oh, no. He was rather happy, in fact. I believe he wanted her to move so he could see her more often. Now, what makes you say that? Some of the things she said in the kitchen to the other girls. Do you know where she might have moved? No, but uh, you might check with the flower shop. Mr. Gibson used to send flowers every day. Well, thank you. Well, I wasn't sure just where I was going, but Virginia Pelgrim was my best lead, and maybe she could tie the Gibson murder up with a silk ribbon. I talked to the flower clerk, and he gave me the address that the flowers had been sent to every day. It was a nice apartment in the village, and the landlady stuck her nose out like she was trying to smell me instead of see who was calling. Yes? I hope that door doesn't slam shut sometime. You'll have a bloody nose for weeks. What do you want? Roll out an eye with that nose, and I'll show you my badge. Aren't you cops ever polite to anyone? Well, there's a face that goes with it. I'm looking for a girl, about five foot three, dark brunette. No, no, in the wrong place. Her name's Pelgrim. Oh, her. She lives upstairs. She does, huh? Is she in now? No. Went out this morning. Hasn't come back. And she probably won't. She have many visitors? Only a couple. Men. That figures. Ever see an elderly man, gray hair, about 60? Sure, every day. Know his name? No. You said she had a couple of visitors. Who else? Another man. Younger, kind of greasy. Only came around a few times. Old man was there this morning, had an argument. Could you hear what they said? I don't, Snoop. Anyone else? No. Who paid her rent? She did, cash. Mind if I take a look at her apartment? Got a search warrant? No. Then you can't. Okay, thanks. You've been charming. I left the old bat and headed back to the school teacher's apartment. If I was right, I'd seen setups like this before. But there was still the problem of finding out how Gibson was killed and how he got into a locked room. When I pulled up, I saw the wagon, complete with corpse and coroner, pulling away for the morgue. And when I went in and knocked on the door, I was certain that they'd forgotten one of the bodies. Oh, it's you, Shamus. Why, Otis, they're leaving without you. Who is? The hearse. Shouldn't you be lying down or Uh, something? Now you stop that, Rick, and get in here. Hello, Walt. What's new? Well, Rick. Well, Esther, has Otis been using his rubber hose on you? Oh, no, no, but I was getting lonesome. I'm glad you got back so soon. You are. As soon as you two stop rolling your eyes, maybe you can tell me what you found out, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Walt, send Otis down to the station for a search warrant. Then tell him to get over to 9 West 12th Street and see what he can find in the Miss Virginia Pelgrim's apartment. Who's Virginia Pelgrim? The only person who was mixed up with a murdered man. There was another man who used to see her, but I can't find out who he was. 
All right. Otis, go get the warrant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Thanks, Diamond. A pleasure, Sergeant. What did you find out, Walt? There were 11 people in the building at the time of the killing. None of them ever saw the guy before. Here's a list of the names. Three people on this floor, five on the second, and three more on the third. Have you talked to the landlady? Certainly. She doesn't know any more about it than the rest. What about that funny brown lint on the dead man's clothes? We're checking on that right now. The lab said they'd call me. Did the landlady say she had a key to this apartment? Sure, sure, but she hasn't used it but once since Miss Blodgett was away at girls' camp. When did she use it? Three days ago, when she had let the painters in. And she says that the windows and door were definitely locked because after she aired the paint smell out, she locked them herself. Painter, huh? Yes, and I've been looking. You know, I think they did a terrible job. Why, the kitchen Esther. alone... Uh, yes, Rick? Uh, later, dear. Uh, yes, Rick? Walt, did they paint the whole building? They finished the second floor today. Oh, I'll get it, Miss Blodgett. Probably the lab. Rick, yeah? do you know who did it? Yeah, I got a hunch. Oh, I see. you're wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Lab, Walt? Yeah. That lint you spotted on the dead man's clothes is from the mat that they put under rugs. Mm-hmm. Walt, you were on all the floors. Did one of the apartments have a rug missing? They're all missing from the second floor. The tenants took them down to the basement when the painters moved in. Any off this floor or the third? No, just the second. Well, your killers are on the second floor, Walt. How do you figure? Well, let's look at what we've got. Dead body in a locked room. Blood on body and floor around body, but nowhere else in the room. Carried in, in a rug, bullseye. Oh, this is so exciting. Uh, Esther. Uh... Sorry. Yeah, but uh, how does a dame called Pelgrim figure into it? There's no Pelgrim listed in this building. Well, there shouldn't be if I'm right. The dead man met Virginia Pelgrim while she was working as a waitress in his hotel. She gave him a pitch and he fell. He put her up in an apartment so he could see her more often. So what? I think she was working with another man. A man who was seen around her apartment by the landlady. Then how did the body get over here? The guy the dame was working with probably lives here. What about the motive? Well, my guess is that Gibson was being blackmailed, and he followed the girl here. He was probably going to yell cops, so they killed him. Okay, now what about the locked room? Explain that. i let the landlady of this building explain it, Walt. Go ask her one question. Who had this apartment before Miss Blodgett? Uh, uh, Esther. Oh, I'm sorry, Esther. Well, I can tell you that. A, uh, a Mr. and Mrs. Austin, they moved to a smaller apartment and let me have this one. It, it's more rent and they couldn't afford it, I expect. Uh, this is a better apartment, though. It has very... Esther, uh, hmm? what apartment did they take? Oh, uh, it's on the next floor, apartment 209. Hmm, according to this list of people who were on the second floor at the time of the killing, the Austins are the only couple. What did Mrs. Austin look like, Wall? No, oh, about... Five foot three, dark brunette, very, very well. Oh, say no more. Come on, Walt. Uh, may I come? Uh, no, Esther. You stay here. I'll be back later and discuss the better features of your nice little apartment. Yeah? I want to talk to you again, Mr. Austin. Why? told you everything I know. Where's your wife? In the back. We're coming in. Okay, you don't have to shove. Who is it, Ha? Uh, them cops again. Well, hello, Virginia. Do I know you? Where's your rug, Mr. Austin? What? It's down the basement. Miss Pelgrim, how long have you been married to this man? About three... Hey, how'd you know me? Shut up. Know your name? You might as well tell the lieutenant everything. Why did you lie about knowing Mr. Gibson? I didn't. I, I never saw him before in my life. I didn't tell you the dead man's name was Gibson. How'd you know that? Don't answer that. Oh, shut up. You and your husband killed Mr. Gibson and carted him downstairs in a rug. Why'd we do that? Because the painters were on their way to paint your apartment and you had to get him out without being seen. You dumped him in Miss Blodgett's apartment because you knew she was out of town. And you used to live there, so you still had a key. Have... You shut up. We've got enough to hold both of you on. The rug will have bloodstains on it. Oh. Get out of my way. Get out, Walt. Get out. Why, Walt, you're so rough. Yeah. I, I didn't kill him. Harvey did. I didn't kill him. Okay, okay. You can tell me all about it down at the station. Hey... Where are you going? Well, it's 6.30. I got a date. What about Miss Blodgett? She's going to get lonesome again. Ah, she was born that way. I've got to see a girl who's going to hold a pretty interesting class of her own. Bye. Don't you look comfortable? Where's Francis? I gave him the night off, like you suggested. Ah, uh, you're cute. <laughs> I've got a cool dinner in the library. School day, school day. You sound happy. Well, I was just thinking about a school teacher I knew once. 
Hmm, that looks mighty toothy. Sing for your supper. What? You got a new tune on the piano. Oh, honey, I'm hungry. You sing first, and then you can eat. Oh, oh all right, what is it? Right here. So in love. Oh, okay. Strange, dear, but true, dear, when I'm close to you, dear. The stars fill the sky So in love with you am I Oh, keep going, I'll get it Even without you My arms fold about you For you. Oh, some girl. Wow, wow, wow. I told her there was no one here but the piano tuner. Oh? She leave her name? Uh huh. Heppel White. Heppel White? Yes. Hmm. Who's she? Uh, come here, baby. No. I want to know who she is. I said come here. No, I. Oh. Hmm. Ricky. Mm hmm. Who's Heppel White? Oh, just a chair, baby. A cute blonde chair. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell, transcribed. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Georgia Ellis, Tony Barrett, Joan Banks, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards. Now, this is Eddie King reminding you that Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the bestseller novel, Mrs. Mike, and inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned every Saturday for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I've got a little office near 53rd Street on Broadway, 8th floor. My business? Trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, take your pick. If you come up with something unusual, a new kind of trouble, drop around and see me. Because I'm known along the big street as a shamus, a gumshoe. Or to the guy on Park Avenue as a private detective. If you happen to be stuck with your problem, for $100 a day in expenses, I'll chase it around until I can catch up and break its back. I average about 20 fast rounds a week with old man trouble, and so far, the decision's been on my side. But uh, don't misunderstand me. It's my business to beat him, but I respect him. Trouble goes to work with every trick in the book. So I play it the same way, and believe me, when I put him away for the count, I don't clap my little hands in glee. I know he's just taking a rest, and he'll be back again with some new stunts. Want to know how he works? Well, the other day, I was on the way to my office. I stopped at the corner, newsstand, 53rd and Broadway, to buy a paper and to say hello to an old friend. Hi, Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Jeff. How's the newspaper business? Oh, swell. How's the detective racket? Oh, swell. 
Hey, you don't sound too happy. Jeff, I couldn't be happier if my hair was on fire. Take my advice, son, when you grow up. Be sure and get a job that pays off every week in that little white envelope. Don't ever become a private detective. It's like a penny getting lost in a gum machine. Well, I'm going to stick to the newspaper business. Good for you. Say, I was just about to go across the street to Mary Lou's and get some ice cream. How about it? Can I buy you a cone? Now, that is a beautiful idea. Let's go. Aren't you coming to work a little late, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, you see, Jeff, I, I was up kind of late. Research, you know. Yeah, I know. I see him going into your office all the time. That blonde last week stopped traffic all the way to 40 seconds. Yeah, she was lovely. Got tired of social standards and shot her husband right through his morning cup of coffee. Was that the one in the headlines? That's the one. Oh, hello, Jeff. Hi, Mary Lou. Take a seat, Mr. Diamond. Well, what did you and your friend have? Well, I'm going to have a double strawberry. How about it, Mr. Diamond? Sounds great. Two double strawberries. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Mary Lou. His office is in that building across the street. Oh, how do you do? Mm, how are you, Mary? Uh, all right, I guess. Business could get better, and I wouldn't mind at all. <laughs> Here are your cones. This is on me, Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no, put it away. Oh, now, come on. I asked you over, and that makes it my treat. Here's a five, Mary Lou. Mr. Diamond's money isn't any good today. Tell you what I'll do, Jeff. Give me a five a minute. Sure, here. Now, if you can tell me whose picture's on this bill, you can buy the cones. Is that a deal? That's a deal. Lincoln. <laughs> well, what's the matter? That's right, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yeah. What's wrong? Where did you get this bill, Jeff? Well, I just made change for it a few minutes. Hey, what's the matter with that dough? <laughs> you two act like you'd never seen a $5 bill before. Well, this fin's counterfeit. What? That's right. Good job, too. You sure? Yep. One of the best, in jo best engraving jobs I've ever run across. Paper's not too good. Oh, that's swell. That's real great. I get just out of a whole five bucks. Who gave it to you? I remember the guy, all right. He came by just before you did. Made change for him, the heel. Yeah, five bucks is a lot of papers. I'll say it is. Well, maybe you're wrong. You could be. <laughs> Not Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. Used to be a cop. Look, Jeff, mind if I take this bill along with me? Nah. What good's it gonna do me? Oh, it's not so bad. Here, I'll give you a good five for it. No, sir. You only learn by mistakes. I made a big one, so I'm out five. I'll get along. Look, it's worth the five. I'm just buying it from you. Uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, go ahead and take it. Uh-uh. Thanks a lot, Mr. Diamond, but I just can't. Okay, Jeff. Maybe I can find the guy who slipped this to you. Maybe we can get your five back. What are you going to do? Ah, uh, take a run down to the 5th Precinct. See how much of this stuff is floating around New York. Now, uh, I want you to do something for me, Jeff. Sure, anything. I want you to keep an eye out for the guy who gave you this phone. I'm way ahead of you. Well, now, that's what I'm afraid of. I want you to promise me, if you do spot him, not to do anything until you get in touch with me. Promise? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be at the station. Ask for Lieutenant Levinson's office. Right. Uh, here's for the ice cream, Mary Lou. Good ice cream, too. Oh, thanks. I make it here. Right in back. Take a quart home some night. I always do, but it generally has a cork in it. I left Mary Lou's ice cream parlor and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I don't usually start something like that, but when a kid gets fleeced out of a whole day's pay, I get a little hot under the collar. I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis putting shine on his big shoes. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Now, what good is that going to do you, Otis? You can lose a whole can of polish in the cracks. What do you mean? My shoes ain't cracked so bad. Well, maybe not, but I've seen bacon that looked better. Uh, duh. If you want to see the lieutenant, go on in. Thank you, Sergeant. Until we meet again. Uh, why don't you stop trying to be so funny? Sergeant, I'll do it if you'll do something for me. What? Cut off your head. That face could start a Harry Carey epidemic. Uh... Hello, Walt. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, what the devil's the uh -huh about? What do you mean? That bilious explosion you just popped up with. Uh -huh. Sound like you just swallowed a whole pineapple. Why? What do you mean, why? Who's dead? Huh? The body you said you found. The body I said... Uh-oh, -uh. no, no, Walt. You're not built for it. Who? No, Walt, it's my routine. It won't work for you. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, sure you do. You wanted to know who's dead. Well, I'm not going to tell you. Huh? Don't try to be cute with me. You know what it's all about. I'm not going to be the fall guy. You just hunt for the body. Wait a minute. I don't know anything about a body. You wanted to know who's dead, didn't you? Sure, but that was just a gag. Okay, have your fun, but I'm not going to tell you. Tell me what? Who's dead? You mean somebody really is? What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about what you just said. Now, who's dead? That's a stupid question. Why is it? Well, if you don't know who's dead, what the devil are you doing in charge of homicide? Go on over to the robbery detail. Now, you wait a minute. You said... Yes, Walt? 
Oh, get out of here. I did not. I never said, oh, get out of here. When I came in, I said, hello, Walt, and you said, "Uh uh-huh. Then I said, what do you mean, "Uh uh-huh? You wanted to know where the body was. I did not. I said, who's dead? Why? Oh, no, 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 please. I'm an old man. Oh, Walt, get away from that window and take a look at this. Oh, please. Do I have to? It'll probably explode. Now, be a good boy and open your riddle eyes. All right, but I just know I'll be sorry. Yeah. Hmm? You don't owe me any money. Well, if I did, I'd make sure to pay you off in this stuff. Why, what's wrong with... Where'd you get this? Some guy slipped it to Jeff, the newsboy. He got change for it. Oh, that certainly is a nice stunt. Well, maybe the guy didn't know he was passing counterfeit. I doubt it. You don't give a newsboy five bucks for a paper. Okay, tell me about it. The stuff has been flooding the city. We can't get a lead. Picked up a couple of passes, but they won't crack. How do they work? Look, Rick, this isn't my department. The Treasury boys are working on it right now. Why don't you go over and talk to them? Well, if you want to be snooty about it. Now, you wait a minute, Diamond. Yeah? Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Is Mr. Diamond there? Now, wait a minute. Rick, it's for you. Yeah, wait just a minute. Here, Diamond, and if you're mixed up in something... Walt, be quiet. Hello? Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, I just spotted the guy who slipped me the phony bill. He went into the barn next to the ice cream parlor. You stay where you are. I'll be right over. I'll be at the stand. Rick. Yeah? Please. Walt. Yeah? Bye. Paper, paper, latest issue, paper. Jeff. Oh, Mr. Diamond. He hasn't come out yet. He's still in the bar. Come on. Where are we going? Leave your papers for a second. I want you to point him out. Okay. He's a big guy. You better be careful. Big guys always make me careful. You want me to go in with you? Just stick your head in the door and point him out, and then go on back to your papers. If I start bleeding, I'll scream. See him? No. Yeah, there he is. Over in that booth. Well, well, well. You know him? Yeah. Go on back to your stand. Oh, golly, Mr. Diamond, can I... No, Jeff, go on back. Okay. Hello, Walker. Huh? Oh. What do you want, Shamus? Well, I'll have a talk. Mind if I sit down? Does it make any difference? Not much. Then sit. You uh, passed a phony five spot this morning. I did? Well, shame on me. How many more you got on you? I don't know what you're talking about. You want me to turn you upside down and shake it out of you? Diamond. Yeah? Boo. Walker. Yeah? Oh, hey, you... Let go! Oh, yeah. I'll my arm. You want it back? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Now, now, let's see your pockets. Okay, okay. Get on your feet. I want to see what you're doing. All right. Okay, dump them. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Just relax, bartender. I'm taking care of some business. Well, there ain't going to be any rough stuff in my joint, so you better relax, sonny. Yeah, make this guy take his big paws off of me. He's trying to shake me down. Oh, yeah? You want me to call the cops, sonny? Maybe that's not a bad idea. How about it, Walker? You want him to call the law? I don't care who he calls. Just get out of my way, Diamond. You're not going anywhere. Uh, now, I told you to lay off, Sonny, and I meant it. Now, let him go, you hear me? Look out, he's making a break. Just let him be. Get out of my way, Pop. You're too old to lose another set of teeth. I ain't turning you loose until that guy makes the street. Sorry, Pop, you better take a chair. <laughs> What happened? You see which way you went? Yeah, there it goes around that corner. Stay at the ice cream parlor, Jeff, so I can get you if I need you. I took off like a seagull in the hurricane. I turned the corner and spotted my man jumping into a cab, so I did the same. He led me across town to a little dive on 13th Street and got out of his cab. My boy parked up the block, and we watched while Walker looked around for a tail. When he was satisfied, he'd given me the shake he went in. I paid off my cabbie and followed It was another bar, and Walker wasn't anywhere in the room. I sat down, ordered a beer, and waited. After about ten minutes, I saw a couple of guys wander out of a door in the back. A couple of minutes later, a couple of more wandered out. So I wandered in. It was a small-time gambling setup. The kind you can throw in the back of your car if the cops come. I started getting that lousy feeling again. You don't just walk into a place like that unless someone wants you to. And if they do, it's usually because they got it fixed so you stay around. Maybe permanently. What are you telling me for, Diamond? Why? Make you uncomfortable? Yeah. That's a cozy setup. Good way to get rid of bad money. Pay the winner off with counterfeit. 
I think we'd better go back to my office. Oh, I don't know. I might have a little fun here. I'll bet if one of those guys at the table knew he was going to be paid off in counterfeit, he'd just about tear this place apart. And you too. Diamond, don't be stupid. Oh, something new's been added. Yeah, and it makes so much noise when it goes off. Let's go back to my office, huh? For some reason, I just can't think of a good argument not to. This way. Have a seat. My uh, ankles get lumpy when I sit down. Bad circulation. Then stand on your head. Uh, it doesn't work. I keep talking to toes all day. How'd you get on to this setup? Oh, luck. You passed a bad bill to a newspaper boy. He spotted you for me. You know what happens to you? No. As a matter of fact, I was thinking what's going to happen to you. What do you mean? Treasury board, homicide, fifth precinct. And tomorrow we're taking a full page ad in the time. You should do a big business. You're lying. Okay. I think I'll sit down while you wrestle with it. You mean the team I know about this place and me? The only way they'll get to know you any better is when they give you a room number at Sing Sing. Oh, you mind if I put my feet up? Sure, go ahead. He kept asking questions, not waiting for answers. He was good and worried. And as long as I could keep him that way, the longer I was going to keep on breathing. I don't believe one rotten thing you said, Diamond. Okay. He kept trying to convince himself that I was lying. He wanted to shoot me in the worst way. He moved around behind his desk and sat down. Bless his little heart. I had both feet on the front of his desk, so I shoved out as hard as I could. I pinned him against the wall with the desk and jumped up to get better leverage. I shoved so hard the front of the desk nearly cut him in two. He was stuck and he couldn't use his arms. I can't breathe. You want to tell me about it? I don't know a thing. Okay. You look pretty silly from the waist down. Come on, Walker. If I mash you anymore, they'll be able to use you for wallpaper. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now leave the gun in your pocket. When I pull the desk back, put your hands on top of it. You try a stunt and you end up in half. Uh, okay. What do you want to know? Who's the big wheel behind the counterfeit ring? You give me a chance if I tell you? No deals. I can't blame you for trying. All right, you try it. Now, you want back on the vice? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll tell you. Walker. Walker! He died with his head rolled back and his eyes staring up like he wanted to starve for trying. Whoever shot him had been out in the alley and had nailed him through the window. I looked out, but the killer had disappeared. So I put in a call to homicide, and finally, Walt and his boys arrived. Diamond, don't you ever get tired of corpses? Well, of course not. I just do my bit and then try to make you happy. Hey, you want me to call the wagon and get the corner down here, Lieutenant? No, Otis. I thought we might all sit around and wait for the dead man to say something. Oh, uh, I was only asking, Lieutenant. Well, start using that mallet head of yours, you mallet head, and make a report. Okay. Now, Diamond, I want to know how you got mixed up in this thing. Well, the dead man was the one who slipped the paper boy the 45. I tailed him, and he was just about to tell me who was behind the ring when he got a hole in his head. Oh, he was going to tell you, was he? Just like that. What did you do, set his clothes on fire? No. We were playing truth and consequences, and he fibbed, so I... Now, you stop that. This guy was the only link we had on the counterfeit ring. And you have to fix it so he dies. Rick, there's enough phony money floating around in New York right now to start another Black Friday. This is the best setup we've run into since Dad Foster operated in 1937. Dad Foster? Yeah, Dad Foster. You remember hearing about him. Yeah, is he still doing time? No, he served his sentence and he's gone straight ever since. How do you know? Where is he? He runs a little saloon on 53rd Street. 53rd? <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Oh, now, you wait a minute. Who the devil are you calling? A quiz program. I want to win an electric chair. Oh. Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Is uh, Jeff the newsboy there? Well, yes. It's for you, Jeff. Thanks. Hello? Jeff, this is Mr. Diamond. I want you to do me a favor. Sure, anything for you. Okay. Now, you know the saloon next to the ice cream parlor? Yeah. You know the bartender? Yeah, old guy. Buys a paper from me every night. All right. Now, stay in the parlor and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. If the bartender comes out, find out where he goes. But for Pete's sake, be careful. Sure, Mr. Diamond. I'll do what you say. Is something up? Well, could be. Now, if anything happens before I get there, call Lieutenant Levinson. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Getting to be a pretty important fellow, Jeff. Phone calls now. Oh, that was Mr. Diamond. He wants me to stay here and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. Okay? Oh, sure, of course. 
Well, why did you want you to do that? Oh, it's something big, I think. Something to do with the bartender that works there. The bartender? Yeah. I'll just sit up in front here and keep an eye out. Uh, look, Jeff, watch the store for me, will you? I've got to go in back and pack some ice cream to be sent out. Sure. May Lou! May Lou! Guess I'd better get it myself. Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Can I talk with Mary Lou? And she went in back. I'll get her for you. Just a minute. Thank you. I tell you, it's getting too risky. That diamond's a private detective. Yeah, he came in the bar and started to rough up Walker. Well, that stupid Walker should have been more careful about passing out that money. What if Diamond catches him and makes him talk? He caught up. <laughs> but he didn't make Walker talk. What do you mean? I took care of Walker. I got a good shot at him from the alley. Well, maybe it's better like that. But look, if we don't... Hello? Yes. Mary Lou isn't here. Get off the line. What? What? Yeah, get off. Operator. Get me the 5th Precinct Police Station. It's a matter of life and death. I'll connect you. Oh, golly. Please hurry. I'm ringing. Precinct. Is Mr. Richard Diamond around there? He said to call Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, Diamond isn't here. That is the lieutenant. You know where I can reach them? Yeah, but that's about set all. Who's this? I'm a friend of Mr. Diamond's. I'm in an ice cream parlor. Ice cream parlor? Look, son. No, uh, no. I just heard someone say that they'd killed a man named Walker. And I think I know who's behind the counterfeit ring. What's the address? It's... Uh, oh, oh, oh. Hello. Mm. Hello, kid. Mm. What's wrong? Mm. Hello. <coughs> Lucky we came out this way. I wonder how he heard us. He walked back and opened the door. What are we going to do with him? Well, we'll tie him up and gag him. There's a closet in the back, and we can put him in there until it's safe to take him out. Oh, okay. But he's making too much trouble the way he is. Yeah. Okay. I can get him back there. You better go on over to the bar in case someone shows up. All right. Later tonight, I'll take the kid down to the river and teach him how hard it is to swim when he's dead. Listen here, young fella. If you're back here for trouble... Dad, I'm back for a lot of trouble, and I think you're going to help me out. You'd better leave, Sonny, or I'll call the law. Why don't you? What do you want? I want to know how long you've been back in the counterfeit racket. Now, look, Sonny, I've been going straight for a long time. You know something, Dad? I don't think so. Let's get down to the station and talk about it. You got a warrant, Shamus? I got a nasty disposition. You want me to show you? No. You want a gun, Dad? Why... What difference does it make? I want to look at it. A guy named Walker got dead from a gun. Now, let's let, let's see it. Sonny. Well, what is it? I can't show it to you. Yeah, why not? Because I got it under the bar, pointed right at your belly. If I drag it out, it might scare the customers. Oh, it's like that, huh? It sure is. You see that door there in the back? I know. Now, that's a good boy. You just keep walking along your side of the bar and don't cry anything. I just had my floor scrubbed. It'd be a shame to spill you all over. Okay. Open the door. Go on out. Up the alley. You shoot Walker? I might have. Oh, well, you got your printing presses. You're just full of questions, aren't you, Sonny? Okay. Stop here. Behind the ice cream parlor, huh? Well, well, well. Mary! Uh, make mine hot fudge with the nuts. Wait. Mary! For just a minute. Say, hey, what's the idea? I thought you... Oh. Oh, uh, good afternoon. I'm selling a new brand of Indian nuts. Great for banana splits. What's the shamus doing here? He's too smart. I gotta cut off his education. Are you crazy? This guy's got friends. That kid was calling the 5th Precinct, remember? Kid? Yeah, you're your little news hound. What did you do with him? He's all right until tonight. We got him locked up. Dad... I think I'll make you eat that thirty-eight. I don't think so. No difference if I kill you right here. Oh, hold it, Dad. We can't have a gun going off back here. Even if we could hide the shamus, they'd find the presses. Oh, so that's it. Those ice cream machines, the cover-up. 
Ain't he smart? What do you do? Ship the stuff out in ice cream cartons? What's with you? You want a tour of inspection? Come on, now, take it easy. He won't be smart for long. Well, how are you going to do it? We're going to take a walk, aren't we, Shamus? Oh, I have the most horrible instep. I'll never make it without skates or something. You'll make it. Come on, the car's around front. Hi. Hey, hey, what's happening to the street? A dad. Yeah, no, no, it's only some drunk come out of the bar the wrong way. Funny I didn't see him in there. Oh, this is very confusing. If this is 53rd Street, somebody's stolen some building. Oh, hi. Hello. No, take it easy, Shamus. I'm putting a gun in my pocket, but it's still right in line with your belt. I'm going back inside. No, no, no. Play it straight. Just like we were talking. Well, you're pretty unsociable, to say the least. What's the matter? Can't you even say hello? I'm lost. Uh, sure, sure. You're you're in an alley. The entrance is right out there. Oh, yeah? Oh, would you mind showing me? I seem to be a little confused. Now, look, it, it's right up there. Just keep going. Hey, where'd you go? Oh, no. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Get the cop. Look out, Walt. Oh, Get the girl, Walt. Come on, Dad. Give me that gun. Let go of me. Let me go. You let me go. You, you got him, Rick? He won't play. Get the uh, now you will. Just take go. it easy, lady. Hey, what's going on? Otis. Yeah? Go out and start walking around the block. Huh? You hear me? Go on. Okay, but I don't get it. What do you want me to walk around the block for? I want you to get used to it, because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your time on the force. Uh... In Flatbush. Flatbush? Yes. No. <laughs> Diamond, thanks for the dinner invitation, but where are we going? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Miguel. She's a redhead, Jeff, so no cracks about my office research. Oh, sure. But don't you think you should have called her first? How do you know she's got enough dinner? Jeff, this girl's got more steaks in her deep freezer than a bullfight arena sees in a year. Here we are. Yes? Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Uh, this is Jeff, Francis. He's going to have dinner with us. Hi. Oh, Hi. Uh, come right in. Uh, Miss Asher's in the study, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? You know the various items that you've left with me for safekeeping? Oh, uh, 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 look, Francis, I promise I'll get them out of hock as soon as I get a paying client. Oh, no, no, it's not that, sir. I didn't really want to hold them as security in the first place. But as long as you insisted in such a fine collection, I'd like to show them to, well... To my girl, sir. Why, sure, Francis. I didn't know you had a girl. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. She's the upstairs maid in the apartment below us. Oh. I'm afraid I told her a wee fib to get acquainted, as it were. She thinks I'm an undercover agent, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to prove it. Well, my gun and the badge should do the trick. And uh, if it doesn't work, just get under a cover. <laughs> oh, my George, that was the real... <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, come on, Jeff. We're not appreciated. Rick. Oh, hello. Hello. Helen, this is Jeff, the boy who's helping me send Dad Foster and company back to prison. Jeff, this is Helen Asher. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Jeff. They had him locked up in the closet for a couple of hours, and he looked kind of hungry when he got him out. Uh, how about it, honey? You think you can grind up another cow? Oh, well, there's plenty for Jeff and me, but you've got to make up for three things. Three things? Yes. First of all, you haven't called me in two days. Second, you're half hour late for dinner. And third... Well, I'll tell you later. Uh, I'll leave the room if you want me to. No, no, Jeff. You stay right here. You're going to literally see a man sing for his supper. Helen. All right. Come on, Jeff. We'll go dig into those nice, fat, juicy steaks. Oh, boy. Steaks? Hey, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. My taste buds just started whipping each other. My vibrato may sound like a machine gun, but I'll do it. Well, I thought you were kidding. Is he really going to sing, Miss Asher? No, I'm not going to sing Miss Asher. <laughs> I'm going to do a little song I used to sing with hip boots and a gondola. Oh. You're breaking my heart cause you're leaving You've fallen for somebody new It isn't too easy believing You'd leave after all we've been through 
It's breaking my heart to remember The dreams we depended upon You're leaving a slow dying ember I'll miss you, my love, when you're gone. I wish you joy, though teardrops burn. But if someday you should want to return, please hurry back and we'll make a new start. Till then you're breaking my heart. Mr. Diamond, did you really sing in a gondola with hip boots on? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Well, I know you don't need the hip boots anymore. Will you loan them to me? What for? I want to wait out of here. <laughs> well, get him. With that, you get two desserts. <laughs> heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tommy Bernard, Sammy Hill, Lou Krugman, and Polly Bear. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings you some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned to NBC every Saturday evening for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater... Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Stay tuned now for Victor Mature and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I like to say that. Hello there, this is Diamond. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I say it all the time. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I think it sounds kind of, well, pretty bad. Of course, I'd rather say, hello there, this is I've Got a Sponsor, Diamond, but that's silly, too, because if I had a sponsor, I wouldn't have time to say, hello there, this is Diamond. I'd be overshining your shoes. Confused? Well, so am I. Want to get really mixed up? Let me tell you what happened last week. This is real silly. So silly, it wound up with murder. I was sitting in my office thinking about June Allison when the phone rang. Diamond Detective Agency, no other corpse can make that statement. Oh, Rick. Don't believe it? Just listen to what one of our satisfied customers has to say about Diamond. I've been buried now in 30 years. Rick. Hello, Helen. <laughs> you idiot. What are you doing? I know this will throw you. Nothing. No washing today? Finished an hour ago. Oh, uh, by the way, I got a beef. A beef? Yeah. Those socks you knitted for me shrunk so much I need four more pair. Well, if they shrunk, what do you want with four more pairs? Going to start a new fad. Going to wear them on my toes, you know, toe socks. Well, if I knit you four pairs, that'll only give you ten altogether. Oh, <laughs> by George, you really pulled off a speedy, didn't you? Well, hell, howdy. <laughs> Wasn't half as bad as some of those gas plays you come up with. All right, Smarty, now, what's on your rear old mind? Why don't you do me a favor? Like, for instance? No, for instance. 
I told you a friend of mine would come up and see you, and I want you to do what you can for him. Mr. Diamond. Uh, hold it a minute, honey. Yeah? Mr. Diamond, I was told to look you up. I am Renee. Rick, what is it? Helen. Yeah, what's the matter? Something just tiptoed into my office. I got a hunch you know about it. Oh, maybe that's Renee. That's what it says. If you are, Mr. Diamond, I wish you'd please pay a little attention to me or aren't you interested in a potential client? Uh, hold it a second, honey. Uh, uh, sure, I'm always interested in a potential client. What did you do, lose your wedges? I beg your pardon? Forget it. I've got Miss Asher on the phone now. She just told me you were coming up. Oh, well, please say hello to Miss Asher. She's such a darling. Yeah. Uh, honey, Renee says to say hello. Says you're a darling. Oh, well, say hello to Renee. He makes my hats for me. I'll get the story from him. Call you later. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Rene... Your full name is Benet. Rene Benet. How do you do? How are you, Mr. Benet? Mr. Diamond, I have a problem, and Miss Asher seemed to think that you could help me with it. Well, it depends. Cigarette? No, thanks. I never use them. Depends on what? You don't even know my problem yet. Look, I don't care if you swipe John Frederick's toupee. For $100 a day in expenses, I'll grow a mattress on his skull. Mr. Diamond, I can see that you don't know much about hats. You are so wrong. Oh, am I? Well, it may interest you to know that John Frederick's are two people. Mr. John and Mr. Frederick's. Look, uh, Mr. Benet, I don't care if they're patrol number three of the brownies. Can you afford 100 a day in expenses? Mr. Diamond, I am the new sensation in hats. You must look lovely. Okay, Mr. Benet, I take it you can afford me. Now, what's your problem? I want you to prevent the theft of my three latest creations. Hats? Creations, Mr. Diamond. Okay, creations. Why do you want them protected? Why, because someone is going to steal them before my fall showing. How do you know that? Because on similar occasions, the same thing has happened. Twice, to be exact. The designs were stolen, and two weeks later, that low-life George Marchand had his showing, and my hats were the high point of his show. What did you do? What could I do? I couldn't prove it. If I attempted to expose him, he would have said that I was lying. Everybody knows how much we hate each other. I'd have been a laughing stock. Do you think he had the hat stolen? I'm sure of it. And I'm also sure that someone in my salon is responsible for the actual theft. You know definitely? No. No, but I suspect my partner, Gerald Winters. He's always been jealous of my ability. Oh, Mr. Diamond... Couldn't you open a window or something? It's frightfully hot. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's the air conditioning. I keep a bag of red lip jumbos up in the vent. Sometimes they get stuck. Red lip jumbos? Pistachio nuts. You like hats? I get hung up on pistachio nuts. Perhaps you should see a psychiatrist. I did. What happened? I sent him five pounds of pistachios just yesterday. Oh. Oh, well, here's my card. I'll see you at my salon, Mr. Diamond, in about an hour. Oh, oh and something else. I don't want my partner or the help to know that you're a private detective. What am I supposed to do, buy a hat? Well, I'll, I'll tell them that you're a designer from Hollywood. That way, whatever you say will be all right. See you in an hour. You say this Richard of Hollywood is coming here to look at our new line? That's correct, Lillian. Never heard of him. Well, that's not so surprising, Gerald. There are a lot of people I'm sure you've never heard of, especially the more famous ones. I don't like that. Oh, don't you? Well, I'm overjoyed that you're sure of one thing, at least. Now, don't you two start fighting again. I've never heard of this Richard of Hollywood either. Well, he's a, he's a new man, works for the studios. He's made quite a sensation the last year or so. Well, I'm sick and tired of temperamental artists. I'm going back to my office. Well, why don't you do that, Gerald? Keep the books in the black, dear Potter, while I work to pay for your salary. You know, Rennie, someday I'm going to strangle you with one of your own hats. Why don't you buy yourself a barbell instead? Then the next time you get into a bathing suit, there'll be no doubt that you have muscles. Oh, this boy. How can you two continue like this? It's frightful. Lillian, my love, I would rather join forces with a cobra than to keep on with Gerald. But he has an iron-bound contract that assures of him of at least 50000 a year. I'm helpless. Yes, come in. Oh, Miss... <clears throat> I mean, uh, Richard. Come in, come in. Uh, thanks, thanks. You better go out and pour some water on your partner. I just ran into him. Gerald, what do you mean? Well, I was looking for you, and he came up and introduced himself. You told him your name? Told him I was a hat designer from Hollywood, so he pointed out your office and said something about my lily white hands. And what happened? I didn't like the remark, so I shoved one of them down his throat. <laughs> oh, wonderful. This I'll have to see. I put a feather in his mouth. He can't miss him. Uh, uh Rene, uh, don't you think... Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Stupid of me. Lillian, this is uh, Richard of Hollywood. What? 
Uh, oh, 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 yeah. There is something wrong? Oh, no, no, no. How do you do? Uh, this is Lillian Richmond, my junior designer and chief model. Now you two think of something clever to talk about. I want to see Gerald, bloody nose, feather and all. Cigarette? You look nervous. Oh, thanks. So, Gerald was the victim of uh, a collision? Uh, yes. Do your friends call you Richard? Well, it depends on how friendly they get. Then sometimes they come up with some real hair curlers. What do your friends call you? I prefer Lillian, but sometimes they call me Lil. Well, Lil sounds more interesting. That's when they call me Lil, when things get interesting. You don't act much like a hat designer, Richard. More like you should be playing football. Oh, well, I, uh, I started by designing helmets for Notre Dame. I understand you work for the movies. You with any particular studio? Hmm? Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, uh... I'm, uh, I'm, uh, with an independent company. Real Square Productions. We make training films. Training films? Oh, 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 that was simply wonderful. I had to pour a vase of water on him. Several customers were so frightened they left, but it was worth it. And, and how are you two getting along? Uh, Risha, I was just talking about football. He was explaining the merits of a short pass. Oh. Well, if you don't mind, Lillian, Mr. Uh, uh, Richard and I have some business to talk over. Not at all. Get him to tell you how he started by making helmets. Maybe you'll get some new ideas, Rene. Helmets? <laughs> oh, my goodness. See you later, Risha. I'll wear my muzzle. Isn't she lovely? She has about as much conscience as a tiger in a chicken coop. Okay, now, uh, now, what about our business? Oh, of course. Now, here's a retainer. I trust that 500 is enough to start on. My landlord will think so. What do I do? Well, I've told everyone that you're going to be with us until the fall showing. You want to see how I work. Perhaps take some designs back to Hollywood with you. Now, all you really have to do is to get to know the people that work for me. Now, be here from nine in the morning to six at night and keep those designs from being stolen. Oh, by the way, where are the designs? They're in my safe here. Tomorrow they go to the designing rooms and that's when the situation becomes acute. We'll have nothing to worry about until tomorrow, so I'll see you tomorrow in the morning at nine, Mr. Diamond. Okay. Oh, uh, in case you need me, here's my card. I'll write my home number on it. For some reason, when I get a client, they always run into silly little things like murder or something. You just might need me. See you in the morning. I left Renee and headed for my apartment. I had suddenly found myself in the horrible position of a man with a steady job. Nine in the morning until six in the evening. Now, I'm a guy who can get along without too much sleep, especially when the situation calls for it. Like the little blonde dancer that works over on 52nd Street. There was a situation. But this time, I figured a good night's rest wouldn't do me any harm, so when I got home, I fixed a bite to eat, took a hot shower, and climbed into my little old sack. <laughs> Stop that. Wake up. Hmm? What? Oh, no, no. Who is it? It's Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, well, bully for you. What time is it? It's 4.30 in the morning. Goodbye, Walt. Now, you wait a minute. I'm just trying to make things easy on you. And what was that hello, honey, for? Oh, I was dreaming. What do you mean, make things easy for me? At 4.30 in the morning, nothing's easy. I wanted to let you get here under your own steam. I know what a shock it'd be if I sent Otis down there to drag you out of bed. Oh, yeah. Horrible. I don't late eight the fire the Dracula was loose again. Hey, what do you want me there for? Well, I know you won't be surprised, but there's been a Ritter O killing. Well, so what? So you're mixed up in it. Now get down here. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who's dead? A guy named Benet. Auto accident. Rene Benet? Yeah, I guess that's the way you pronounce it. You see, Otis, your mallet head, you were wrong. It's pronounced Benet, not Benny. That idiot was calling him Rene Benny. Walt, how did you know I was working for Benet? Your card was found in his pocket. I'm at 125th Street, so come on up as fast as you can. Well, as soon as I get my football helmet off. Football helmet? You sleep in a football helmet? Well, I do. Don't you? Bye. I left the apartment and took off the address Walt had given me. It was way uptown on Riverside Drive. It was cold and the fog had begun to drift in. I found Walt over near the prowl car and he briefed me. Rene Benet had been killed in an automobile accident. His car had crashed over a hundred foot viaduct. He went through the guardrail up there, Rick. 
Oh, I wonder what he was doing way up here. Certainly wasn't headed home. Maybe he was going to see someone. Oh, well, maybe. Better check and see if he knew anyone out this way. Now, you wait a minute. You think something's wrong? Could be, huh? He had a partner who might want him out of the way. Oh, it's a mess, isn't it? Yeah, pretty badly burned before the fire boys got here. Wait a minute, Otis is over there with him. Otis! Probably warming his feet. He couldn't warm those big things in an atom bomb. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant, yeah, Lieutenant. Did you find anything? Yeah, there's been a fire. Oh. Get over here! Walt, what about that card you found in his pocket? Why didn't it get burned? It was in one of his suits over at his apartment. I put in a call, checked his license plate, found out who he was, where he lived, and sent a couple of boys over. They came up with your card. You know how they all love you. Hmm. Anything else in the apartment? Nothing yet. We'll get a report. Uh, here I am, Lieutenant. He's getting smart. Oh, hello, Shamus. Otis, get the car started. We'll go back to the station and wait for a report about this accident. Uh, yeah, yeah. Lieutenant. No! No? That's right. You touch that siren and I'll throw you out of the car. Oh, uh, the guy can't have any fun anymore. <laughs> going to get that report at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I know it's 6.30. I always yawn like this when it's 6.30. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah? Uh, I got that report, Lieutenant. Take the marbles out of your mouth. What did you say? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm a little sleepy. Maybe you'd like me to sing you a lullaby. Oh, that'd be silly. Well, then make sense. Uh, I got that report. Uh, Benny... Uh... Benny. Okay. Uh, he died from the fire. Autopsy showed he had a slight concussion, but not serious enough to kill him. What about the car? It wasn't tampered with. There was something funny, though. A steering wheel was smeared like someone had been wearing gloves. No prints. Uh, Benny didn't have on any gloves. How'd the fire start? A uh, cigarette in the upholstery. A uh, cigarette in the upholstery. Okay, Otis, I'll call you if I need you. Go on back to sleep. Did you hear? Yeah. Benet was murdered. What makes you so sure? Walt... Otis said he had a slight concussion, but not enough to kill him, right? Okay. You're going to tell me that he was unconscious the whole time it took that fire to start? Ordinarily, a cigarette smolders a long time. Then why didn't he get out of the car? Because he didn't have time to wake up. Someone helped that fire along, got it burning in a few minutes, and then pushed the car over the viaduct. Ah, that isn't enough. Okay. How's this, then? Benet didn't smoke. Now, that I'll buy. But how do you know? He told me. I offered him a cigarette in my office this morning. Well, who do you think did it? Well, I know he had two enemies. His partner, Gerald Winters, and another hat designer, George Marchand. I'll have them picked up. No, no, no. Let them alone for a while. Huh? Let's have some breakfast first and then go down to Rene's salon when it opens. Quite a store. Yes? Oh, oh, good morning. How's Richard from Hollywood? From hunger. Richard from Hollywood? <laughs> All right, Paul. Oh, I wish Otis was here. He'd love this. <laughs> well, whose side are you on? Now, uh, Walt, this is Lil, uh, uh, Lillian Richmond, Walt. Lillian, this is Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant? Homicide. Oh, well, I hope he's just in to buy a hat for his wife. I'm not married, Miss Richmond. Well, to buy a hat. Lillian, I just called Renee's apartment to... Oh, what do you want? Walt, this is Gerald Winters. Who split his lip? He ran into a fist. Where were you between three and four o'clock this morning, Mr. Winters? What do you want to know for? Uh, Gerald, this is a lieutenant from Homicide. I think maybe something's happened. What could have happened? I was in bed from 11 o'clock till late. Besides, what's a policeman doing with the great Richard from Hollywood? Did someone see one of his creations and strangle to death? Where were you around four this morning, Lillian? Also in bed, but I can't prove it. Why? Bernays has been killed. What? You don't seem too upset, Mr. Winters. No? Well, you're right. As a matter of fact, I'm not. How did it happen? Car went over the viaduct, burned to death. Well, then why ask us where we were? It was an accident, wasn't it? No, it was not an accident. Mr. Winters, what happens to you now? You take over the firm? Well, well yes. It, it all goes to me. I think you'd better come down to the station, answer a few questions. Oh, no, no. you don't... Well, this is absurd. I... I hated Rene, but I'd never kill him. Rick, do me a favor and go over to this, uh, George Marchand. Talk to him until I can send Otis down to pick uh, him up. You... You aren't a hat designer, are you? Bingo. You went another split lip. No, no, no. Lay off him, Rick. 
Come on, Mr. Winters. Let's go. I knew he wasn't. I just knew that man couldn't be famous in Hollywood or anywhere else. Well? Mm-hmm. Police? Private detective. The name's Diamond. Mm-hmm. Did you ever play football? Yeah. Stop back after you see Marshawn. I'd like to find out more about the game. Strong line and a good backfield. You've played it. Good morning, good morning, good morning. What can I do for you? Uh, George Marchand? Yes. Well, I'm from the police, Mr. Marchand. The police? Your competitor, Rene Benet, was killed last night. What? He was burned to death in his car. Oh, but this is horrible, horrible... But what has Rene's death to do with me? Well, we think he was murdered, and we're trying to find a good motive. Mr. Diamond, it's true that Rene and I were enemies. Everyone knew it, but to think that I would take his life is utterly absurd. Yeah. Where were you about four this morning, Mr. Marchand? Well, I, uh, I was in bed, asleep. Everybody sure had a dull evening. How well do you know Gerald Winters, Renee's partner? Oh, just slightly. How about Lillian Richmond? By reputation only. Uh, one more question. When's your fall showing, Mr. Marchand? In two days. Well, be sure to be around for it. The police get very unhappy if a murder suspect catches the first plane for the border. Murder suspect? See you later, Mr. Marshall. I left Marshall counting his pulse and wondering just how much I did know. And if he could have seen what was going on in my little old mind, he might have grown a few white hairs. I grabbed a cab and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson. Needless to say, he was not happy. Oh, now you wait a minute, Diamond. I'm satisfied with Gerald Winters. He's the only one who had a motive. The only one who had a motive that you can see. Too many things point to someone else. Give me a for instance. Oh, you always want a for instance. Well, hang it, you're trying to convince me that Winters isn't the killer, aren't you? Yes, I am, all. Then I want a for instance. I want to know your reason. Well, Winters and Renee hated each other. Even as partners, they really wanted each other out of the way. Are you crazy? You just gave me the best reason for hanging on to Winters. Walt, when Renee was killed, he was ten miles away from his apartment going in the other direction. So what? Did you find out if you knew anyone who might live out that way? Even if he didn't know anyone out that way, I still say, so what? The killer went for a drive with him, got out there, hit him over the head, poured gasoline on the seat, and dropped a cigarette. Pushed him off the viaduct. And Winters smokes. I know. I sent a whole carton down to a cell to make sure. You're right about how the killer did it. But do you think Rene would have taken a drive like that with a man he hated, knowing how much a man hated him? Huh? And another thing. It was pretty warm yesterday and last night, wasn't it? It certainly was. Lousy weather. Okay. The killer wore gloves. Isn't that a little strange on a warm night? So he slipped on some gloves. Didn't want to leave any fingerprints. No, no, no. The killer was driving. The report said there were absolutely no fingerprints on the steering wheel. If Rene was in the driver's seat, there would have been a few of his anyway. We couldn't tell whether he was in the driver's seat. He could have been thrown aside when the car crashed. But I don't get this glove angle. You want to catch a killer? Oh, what kind of a remark is that? Well, come on. Oh, where are we going? Down to Rene's shop. We can get in through a window I noticed in the alley. There are some designs in his safe, and Walt, the killer has to get them out tonight. There you are, Lieutenant. It's Jimmy. Rick, I don't like this. Busting into a place without a warrant. Oh, go on. Climb in and watch out for the burglar alarm. All right. Come on, Otis. Okay. Here, I'll give you a hand, Diamond. Oh, well, that ought to be easy for you, Otis. Yeah, why? Well, you could hold on with the other four and still have one left over. Grab me. Oh, is that so? You two lay off. Come on, Rick. Show me where to go. Right over here, in Renee's office. What makes you think the killer hasn't already stolen the plans? I wouldn't have done it the night of the murder. That would have shown a motive. Wouldn't have done it today. Too many people in the shop. Go on in. Mm, gee. Spooky. I can't see a thing. Walt, watch this. Boo. <laughs> ah, for Pete's sake, Sean. Now lay off, Otis Diamond. And where do we hide? Just sit on anywhere and be quiet. The first person through that door is our killer. clock is going to drive me crazy. You want me to shut it off? How do you shut off a clock, stupid? Bust it. Oh. Rick. Yeah? I still don't understand why that glove angle is so important. Well, as a single item, it's not so important. 
But along with the rest, it was the first thing that gave me an idea of the killer. Lieutenant. Yeah? I think I got it. <laughs> I did. Oh. Rick, it's three o'clock. I don't think your killer's gonna show. Yeah, I'm getting stiff. Hold it, Walt. Hmm? I think we have a customer. Otis, get up and stand next to that light switch. Flip it on when I tell you. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Otis. <gasps> oh, hello, Lillian. <sighs> Oh, you startled me. What's this all about? What are you doing here? Waiting for you. For me? I, I don't understand. I, I was just coming over to, to pick up some of my sketches. I forgot them this afternoon. So you waited until three in the morning? I had a date. Yeah. Otis, go out and drag in her date. Now, you wait just a minute. I don't know what this is all about. But go you ahead, know Otis. Right to... You're right. Mr. Diamond, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sure, lover. Point by point, it goes something like this. Rene Benet was killed by somebody new and trusted. He never would have gone for that riot otherwise. Benet didn't smoke. So the killer was an amateur and started the fire with a cigarette. The killer wore gloves, and it was too hot that night for a man to wear them without looking suspicious. Are you saying that you think that I... That you killed Benet? You... Sure you did. Come on, you, you get in there. take your dirty hands off of me. Yeah, here he is, Lieutenant. This is the guy in the car. You little... What is this all about? You better ask Mr. Diamond, although I don't think he'll make much sense. He just accused me of killing Rene. What? Good morning, Mr. Marjon. I thought you didn't know, Lillian. Did, uh, well, uh, prior to this evening, I did not. I, I called her because I, I wanted to talk to her about Renee's death. Ah, you're lying. Today at your shop, you call me Mr. Diamond. How did you know my name? Well, uh, you told it to me. No, 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 no. You're fibbing again. I just said I was from the police. Only one person who knew both of us could have called you, and she also knew I was on the way over to your shop. Didn't you, Lil? The name is Miss Richmond. Now prove that I killed Renee. You've got no motive. Well, the designs are enough to start with. You probably suspected I wasn't a hat designer. And you knew you had to work fast if you were going to get those designs to Marchand here before this fall showing. That's not true. Lillian never gave me any designs from Rene. You know, of course, Mr. Marchand, that if we stick your girlfriend with a murder rap, you're an accessory before and after the fact. Mm, what? Sure, maybe you'll, uh... Maybe you'll get to sit in a nice electric glove seat and hold hands. Oh, but I had nothing to do with the murder. Well, you knew about it, and you knew who did it. That's enough to put you away for 20 years. Being mixed up in the actual motive might get you life. No, 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 no. She was the one that did it. She knew Winters would be blamed for it. George! Yes, she stole the designs for me because she wanted to ruin Benet and take over his salon, but I did not know she was going to kill him. Why, you... Dirty little man, you did know it. You did know it. You helped me plan it if I got the best sketches for you. I'll tear Grab your it, eyes out. Get her away from me. Come on, lady, let's go. Okay, all them both out of the car. Rick, I don't know how. Rick. Oh, no. Rick. Oh, why does he always disappear like that? <laughs> What's that you're playing? What's a new thing? Kind of pretty. Don't cry, Joe. Well, sing it. Oh, all right, but uh, but you know that gripey neighbor in the other apartment building. Oh, don't pay any attention to him. You don't hear any of the other tenants yelling for you to shut up. Well, maybe they're not as forceful as the grouch. <laughs> you see, honey, I uh, I got a couple of letters. Letters? Mm-hmm. From the people in that building. Most of them like the singing, but a. Uh, couple feel the same way the Grouch does. Well, there's only one way to find out what all the people in the building think. Uh, how's that? Open the window and sing so they can all hear you. Oh, uh, okay. I'll buy it. You open the window. Don't you think maybe this is silly? Rick, I like you to sing when you come over here, but I don't want you to do it if no one else does. Now, go ahead. Okay. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go, let her go, let her go. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go, 
let her go, let her go. You've got to realize this is the wind up. You'll feel much better once you make your mind up. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. No reaction yet. Maybe they all took poison. Well, give them time. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, come on, let's go to the kitchen and case the icebox. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hi Aberback, Kay Brinker, Clark Gordon, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday Night brings you some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned to NBC every Saturday evening for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Stay tuned for Irene Dunn and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, surplus homicide, surplus hand grenades, black market embalming. Oh, Rick. Oh, Helen, what's with you? It's what's with you I'm worried about. What do you mean, what's with me? You know what's with you. Now, you stop that. That's my routine. I want that which you pilfered from the living room the other night, and I want it back, and I want it right away. Oh, but Helen, baby. Don't you baby me. Now, you get it down here. But I can't leave the office. I just got in. I haven't even washed out one sock. Rick, it wasn't fair when you stole that picture, and I've been embarrassed about it ever since, Now I want it back. Oh, but honey, don't be that way. It, 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 it looks lovely. Can you see it? Well, sure. Got it right on my desk. Now, Rick, I won't have it. Now, look, if anybody asks about it, I'll, I'll say it's me. You never were a baby. You started with a beard and a low whistle. Honey, honey, I had a baby picture just like it once, and believe me, from the way you're facing in the picture, you couldn't tell the difference between us. I'm lying on a rug. You probably had yours taken on spikes. Now, you bring that right over or I'll tell everybody your middle name. Helen. I'll see you in 20 minutes or I'll take a full page chat in the time. You wouldn't. 20 minutes with the picture. Bye. Helen. Oh, dandy. Hmm. Mr. Diamond? Ah, uh, yes, but I'm afraid you'll have to come back. I, I've got to take care of something that might mean my whole future as a private oh. detective. Well, I'm sorry. I won't keep you, but... Well, could you tell me the name of another good detective? Uh, there aren't any. Goodbye. Oh, please. I don't know where to go. Oh, now, well, wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. Something's really wrong, isn't it? Oh, well, that's all right, Mr. Diamond. You go on. I'll find someone. Now, uh, look, I, I really didn't know you were in a tough spot. I... I've got enough time to listen. Oh, thank you. Who recommended me? My son. Oh, I've heard about you for several years. My name's Kirby, Mrs. Lenore Kirby. How do you do, Mrs. Kirby? 
Just how did your son know me? Well, he didn't know you well, only by reputation. Mm. He was a private detective also. Kirby? Bill Kirby? Yes. Well, um, now tell me what's worrying you, Mrs. Kirby. Well, I don't know quite where to start. William, uh, Bill, has been acting strangely for the last month or so. What exactly do you mean by strangely? Well, he's changed. He's begun to act nervous and irritable. When his sister or I would try to find out what was wrong, he'd get angry. He got steadily worse. And then one morning, Gloria... Gloria? Uh, my daughter, Bill's sister. Oh, go ahead. Well, she went into his room. He was asleep, so she started to hang up his trousers. When she turned them upside down, a lot of money dropped on the floor. Oh? Well, what do you mean, a lot of money? Well, Gloria said there must have been several thousand dollars. Mostly hundred-dollar bills. Did he have another source of income? I mean, besides the private detective business? Oh, no, no. At least mm. nothing I know of. Mm -hmm. We're not wealthy, Mr. Diamond. Bill supports us with what he makes, and Gloria works as a secretary in a law firm, and I try to keep my house in order. Of course, I haven't been terribly well since the children's father died ten years ago. I see. Then what happened? Well, Gloria started to put the money back in Bill's trousers, and he woke up. They had a terrible argument. Bill accused her of snooping, and she accused him of doing something illegal. The next day, Bill packed his clothes and left the house. He took a small apartment on 110th Street. Uh-huh. Now, uh, uh, what is it you want me to do? Oh, well, there's more to the story. Bill continued to send me money to keep the house going, much more than he'd ever contributed before. I went over to his apartment several times and asked him about the money, and every time there'd be an argument. Did he give you any kind of an excuse? No, he just said he'd run into a good thing and that as long as it was helping out with the house, I shouldn't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, then what happened? Well, three days ago, Bill came over to the house... I could tell he was terribly worried about something. He gave me a package, told me to hide it until he came for it and not to open it. Then he disappeared. He didn't go to his office or his apartment, and I haven't heard from him since. Did you call the police? Well, I didn't want to. He's mixed up in something. Oh, Mr. Dunn, I'm sure something's happened to my boy. I just know it has. Look, uh, uh, Mrs. Kirby, I admit it sounds a little fishy, but you never can tell. Maybe it's a a, a girl. Could be a lot of things. Uh, where do you live? 984 Amsterdam Avenue. Oh, thank you. Uh, now, you go on home. Take it easy. I'll let you know if anything turns out. All right. I'm sorry I don't usually cry like this. Oh, Mr. Diamond, about your fee. Mrs. Kirby? Yes? Do you cook? Why, well, yes, I'm considered quite a good cook. Well, if I do anything for your son, I'm a sucker for corned beef and cabbage. Now, go on home, and I'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. And God bless you. I'm afraid he knows me too well. Goodbye, Mrs. Kirby. Funny how you can run into a situation like that. Any other time, it's got to be a hundred a day in expenses. But that's because trouble doesn't usually bother me. There's too much of it around, and everybody's a stockholder. Then the little old lady walks in with a bucket full of heartache, and you realize the hundred a day in expenses is only the difference you carry around to make up for that big cold world outside. I put my merit badge away, grabbed Helen's picture off the desk, and headed for 975 Park Avenue. Well, you're late. I was just going to call the papers, but I wasn't quite sure how you spell your middle name. It's, um, C-H-O... Uh, here's the picture. Thank you. I didn't know you had a mole in your... Rick. Aren't you coming in? No, no, I'm not. I'm mad. Won't even let me keep your little old baby picture. Now, about that mole... Now, you stop that. Why can't you come in? Well, I got a client right after I talk to you. I got to go down to the 5th Precinct and do some checking. Will I see you tonight? If you'll tell me about the mole. Now, Rick. See you at 8. Mm, bye, mole. A Sam. A baby. I left Helen and started down Park Avenue. Every private detective must get a license before he can operate. A 
and the police department has to issue it. So I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. When I walked in the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis looking like he was headed for the elephant's graveyard. What's the matter with you, Otis? You're greener than a new lawn. Oh, hello, Shamus. I don't feel so good. No, as a matter of fact, you don't. A little pudgy around the shoulders. Ah, oh, come on, lay off. I tell you I feel sick. Let's see your tongue. Huh? Oh. Uh. Mm-hmm. Well, how's it look? I don't know. But be careful who you show it to. Somebody's liable to think it's poisonous and kill it with a stick. Uh. Hello, Walt. Oh, no. Okay, I'm too tired to be scared off today. Who's dead and where? Not today, Walt. And what are you so tired about? Uh, we had a killing this morning. I've questioned every suspect in the whole state. Nothing. Who got dead? Maybe you knew him. A shamus. Uh, Kirby. What? Hey, how the devil did you know that? Just a guess. Guess my 38. Do you know something? I don't know anything, Walt. Kirby's mother was just in my office. Oh. Yeah, oh. Well, you don't have to get sore. I'm not sore. Just wondering who's going to tell Mrs. Kirby. Otis went over there a little while ago. He saw the sister. The mother wasn't home yet. Oh, that's why he looks so bad. Yeah, I guess so. Wouldn't you? Okay, where's the body? Downstairs. You want to take a look? Not especially. I told his mother I'd do something for him, and right now I don't seem to be able to think of a thing. Get the killer. Help me. Okay, let's go down and take a look. <laughs> Four slugs in him first, though. What kind of a gun? Twelve-gauge shotgun. Used a deer load. Anything on him? Just the usual identification. Okay, let's put him back. I don't know why he got knocked off. No motive, no nothing. The mother has quite a story. Yeah? She told me her son... Hey, but... Who can? Oh, no. Yeah? And here comes Malicious. Hey, we just got a call. Kirby's mother and sister just got beat up. Something awful. What? Come on, Walt. Well, this is crazy. Yeah. First the son gets it for no apparent reason, then the rest of the family get beat up. I think I can tell you why the mother and sister got beat up. Yeah, why? Probably the package Kirby left with his mother. What package? I'll tell you about it on the way over in the car. Okay, Otis, okay. Come on, step on Lieutenant. it. Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, this time you can use the siren. Oh, boy. Hello, Mrs. Kirby. The doctor tells us you won't allow them to take you to the hospital. No, I'm not leaving my house. It'll take more than two cheap hoodlums to drive me out of my house. Well, the doctor says you'll be all right, but I think the hospital might be safer for a few days. This is Lieutenant Levinson, Mrs. Kirby. How do you do, How Lieutenant? do you do? I know you don't feel much like talking. Oh, no, that's quite all right. I'll be glad to help in any way that I can. Were they after the package your son left with you? Yes, but I didn't give it to them. I almost did when they started to hit Gloria. But I knew they had something to do with Bill's death. And you knew the package was important, too? Yes. Oh, where is the package, Mrs. Kirby? In the bread box. In a bread wrapper. Pretty cute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Go in the kitchen and bring me the loaf of bread in the bread box. Uh, you want some sardines, too? Otis. Just the bread. Please. Oh, Okay. Mrs. Kirby, the two men who came here, do you think you could identify them? Oh, yes. It would be hard to forget them. You're sure you don't have any idea what kind of trouble your son was in? No. Uh, here's the bread, Lieutenant. Yeah. Well, I'll be... Hey, it's a shoe. Is this one of your son's shoes, Mrs. Kirby? Hmm? No, no. He wears a much smaller size. No, that isn't his shoe. I don't get this. Nothing in it, just a shoe. A big one. What size is it? Uh, hey. What's the matter? Well, the uh, shoe size on the inside, it says 6B and then five numbers after it. Well, if that's a 6B, Otis wears matchboxes. Oh, yeah. Otis. Oh, okay. I don't understand. Why would Bill leave a shoe and act like it was so important? Because it probably was very important. Uh, you think these numbers could be? Let's see. Well, if these numbers do mean anything, it sure isn't going to be easy finding out. 
Here's something, Walt. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Shoe's got new heels on it. It's been half-soled. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Take the shoe down at the station. Give it to the lab. See what they can find out. And then get the boys out and check every shoe repair shop in the city. I want to know where the shoe was half-soled. Okay. Mrs. Kirby, you're sure you can't think of a thing that might give us a tip about your son? No, nothing, Mr. Nyman. Rick. I'm going down to the station, find out about that shoe. And then I'll send our rogues gallery over so Mrs. Kirby can try and pick out the two guys who worked her over. Oh, uh, check with me if you find out anything, will you? Right, Walt. Mr. Diamond, there's no reason for you to go on with this case. My son's dead. You can't help him now. I'm sure your business is very important. Mrs. Kirby, I said I'd do something for your son. Well, I was a little late. Now I'm going to do something for me. There's a killer loose, and two slobs who beat up women. I'm a little unhappy, Mrs. Kirby, so I've got to square this beef the only way I know how. First, I'd like to talk to your daughter. Now, now, look, Gloria... It's tough, and I don't like to stick my big nose in when it is. But you want something done about it, don't you? Yes. Then think real hard. Can you tell me anything about your brother that might be connected with his death? No. No, Mr. Diamond. I've thought and thought and thought, and I, I just can't understand it. Well, you may have been looking for the wrong thing, a reason or a motive. That's not what I want. What do you want? Something you might not even realize, something that might not seem important, but is very important. Now, try to think. When you first began to suspect that your brother was in trouble, did he mention any names, talk about any places? No. Not that I can remember. What did he do when he wasn't at his office? Oh, please. Please, I don't know. I just don't know. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Mom and I appreciate what you're doing, Mr. Diamond. Right now, it's hard for me, but I'll try. Okay. No places. No names. Did he have a girl? No, he didn't have a girl. He led a fairly simple life. Had a regular routine. Routine? Mm -hmm. Mom used to worry about it sometimes. Said he didn't have enough fun. Didn't know anybody. What kind of a routine was this? Well, the usual thing around the house in the morning. He'd go to work. On his way home, he always stopped at a bar on Columbus Avenue for a beer. Then home. Dinner. Read until... 10.30 or 11, go to bed. Nothing else? No, he did that every day. At least up until the time when he started acting funny and I found all that money. I see. Well, thanks. I, I'll let you know if anything turns up, Gloria. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. I hope you... Yeah. <laughs> I left the Kirby house and walked out on the street. It was getting near six o'clock and a light breeze was blowing the night in. It was turning cold, so I flipped my collar up and started for Columbus Avenue and the bar that Bill Kirby used to stop in for a beer. I turned down 88th Street, picked up speed to shake the chill out of my ankles. Hey, you. Yeah? You diamond. So what? So where's this shoe? Oh, you're going to find it harder working me over than a couple of women. Working you over, maybe, yeah. Killing you? Everybody dies easy. Give me the shoe. Where's your friend? Move in this alley. I'll give you an introduction. I'm busy. You're going to be busy getting dead if you don't get in the alley. I got my gun in my pocket. I bet you shrink four feet when you aren't carrying it. What? Okay. Did you get him? Yeah. But it don't look like he's got the shoe on him. Yeah, but he knows where it is. Tell me, boys, is it fun beating up women? <laughs> More fun beating up those gum shoes, ain't it, Danny? Sure. You want to tell us where the shoe is, Shamus? Right now, it should be in the police lab. Hey, Danny, you think those cops really took it out of the house? I don't know. I couldn't see. Diamond, I still think the old dame gave it to you when she went up to see you at your office this morning. What did you kill her son for? Who said I killed him, friend? Kirby got smart about the shoe like you did. He got dead for his trouble. How do you feel about your future, friend? Pretty good. The cops will figure that shoe out. Not unless they know what they're looking for. He ain't got the shoe on him, Bart. I think he's telling the truth. Let's go tell the boss. Yeah, what do we do with the gum shoe? Oh, I'm surprised at you, Bart. Give me your sap. Hey, now, wait a minute. For what? Okay. You gonna knock him off? I get a salary for killing. 
The boss ain't paying me to knock this guy off. I want to save him in case he thinks I should later on. Let's go. It isn't easy coming out of a fast beating. When the guy works, you're over slow. You don't go to sleep right away. Not until he wants you to anyway. Then he taps you with a good one and that's it. When he does it in a hurry, the first one's enough to stun a dragon. But for some reason, he decides you need a few more. And friend, that's when coma sets in. When I finally pulled myself out of it, my watch said seven o'clock and my head felt like a balloon with rice in it. I finally came around to a reasonable way of thinking and headed for the bar on Columbus Avenue. Yes, sir? What? Holy Ike. Give me anything with nerves in it and tell me where your phone is. Sure. You're a mess. Yeah, I know. Been advertising a popular cigarette. Been stepping out of thousands of store windows all over the country. Now, where's your phone? Uh, right over there, at the end of the bar. Hey, you want us to put some plasma in this drink? Oh, that was a Jim Dandy. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Rick, where the devil you been? Playing patty cake with the two Garnifs who worked over Mrs. Kirby and her daughter. Well, we've been trying to get you. Otis has been calling blondes all over town. Mrs. Kirby and her daughter identify the two hoods. First name's Bart and Danny? Yeah, Bart Franchetti and Danny Miller. We have a pickup out on them now. They hurt you bad? Oh, I'll make it, but I'm going to ache for a while. What did you find out about the shoe? Well, we really got some fast action on those half soles. Figured if Kirby picked him up at a shoe repair shop, it must have been somewhere in his neighborhood. We were lucky. We were right. Little shoe shop on Columbus Avenue. Columbus Avenue? What address? 695. Why? Because I'm in a bar right across the way. Huh? Can't see the shoe store now because it's too dark, but Kirby's sister told me he used to come in here for dinner. He could have watched it then. Oh, stay there. I'll be right over. Here you are, mister. Thanks. Ah... Uh... Say, uh, did you know Bill Kirby? The Sharmas? Oh, sure. Uh, what do you mean, did I know him? He's pretty dead. Oh, no. He came in here every day, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, for a beer. Uh, but come to think of it, I ain't seen him since he left... The... Uh, left you what? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing at all. Now, wait a minute. If Kirby left you anything, let's have it. Uh-uh. If Kirby's dead, I'll turn it over to the cops. You want the badge? Oh, well, okay. Why didn't you say so? I got in the cash register. He told me if anything happened to him to turn it over to the law. Okay. Here. Just an envelope. Thanks. Yeah. What is it? Hmm. A name and address. Uh, a look. Uh, Lieutenant Levins will be here in a few minutes. Tell him I've gone to this address, 18 North River. Well, that's down near the docks. Yeah. And tell him I've gone to find a guy named uh, James Willis. Honey, is Mr. Willis in? Yes. The emergency hospital's on the second floor. I always go around this way. It makes people notice me. Which is Mr. Willis's office, dear? Right over there, but I'm afraid you can't... Here's the badge, baby. Oh. And don't ring him. Yes, sir. Yes? Well, 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 well. James Willis. When did you change your name from Koslick? Now, look, Diamond... I've got a good job here. I never could have gotten it if the company had known I was James Koslick and I'd done time. In the shipping business, huh? What's an old-time safe cracker like you doing in the shipping business? You're not a cop anymore, Diamond. You helped put me away once, but I've quit the rackets, and I'm doing fine in a legit way. Now you can leave. What does your company ship? We're in export and import firm. We ship and receive everything. Now get out. What does your company import that might interest two professional thugs like Bart and Danny? What? I don't know what you mean. Where do you have your shoes fixed? Little place on Columbus Avenue, maybe? I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't intend to sit here and listen to you and your riddles. Miss Williams, will you please have one of the watchmen sent in to show Mr. Diamond out? Yes, sir. But two gentlemen wish to see you. They say it's very important. Well, I can't see anyone. Well, I think maybe you better. 
They seem very deaf. Miss Williams, I don't... Ow. What's the matter, Mr. Willis? Diamond, let go of my hair. Tell her to show the gentleman in or I'll make setting bull look like a piker. Go on. Send the two gentlemen in, Miss Williams. Okay. I'm going over here behind the door. You be a good boy. You nearly pulled all my hair out. Well, what's the difference? The way things look, the state might have to shave your head anyway. Hey, Willis, we want to talk to you. Well, what's the matter? You sore because we came up here? Yeah, hey, what's with the guy? He just sits there holding his head. Good evening, boys. Hey, hey, look who's here. Yeah, it's the Shamus. And he looked pretty. You fools, you two blundering fools. Now, wait a minute. If you're worried about Diamond, we'll take care of him. I told you I could never be seen with you. You know how we've all watched when the gold shipments come in? Oh, oh, that's it. That's what the shoe was all about. Yeah, you smart one. Shut up. I've got to think. You got the confidential shipping report and put it in that shoe in some kind of code so it could be picked up. Then your dear little boys were going to try to hijack the gold. Well, well, well. I mean, to shut him up. No, no, you crazy. That secretary saw him come in. Take him out the same way. I'm going to be stubborn. Yeah? Oh, okay. Isn't it silly what a little 38 can do? Let's go. All right, but look, as long as I'm probably going to end up in the river, would you mind telling me one thing? Yes, I do. No, that's swell. That's really swell. Kirby recognized you going into that shoe store. He remembered you had a record, so he probably tailed you. Found out where you worked and went back to take a look at that shoe. He found the same thing wrong that I did. The numbers weren't a shoe size, and he probably thought it was crazy when you left only one shoe. So he took the shoe. You always were a pretty smart cop, Diamond. Danny. Yeah, boss? Before you kill the smart cop, pull his hair out. Pull his hair out? By the roots. Now take him out of here. Was Kirby blackmailing you, Willis? Yes. And being stupid, he didn't know what the shoe was for, but he knew it was worth something. Now, please, Danny, get Mr. IQ through that door. Move. Okay. Oh. Yeah, what's funny, Shamus? You boys are in for a big surprise. Oh, Mr. Willis must be free. Here they come now. Just keep walking, Shamus. Nothing. Nothing's wrong. Oh, are you gentlemen through with Mr. Willis? Yeah, Fatso, go on in. He'll see you. Uh, thank you. Let's go, Shamus. Oh, uh, one more thing. Yeah, now what? Duck, Rick! <laughs> Thanks, Walt. And you take it easy, Bart. I ain't going from the gun. I ain't doing nothing. Please, don't shoot. Walt, James Willis is really James Koslick. I'm going in after him. Well, here, Cat, you'll need a gun. Is he in there? Out the window. I went over to the window fast and spotted my man just dropping down off the fire escape. The building fronted on a long dock, and Willis had 50 yards to go before he could find cover. Then I said that stupid thing. Willis! In the name of the law! Stop! Well, he didn't stop in the name of the law, so I rested my arm on the windowsill and led him about two feet. At 50 yards, a running man can be hard to hit with a 38. Sometimes. You get him, Rick? Yeah. See you down at the station. Uh, how do you like it, Rick? Uh, no cream. Twelve lumps. Right. Say, I had a phone call from the president of Continental Shipping where that Willis guy worked. <coughs> What do you make this coffee out of, gunpowder? He says there's always been a standing reward of $1,000 for the apprehension of any person attempting to rob their shipment. Uh-huh. Uh, hey, Diamond, Miss Asher phone. She wants you should call. Thanks, Otis. Thanks? What's wrong with you? You heard him, Otis. He said thanks. Okay. He must be sick. More coffee, Rick? Yeah, I'll have another cup. Hello? Hi, honey. Rick. Where are you? I thought you were coming over. Well, baby, I've, uh, I've got to stop by and see a nice old lady named Kirby. Her son got killed. Oh, I'm sorry. Will I see you later? Uh, no, I don't think so, honey. I'm, I'm a little tired. All right, Rick. Well, don't sound too unhappy. I'll see you tomorrow night. Well, all right. But you always sing to me, and I wanted you to sing tonight. Well, I haven't gotten any letters from the apartment building next door yet, so I'm going to lay off one week and see if the tenants miss the singing. All right, Rick. I'll see you tomorrow night. Goodbye, baby. Bye, Rick. Well, I think I'd better get over to Mrs. Kirby's, Walt. Well, don't you want your coffee? Yeah, give it to Otis. What are you going to tell Mrs. Kirby? I mean, about her son and the blackmail. Well, what are you going to tell Continental Shipping? Well, you caught him. You get the thousand. Oh, Mrs. Kirby's pretty broke. Uh-huh. 
Kirby was the one who really spotted the play. Yeah, but if I say anything about the blackmail... What blackmail? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Come to think of it, that was another case, wasn't it? See you later, Walt. Uh, Rick. Yeah? Oh, nothing. Be a good boy. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Stephen Dunn, Peggy Weber, and William Johnstone. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned every Saturday for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Why aren't you at the office? Now, don't confuse me, dear. One question at a time. Come on in the study, and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, now stop being so mysterious. You never come over here at this time of the day. Read some of these. What are they? Letters. Read them. All of them? Well, there must be at least a half a hundred. Well, close. Fifty-three. And those are only about one-tenth of the pile that's in my office. Oh, Rick, are these... Yeah. The lovely, dear, sweet tenants in that gorgeous building right next to this one. They like your singing. Uh, read a couple. Me, me, me. Ho, ho, ho. De, 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 de. Dear Mr. Diamond. La, 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 la. Rick. Go on, go on, go on. Well, stop sounding like a whole quartet. All right. Dear Mr. Diamond, I live in the building across the way from Miss Asher's apartment. Right over there. At least once a week, I sit in my living room and listen to the sounds of your melodious voice. Da, me, me, pull to la, pe. <laughs> Last week, however, I waited for seven straight days, but without result. You did not sing. Me, 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 me. Please, <laughs> Mr. Diamond, for the sake of my family, continue to sing at least once a week. Hmm. I'm beginning to nag my husband, and yesterday I took the rubber bone away from my French poodle. Everybody <laughs> shall be exalted. You see, it's getting to be a real problem with me, and if you want to save me the $25 a day, I would have to pay my psychiatrist, Sing. La -ho. Yours expectantly, Mrs. Louise Cartwright. Rick, are they all like this? Well, no, certainly not. Some of them are really desperate. Now, here's the one I saved out. Read this one if you really want to get a charge. Oh, 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 me, 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 me. My me, dearest me. Mr. Diamond. Me, me. Go, on, ah. go on, go on, go on, go on. I have been listening to your beautiful singing. What? What do you mean, what? Oh, what you just read. I've been listening. No, 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 the last part. Your beautiful singing? Yes, I'm in a chatted evening. Oh, you sure. Go on, finish it now, finish it. Well, she's been listening to your beautiful singing. Oh, yes. Um, and many times I've seen you going into Miss Asher's apartment 
And I think you are as beautiful as your voice. Oh. What? Now, you said that. Turn off the steam and read the last part. I wouldn't miss it. Last week, I waited and waited, but you didn't sing. Everybody shall be exalted. <laughs> I know you were in Miss Asher's apartment, and you certainly had the chance. If Miss Asher is the one that, wo- that won't let you sing, come over to my apartment. Mm. I have a piano, and I just love it. 977 Park, apartment 303. Hmm. Signed, your most ardent fan. Ellen. Uh, Mademoiselle to Mama to Parley. Rick, what are you doing? Open your window. Don't you think it's a little stuffy in here? The air conditioning's on. Rick, now stay away from that piano. No, I knew it, I knew it. Ellen's right. You really don't want me to sing. At 11 o'clock in the morning? No. I want you to sing tonight when it's more romantic. Oh, shame on you. Me? Yes, you. You want to deprive those poor, discouraged people of a little honest, simple pleasure? You want that woman to take her dog's bone away again? <laughs> you idiot. Oh, no telling what'll happen. Those people might not leave their apartments for days. It'll get to be like a prison camp. Think of it. No food. They won't leave the building even to go out and get an orange or a lime or something. And you know what? What? Scurvy. Oh. <laughs> They'll be dying like flies. Well, go on. What's the matter? Dying like flies. <laughs> I wonder who thought up that bright little simile. I've got a big green fly in my office that's so tough he carries a man swatter. Oh! Well, you think it's funny, do you? <laughs> think what'll happen if those poor people stay in that building, withering up with scurvy, you fiend. I... I know it. Yes. It's just that... Well, I don't want to share your tonsils with anyone. I'm selfish. Me, me, me. You're more than that. You're antisocial. All right. All right. You mean? Yes. Sing. Stop, fellow. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Rick. Yes? Did you hear something? Oh, I think so. Try it again. <clears throat> All right. A hundred and one pounds of fun. Rick. Mm, yes. I heard it. That's that grouch. Rick. Yes. There's an enemy in the camp. Well, what do we do? We can't just let those people die over there. Sink him. You mean? Yes. Sing. It's your duty. You're right. It's no longer a matter of personal pride. I must defeat the grouch at all costs. For those thousand starving tenants. Thousand? Big rooms. <clears throat> Stand back. Good luck. Thank you. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. He's weakening. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. Sunshine. He's nearly down. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. There he goes. You are my sun. Rick. Victory. Decidedly. Bull Run was never like this. All right. Now sing Honey Bun and save those poor people. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Honey bun. Bun. Rick. Good grief. Bun. Rick, what happened? I don't know. I can talk all right, but the minute I go up, something happens. I hope you didn't hurt it. La, 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 la. Oh, Rick. Oh, now, isn't that ridiculous? I can't help laughing, but it isn't really funny. Come on, let's go get you some warm milk or something. Mm, me, me. done, I'm off, mo. Oh. <laughs> now, stop that. Give it a rest. Oh, if that grouch only knew, I may never bother him again. Well, he's the only one that doesn't like it. Poor guy. Poor guy, now, that's a silly thing to say. Well, honey, he doesn't like it, let's face it. He'll probably get so desperate he'll have to move. Okay, let him. I wonder what he's doing right now. I'll bet he's planning something fiendish. You think he's going to start shooting burning arrows? I wouldn't put it past him. Now, let's take care of that throat. Well, sometimes silly things like that happen. I come on like a big baritone and lose my voice. Helen has to feed me hot lemon juice and honey for about three hours. And the grouch across the way in the next apartment starts thinking... Up the ten best ways to eliminate diamond. Think I'm kidding? Well, let me tell you. 
I didn't know it then, but that fast course of You Are My Sunshine with my own lyrics started more trouble than a hopped-up mouse in a herd of elephants. While Helen fed me the tonsil cure, old Grouchhead was dreaming of a cure of his own. Why, my dear, what am I going to do? I work in the daytime, try to sleep at night. He sings at night. I switch to the night shift. He sings in the daytime. Oh, I'll fix him. I'll fix that diamond. Yeah, phone book. Phone book. Uh, detectives. Private detail. Ah, uh, look at that. Richard Diamond, private detective. Full page ad. Wouldn't you know it? Now, look at that slogan. Whoever you are, whatever you do, if you're too dead to walk, we'll come to you. Ugh. Must be other detectives in here. Oh, here's one. Pat Kosak. Uh, you are my sunshine, eh? Huh? Oh, Diamond, I'll fix you. I'll fix you good. Is this Pat Kosak? Yeah, for employment. Uh, haven't I heard of you before? I doubt it. Probably that Shamus in Frisco. He's always stealing my stuff. Uh, uh, well, my name is Ernest Lumpkin. Happy Halloween, Mr. Pumpkin. No, no, no. Lumpkin. Lump. Okay, okay. What can I do for you? Well, I've got a problem. It concerns another person in your line of work. You mean another Shamus? Yes. He uh, sings. You mean Diamond? Oh, is he a friend of yours? A competitor isn't a friend. Uh, Diamond gets more clients than anyone in the business, so he isn't even a competitor. He's a capitalist. Uh, he can advertise. People go to him instead of me. I hate him. Oh, uh, Mr. Koslack, hey, you're not alone. The name's Kosak, Mr. Dumpkin. Uh, Lumpkin. Lumpkin Dumpkin. You want to hire me? But uh, you don't even know what I want you to do. Can you pay me 50 bucks a day? If you can do the job in one day. For 50 bucks, I'll steal a Chrysler building and bring it over to you on a motor scooter. What's your address? 977 Park Avenue. And hurry! <laughs> Feel now. Oh, scalded. I'll be eating Zymol trochies for a week. Oh, now it wasn't that hot. Wasn't it? Honey, that lime water was so hot, Alibaba could have boiled his 40 thieves in it. Well, your speaking voice is all right. Every pa- Oh, well, I think I've swallowed the bear rug. Where are you going? Well, I can't sing, and I'm going to see you tonight anyway, so I, I think I'll drop down to the 5th precinct and drive Sergeant Otis out of his mind. Oh, Rick, that poor man. He called up last week when Lieutenant Levinson was looking for you, and he sounded like he was dying, and you were responsible. Honey, when Otis dies, everybody will be running around in spaceships. He got through the Stone Age all right, didn't he? Bye. <laughs> I left Helen and headed for the 5th Precinct police station. It was one of those good afternoons. The sun was leaning on 3 o'clock, and now and then a cool breeze would sail through my sinus and pump my lungs full of that easy, good-to-be-walking-around feeling. I had just about everything. Good job, good girl, and a 4 report from my insurance company. When I reached the station, I hopped up the steps and bounced into the squad room. Sergeant Otis was sitting, sitting over in the corner, making out the weekly report for the commissioner. Hello, Otis. Oh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, really nothing. I just came by to see if I could borrow one of your shoes. I'm going sailing. Oh, that's very funny. You know, someday, Gumshoe, you're going to run out of gags. Then what are you going to do? Well, I could set you on fire. That's sure to be a good uh, chuckle, hmm? Oh, yeah. Lieutenant in? Yeah. Otis, uh, you want to know how to catch a crook? Ah, wise guy. Eat a lot of spaghetti. Oh, how can I catch a crook that way? Just open that big mouth and say, oh, yeah. You'll lasso him. Hello, Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant Levinson? Well, how do you do, Mr. Diamond? Now, what's with the formal routine? Oh, I can't help it. Every time I leave Otis, I feel like I've just stepped out of a gorilla cage. Oh, why don't you leave that poor guy alone, Rick? Oh, he's used to it. If I started treating him like a human being, he'd get so confused, he'd probably cut off his tail. <laughs> Think what would happen, Walt, when he wanted to go to sleep at night. No more hanging upside down. Oh, brother. What's on your mind? Oh, I just thought I'd stop by and chew the fat. Well, go ahead. I already did. Chewed a whole pound right off Otis. Walt, are you sure he's a mammal? Now, you listen to me. Otis is a nice fella for a hammerhead. He can't help it, so stop tearing him down and tell me what you really want. Walt, I'm surprised at you. I just wanted to stop by and say hello. Hello. Where's the body? Now, look, there's nobody. Just a nice chat, that's all. Okay, but I warn you, I won't stand for any routines. And if you're mixed up in something and I have to find out the hard way, 
So help me. I'll put you away so far they'll have to pipe air into you. Walt, you do. Do what? Love me. Oh. Would you like to wear my cig alf pin? Right, for Pete's Violet. sake. What's the matter with you? You've been growing poppies in your office? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Miss Asher on the phone for Diamond. Okay. Phone for you, Rick. Alan. Oh, thanks. Fifth precinct. Remember our motto? A corpse in the morgue is worth two in your basement. Oh, no. <laughs> it's true, Walt. It's true. Oh, I bet Walt just jumped out of the window. No, honey, there's a cast system around here. When Walt feels like jumping out of a window, he throws Otis out first to see if it hurts. Oh. Hi, you baby. Hi. Rick, uh, Mr. Jones called and said it was very important that he see you at once, said it was a matter of life and death. Jones? First name John? Well, he didn't say. He just gave me an address and asked you to come over immediately. 137 River Street. He called me at your apartment? Uh-huh. Hey, I never saw that. How'd he get the number? Uh, no telling. Well, I'll go on over. Maybe he'll turn out to be a good client. Call you later, baby. How's your throat? Oh, la done, I'm all... <clears throat> Goodbye, Rick. Hey, you really sound terrible. Uh, I'll see you later, Walt. Huh? Oh, uh, well, uh, thanks for the brilliant conversation, Sporty. Walt, just because I didn't have a corpse hidden out someplace, you get mad. All right, see if I care. Oh, now, wait a minute. No, no, I understand. Well, you can just get someone else to play jacks with. I'll send you Sam Spade. Uh, now, Rick. Uh. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Why haven't you got that report in here? Uh, I've been eating Spaghetti? Spaghetti? Yeah, and that diamond's a liar. I can't lasso nothing. Maybe you have to be a cowboy. Thanks, Gabby. Keep the change. One thirty seven River Street, the address Helen had given me over the phone, was an old deserted warehouse. Now I want to stop right here and say I admit it was pretty stupid to wander into an empty warehouse like that. But I figured that this Jones guy must be in some kind of trouble to leave a message like that with Helen. The place was as empty as a fairground in the winter. I put my hand on my thirty eight and kept moving toward the back of the building. Then I saw a door. A sign on it said, John Jones. Enter. And wouldn't you know it? I did. Hey! What's going on? Where am I? Let me out of here! Come on, Mr. Lumpkin. Let's get out of here. Let me out of here! But, but I don't understand. He's liable to stay in there forever. I don't want him to stop singing like that. Somebody will come along. I promise you that. I just want him to stay in there for half an hour. That's all. And uh, Now, wait a minute. I want to know just what this is all about. You want him to lose his voice, don't you? Oh, I love it. Well, when he went through that door, he started losing it. How? Well, what's behind that door? An ice box. Come on, Mr. Grumpkin. Well, that's exactly where I was, in an ice box. Not a very big one, but a very cold one. The kind a company might have to store fresh meat and drinks. I tried breaking down the door, but it was a foot thick. I struck a match and looked around. Lots of ice, no way out. So I turned up my collar and sat on the wait. I don't know how long I sat there, but I guessed it to be about 20 minutes. I could tell because my feet had frozen up about 20 minutes worth. Then I heard that lovely sound. Rick. Rick, you in there? Yeah, yeah. Hand me an ice pick. I want to get my, my feet uncrossed. How on the devil did this happen? Well, I think one of the frozen food companies got a new idea. What's the matter, Diamond? Forget oh. your sleigh. Shut up, Otis. <laughs> you think you can walk, Rick? Yeah, sure, but I, I might squeak a little. Ooh. Got a Bunsen burner, Andy? <laughs> Otis. <laughs> okay. How did you find me? We got a call. From a guy named Jones? Yeah. Said he was in danger and that you were coming down to meet him at the warehouse. Said he saw two guys lock you in this icebox. Oh, dandy. Did he say where he was? Yeah. Here's the address. Thanks. Hey, where do you think you're going? Well, I feel better now. I'm going over to find Jones. Well, you might get in trouble. Well, if I can find the two guys who locked me up, you can bet on it. Well, I'm going to send Otis along with you. Otis? I thought you wanted me to keep out of trouble. Oh, now, wait a minute. I can keep you out of trouble, Diamond. Oh, Otis, you couldn't find an elephant in an elevator. Uh, but come on and bring your head with you. This is the address where that Jones guy said he'd meet you. Ah, uh, I'm Mandelbaum, Swedish massage. Hmm, this guy really picks out some great places to hide out. 
Come on, Otis. Feet first, or the rest of you will never get out of the car. Oh. Hey, hey, Diamond. You think while you're talking with this guy Jones, I might get me a rub down? Otis, to rub that stomach of yours, it would take a gallon of baby oil and an octopus to get anywhere. Hey, it smells kind of good, don't it? Like a pine tree, maybe. Otis, how would you remember? The last time you smelled a pine tree was when you used to run with a pack. Now listen here, Diamond. You got to lay off. I don't go around... Yeah, here. what can I do for you? Holy cow. Get the biceps. Oh, I'm looking for a guy named Jones. Oh, yeah? Who wants him? The name's Diamond. Oh. Well, Mr. Jones is expecting you. I think he's back in the steam. Which way is it? Uh, straight back. I'd show you is when I gotta give a guy a rub. Come on, Otis. You must be at the end of the hall. That's a pretty bright observation. Seeing as how there's only one door and it's at the end of the hall. Yeah, yeah, that's the steam room. How do you know? Oh, by this little window in the door. What do you see? Steam. Then by golly, it must be the steam room. Gee, I can't see nothing. Uh, Mr. Jones? Hey. Ain't that some guy lying over there on the bench? Yeah, it looks like it. Mr. Jones! Yeah. You don't answer. No. Oh, just look, I'm going over there. Keep the door open. I don't want anyone to lock me in this place. Oh, okay. Mr. Jones, I... Well, hey, Otis. It's just a bunch of towels rolled up to look like somebody. Yeah. Hey. hey! Otis, what's the matter? Uh, diamond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? Right over here. Well, what are you doing there? I told you to stay by the door and keep it open. Well, I did stay by the door until I got pushed. Pushed? Oh, no. You, you know something? What? I think we're locked in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shut up, Otis. Ah, oh, but I don't feel so good. What are we going to do? Oh, why don't you be happy? It's the only chance you'll ever get to sort off some of that blubber. Yeah, you want I should look like one of the atrocity pictures? Otis, you could lose 300 pounds and still weigh in with King Kong. Yeah, there's no time to get nasty. Well, relax. Read a magazine or something. What do you mean? Just what I said. Read a magazine. Isn't that one right over there? Yeah. Oh. Oh, for Pete's sake. How can I read this thing, Shamus? The pages is all stuck together. You couldn't read the first line of an eye chart anyway. Just look at the pictures and shut up. Okay. Hey! What's the matter? This magazine. Take a look at this. What is it? It's one of them movie magazines of uh, Movie Stars Parade. So what? Well, get a load of these pictures. Ain't that you? Let me see. Well, how about that? Some guy acting like Richard Diamond, private detective. Well, it looks like you. Ah, no, it's that Powell guy, that actor. Carry it up. Oh, no, no, it's a good magazine. Give me that. Oh, hey, what'd you do that for? If it hadn't been for that juvenile, I could have been in pictures myself. Now try kicking in that little window again. Ah, uh, it's no use. That glass must be bulletproof. Oh, swell. First an icebox and now a steam bath. I'm going to start thinking I'm in California. Well, don't just sit there sweating. Do something. My uniform's shrinking. Well, maybe now it'll match your head. I just can't figure this. If someone wants to, well, someone wants to get rid of me, why did they do it the old-fashioned way? Oh, don't say that. Oh, how long do you think we've been in here? I don't know. Hey, Diamond. Yeah? My socks just disappeared. Well, go kick on the door again. It's your turn. I don't think I can make it. We've been in here for days. Hey, Look at your watch. It's all steamed up. I can't tell. You think there'll be anything left? Just your shoes, Otis. It'll take a blast furnace to get rid of those. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I thought I heard somebody outside. Yeah? Hey, help! Help! Shut up. Yeah. Hey! Hey, what's going on in here? Who closed the bowl on the door? We're saved. Uh, would you mind helping us out, old man? We seem to be a little limp. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? Hey, what are you doing in here with your clothes on? Trying to get them steam cleaned. <laughs> oh, fresh air. Now, would you two guys mind telling me what this is all about? Maybe you better tell us, Buster. I don't know what you mean. Who locked the door on us? How do I know? I give a guy a rub. When I come back, I find the door bolted. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? You sure he was in the steam room? Sure. He comes in and says he wants a steam. You should show up. I should send you back. I told him I was going to give a rub to stay in long as he liked. 
Did he ask you how long the rub would be? Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, he did. Uh, I said it'd be about half hour. I don't get it. I don't get it. He wanted me in that steam room for just a half an hour. He wanted me in that ice box for about the same time. What's with this? Diamond. Look at this uniform. Oh, I think it's lovely, Otis. You should always wear knickers. <laughs> This is stupid. Didn't the guy at the steam room tell you what this Jones guy looked like? Well, from the description, could have been anyone. Look, I'm just as mixed up as you are. Well, we'll keep after it. Just don't worry, that's all. Hey, Diamond. Miss Asher just called and I told her what's been happening. You mean you know? No, but I told her anyway. She said you should come right over because she had dinner for you. And she wanted to take care of you. <laughs> Isn't he lovely, Walt? Think what that head is going to look like in a bottle. Oh, now you got him sore. It's going to be horrible around here. Well, isn't it always? Now well, I'm going on over to Helen's. Keep after that Jones guy and let me know if you run across anything. How are you, Mr. Clumpkin? Lumpkin. Okay, how are you? Uh, come in, come in. Well, <laughs> I'm not a friend of oil for You think it did the trick? Look, when Pat, uh... Yeah, Cossack. Yeah, Cossack. Well, when I do anything, the results are guaranteed. I just tailed Diamond from the station. He went into his girlfriend's apartment across the way. Oh, goody. <laughs> Let's see what happens tonight. I'm staying home from work just to hear him not sing. Yeah. About my 50 bucks. Oh, look, he's never in that apartment more than 10 minutes before he starts singing. If he goes over 15, you get your 50. Come on. What are we going to do? Raise the window. I don't want to miss the lovely silence when he opens that big bazoo. Oh, yes, I do, and Mommy's going to make it better. Here's a nice drink. I don't want a nice drink. Oh, it's strong enough. Well, put it in a dirty glass. You just drink it. Okay. Ah, oh, wow, my throat. Ah! You hear something? No, why? Nothing. Your throat's still pretty bad. Mm, don't know. Me, 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 me. Oh, hey, it's pretty good. That sounds great. Oh, no! Now, I heard something then. Yeah, so did I. It's a grouch again. Give it to him. Oh, you bet. I feel mean. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Get a load of honey bun tonight. I'm speaking of my sweetie pie. Only 60 inches high. Every inch is packed with dynamite. Her hair is blonde and curly. Her curls are hurly burly. Her lips are pips. I call her hips. Whirly and whirly. She's my baby. I'm her pap. I'm her booby. She's my trap. I am caught and I don't want to run because I'm having so much fun with honey fun. <laughs> You know, that ice box and that steam bath were the best things in the world for my throat. Yes. After you lost your voice this morning, I didn't think anything was going to help. But that ice box and that steam bath really did. Diamond! Oh, hello, Mr. Lumpkin. Did I hear you say you lost your voice this morning? That's right, Mr. Lumpkin. Then didn't think I was going to get it back either. Good night, Mr. Diamond! <laughs> you 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jack Crucian, and Stephen Dunn. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was previously released over the National Broadcasting Company for listeners in the United States and has been re-released to you men and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Why aren't you at the office? Now, don't confuse me, dear. One question at a time. Come on in the study and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, now stop being so mysterious. You never come over here at this time of the day. Read some of these. What are they? Letters. Read them. All of them? Well, there must be at least a half a hundred. Well, close. Fifty-three. And those are only about one-tenth of the pile that's in my office. Oh, Rick, are these... Yeah. The lovely, dear, sweet tenants in that gorgeous building right next to this one. They like your singing. Uh, read a couple. Me, me, me. Ho, ho, ho. De, 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 de. Dear Mr. Diamond. La, 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 la. Rick. Go on, go on, go on. Well, stop sounding like a whole quartet. All right. Dear Mr. Diamond, I live in the building across the way from Miss Asher's apartment. Right over there. At least once a week, I sit in my living room and listen to the sounds of your melodious voice. Oh. <laughs> Last week, however, I waited for seven straight days, but without result. You did not sing. Me, 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 me. Please, <laughs> Mr. Diamond, for the sake of my family, continue to sing at least once a week. Hmm. I'm beginning to nag my husband, and yesterday I took the rubber bone away from my French poodle. Every party <laughs> shall be exalted. You see, it's getting to be a real problem with me, and if you want to save me the $25 a day, I would have to pay my psychiatrist sing. La -ho. Yours expectantly, Mrs. Louise Cartwright. Rick, are they all like this? Well, certainly not. Some of them are really desperate. Now, here's the one I saved out. Read this one if you really want to get a charge. Oh, 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 oh. me, 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 me. My me. dearest Mr. Diamond. Me, me. Go on, well, go on, go on, go on, go on. I have been listening to your beautiful singing. What? What do you mean, what? Oh, uh, what you just read. I've been listening. No, 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 the last part. Your beautiful singing? Yes, I'm in a chanted evening. Oh, you show off. Go on, finish it now, finish it. Well, she's been listening to your beautiful singing. Oh, yes. Um, and many times I've seen you going into Miss Asher's apartment, and I think you are as beautiful as your voice. Oh. What? Now, you said that. Turn off the steam and read the last part. I wouldn't miss it. Last week, I waited and waited, but you didn't sing. Everybody shall be exalted. <laughs> I know you were in Miss Asher's apartment, and you certainly had the chance. If Miss Asher is the one that, wo that won't let you sing, come over to my apartment. Mm. I have a piano, and I just love it. 977 Park, apartment 303. Hmm. Signed, your most ardent fan... Ellen. Uh, Mademoiselle from Armentier Pile. Rick, what are you doing? Open your window. Don't you think it's a little stuffy in here? The air conditioning's on. Rick, now stay away from that piano. No, I knew it, I knew it. Ellen's right. You really don't want me to sing. At 11 o'clock in the morning? No. I want you to sing tonight when it's more romantic. Oh, shame on you. Me? Yes, you. You want to deprive those poor, discouraged people of a little honest, simple pleasure? You want that woman to take her dog's bone away again? <laughs> you idiot. Oh, no telling what'll happen. 
Those people might not leave their apartments for days. It'll get to be like a prison camp. Think of it. No food. They won't leave the building even to go out and get an orange or a lime or something. And you know what? What? Scurvy. Oh. <laughs> They'll be dying like flies. Well, go on. What's the matter? Dying like flies. <laughs> I wonder who thought up that bright little simile. I've got a big green fly in my office. It's so tough he carries a man swatter. Oh. Well, you think it's funny, do you? <laughs> think what'll happen if those poor people stay in that building, withering up with scurvy, you fiend. I... I know it. Yes. It's just that... Well, I don't want to share your tonsils with anyone. I'm selfish. Me, me, me. You're more than that. You're antisocial. All right. All right. You mean... Yes. Sing. Stop, fellow. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Rick. Yes? Did you hear something? Oh, I think so. Try it again. <coughs> All right. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's... Rick. Hmm, Yes. I heard it. Uh, it's that grouch. Rick. Yes. There's an enemy in the camp. Well, what do we do? We can't just let those people die over there. Sink him. You mean? Yes. Sing. It's your duty. You're right. It's no longer a matter of personal pride. I must defeat the grouch at all costs. For those thousand starving tenants. Thousand? Big rooms. <clears throat> Stand back. Good luck. Thank you. You are my sunshine, you are my sunshine. You are my sunshine, you are my sunshine. He's you are my sunshine, you are my sunshine. You are my sunshine, sunshine. He's nearly done. You are my sunshine, you are my sunshine. You are my sunshine, you are my sunshine. There he goes. You are my sun. Rick. Victory? Decidedly. Bull run was never like this. All right. Now sing honey bun and save those poor people. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Honey bun. Bun. Rick. Good grief. <laughs> bun. Rick, what happened? I don't know. I can talk all right, but the minute I go up, something happens. I hope you didn't hurt it. La, 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 la. Oh, la. Rick. Oh, now, isn't that ridiculous? I can't help laughing, but it isn't really funny. Come on, let's go get you some warm milk or something. Mm, me, me. Lord, and I'm off, <laughs> oh. Now, stop that. Give it a rest. Oh, if that grouch only knew, I may never bother him again. Well, he's the only one that doesn't like it. Poor guy. Poor guy? Now, that's a silly thing to say. Well, honey, he doesn't like it. Let's face it. He'll probably get so desperate he'll have to move. Okay, let him. I wonder what he's doing right now. I'll bet he's planning something fiendish. You think he's going to start shooting burning arrows? I wouldn't put it past him. Now, let's take care of that throat. Well, sometimes silly things like that happen. I come on like a big baritone and lose my voice. Helen has to feed me hot lemon juice and honey for about three hours. And the grouch across the way in the next apartment starts thinking up the ten best ways to eliminate diamond. Think I'm kidding? Well, let me tell you. I didn't know it then, but that fast course of You Are My Sunshine with my own lyrics started more trouble than a hopped-up mouse in a herd of elephants. While Helen fed me the tonsil cure, old Grouchhead was dreaming up a cure of his own. Oh, what am I going to do? I work in the daytime, try to sleep at night. He sings at night. I switch to the night shift. He sings in the daytime. Fix him. I'll fix that diamond. Yeah, phone book. Phone book. Uh, detectives. Private detail. Ah, uh, look at that. Richard Diamond, private detective. Full page ad. Wouldn't you know it? Yeah, look at that slogan. Whoever you are, whatever you do, if you're too dead to walk, we'll come to you. Ugh. Must be other detectives in here. Ah, oh, here's one. Pat Kosak. Uh, you are my sunshine, eh? Oh, Diamond, I'll fix you. I'll fix you good. Yeah. Is this Pat Kosak? Yeah, for employment. Uh, haven't I heard of you before? I doubt it. 
Probably that Shamus in Frisco. He's always stealing my stuff. Uh, uh, well, my name is Ernest Lumpkin. Happy Halloween, Mr. Pumpkin. No, no, no. Lumpkin. Lum. Okay, okay. What can I do for you? Well, I've got a problem. It concerns another person in your line of work. You mean another Shamus? Yes. He uh, sings. You mean Diamond? Oh, is he a friend of yours? A competitor isn't a friend. Uh, Diamond gets more clients than anyone in the business, so he isn't even a competitor. He's a capitalist. Uh, he can advertise. People go to him instead of me. I hate him. Oh, uh, Mr. Koslack, hey, you're not alone. The name's Kosak, Mr. Dumpkin. Uh, Lumpkin. Lumpkin Dumpkin. You want to hire me? But uh, you don't even know what I want you to do. Can you pay me 50 bucks a day? If you can do the job in one day. For 50 bucks, I'll steal a Chrysler building and bring it over to you on a motor scooter. What's your address? 977 Park Avenue. And hurry! <laughs> your throat feel now? Oh, scalded. I'll be eating Zymol trochies for a week. Oh, now it wasn't that hot. Wasn't it? Honey, that lime water was so hot, Alibaba could have boiled his 40 thieves in it. Well, your speaking voice is all right. Every... Oh, well, I think I've swallowed a bear rug. Where are you going? Well, I can't sing, and I'm going to see you tonight anyway, so I, I think I'll drop down to the 5th precinct and drive Sergeant Otis out of his mind. Oh, Rick, that poor man. He called up last week when Lieutenant Levinson was looking for you, and he sounded like he was dying, and you were responsible. Honey, when Otis dies, everybody will be running around in spaceships. He got through the Stone Age all right, didn't he? Bye. <laughs> I left Helen headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. It was one of those good afternoons. The sun was leaning on 3 o'clock, and now and then a cool breeze would sail through my sinus and pump my lungs full of that easy, good-to-be-walking-around feeling. I had just about everything. Good job, good girl, and a 4 report from my insurance company. When I reached the station, I hopped up the steps and bounced into the squad room. Sergeant Otis was sitting, sitting over in the corner making out the weekly report for the commissioner. Hello, Otis. Yeah. Oh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, really nothing. I just came by to see if I could borrow one of your shoes. I'm going sailing. Oh, that's very funny. You know, someday, Gumshoe, you're going to run out of gags. Then what are you going to do? Well, I could set you on fire. That's sure to be a good uh, chuckle. Hmm? Oh, yeah. And Lieutenant in? Yeah. Otis, uh, you want to know how to catch a crook? Ah, oh, wise guy. Eat a lot of spaghetti. Oh? Uh, how can I catch a crook that way? Just open that big mouth and say, oh, yeah. You'll lasso him. Hello, Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant Levinson? Well, how do you do, Mr. Diamond? Now, what's with the formal routine? Oh, I can't help it. Every time I leave Otis, I feel like I've just stepped out of a gorilla cage. Oh, why don't you leave that poor guy alone, Rick? Oh, he's used to it. If I started treating him like a human being, he'd get so confused he'd probably cut off his tail. <laughs> Think what would happen, Walt, when he wanted to go to sleep at night. No more hanging upside down. Oh, brother. What's on your mind? Oh, I just thought I'd stop by and chew the fat. Well, go ahead. I already did. Chewed a whole pound right off Otis. Walt, are you sure he's a mammal? Now, you listen to me. Otis is a nice fella for a hammerhead. He can't help it, so stop tearing him down and tell me what you really want. Walt, I'm surprised at you. I just wanted to stop by and say hello. Hello. Where's the body? Now, look, there's no body, just a nice chat, that's all. Okay, but I warn you, I won't stand for any routines. And if you're mixed up in something and I have to find out the hard way, so help me. I'll put you away so far they'll have to pipe air into you. Walt, you do. Do what? Love me. Oh. Would you like to wear my Sig Alf pin? Rick, Violets, for Violets. Pete's Violets. sake, what's the matter with you? You've been growing poppies in your office? Now, wait a minute. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Miss Asher on the phone for Diamond. Okay. Phone for you, Rick. Helen. Oh, thanks. Fifth Precinct. Remember our motto? A corpse in the morgue is worth two in your basement. <laughs> oh, no. It's true, Walt. It's true. Oh, that Walt just jumped out of the window. No, honey, there's a cast system around here. When Walt feels like jumping out of a window, he throws Otis out first to see if it hurts. Ouch. Hi, you, baby. Hi. Rick, uh, Mr. Jones called and said it was very important that he see you at once, said it was a matter of life and death. Jones? First name John? Well, he didn't say. He just gave me an address and asked you to come over immediately. 137 River Street. He called me at your apartment? Uh-huh. Hey, I never thought of that. How'd he get the number? Uh, no telling. Well, I'll go on over. Maybe he'll turn out to be a good client. Call you later, baby. How's your throat? Oh, la done, I'm all... <clears throat> Goodbye, Rick. 
Hey, you really sound terrible. Uh, I'll see you later, Walt. Huh? Oh, uh, well, uh, thanks for the brilliant conversation, Sporty. Walt, just because I didn't have a corpse hidden out someplace, you get mad. All right, see if I care. Oh, now, wait a minute. No, no, I understand. Well, you can just get someone else to play jacks with. I'll send you Sam Spade. Uh, now, Rick. Oh. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Why haven't you got that report in here? Uh, I've been eating spaghetti. Spaghetti? Yeah. And that diamond's a liar. I can't lasso nothing. Maybe you have to be a cowboy. Thanks, Gabby. Keep the change. One thirty-seven River Street, the address Helen had given me over the phone, was an old deserted warehouse. Now, I want to stop right here and say I admit it was pretty stupid to wander into an empty warehouse like that. But I figured that this Jones guy must be in some kind of trouble to leave a message like that with Helen. The place was as empty as a fairground in the winter. I put my hand on my thirty-eight and kept moving toward the back of the building. Then I saw a door. A sign on it said, John Jones... Enter. And wouldn't you know it? I did. Hey! Hey, what's going on? Where am I? Let me out of here! Come on, Mr. Lumpkin. Let's get out of here. Let me out of here! But, but I don't understand. He's liable to stay in there forever. I don't want him to stop singing like that. Somebody will come along. I promise you that. I just want him to stay in there for half an hour. That's all. And, and, now, wait a minute. I want to know just what this is all about. You want him to lose his voice, don't you? Oh, I love it. Well, when he went through that door, he started losing it. How? Well, what's behind that door? An ice box. Come on, Mr. Grumpkin. Well, that's exactly where I was, in an ice box. Not a very big one, but a very cold one. The kind a company might have to store fresh meat and drinks. I tried breaking down the door, but it was a foot thick. I struck a match and looked around. Lots of ice, no way out. So I turned up my collar and sat down to wait. <laughs> I don't know how long I sat there, but I guessed it to be about 20 minutes. I could tell because my feet had frozen up about 20 minutes worth. Then I heard that lovely sound. Rick. Rick, you in there? Yeah, yeah. Hand me an ice pick. I want to get my, my feet uncrossed. How on the devil did this happen? Well, I think one of the frozen food companies got a new idea. <laughs> What's the matter, Diamond? Forget oh. your sleigh. Shut up, Otis. Hey. You think you can walk, Rick? Yeah, sure, but I, I might squeak a little. Ooh. Got a Bunsen burner, Andy? <laughs> oh, that's... Oh, okay. How did you find me? We got a call. From a guy named Jones? Yeah. Said he was in danger and that you were coming down to meet him at the warehouse. Said he saw two guys lock you in this icebox. Oh, dandy. Did he say where he was? Yeah. Here's the address. Thanks. Hey, where do you think you're going? Well, I feel better now. I'm going over to find Jones. Well, you might get in trouble. Well, if I can find the two guys who locked me up, you can bet on it. Well, I'm going to send Otis along with you. Otis? I thought you wanted me to keep out of trouble. Oh, now, wait a minute. I can keep you out of trouble, Diamond. Oh, Otis, you couldn't find an elephant in an elevator. Uh, but come on and bring your head with you. This is the address where that Jones guy said he'd meet you. Uh, I Mandelbaum, Swedish massage. Hmm, this guy really picks out some great places to hide out. Come on, Otis. Feet first, or the rest of you will never get out of the car. Oh. Hey, hey, Diamond. You think while you're talking with this guy Jones, I might get me a rub down? Otis, to rub that stomach of yours, it would take a gallon of baby oil and an octopus to get anywhere. Hey, hey it smells kind of good, don't it? Like a pine tree, maybe. Otis, how would you remember? The last time you smelled a pine tree was when you used to run with a pack. Now listen here, Diamond. You gotta lay off. I don't go around... Yeah, what can I do for you? Holy cow. Get the biceps. Oh, I'm looking for a guy named Jones. Oh, yeah? Who wants him? The name's Diamond. Oh. Well, Mr. Jones is expecting you. I think he's back in the steam. Which way is it? Uh, straight back. I'd show you when I gotta give a guy a rub. Come on, Otis. You must be at the end of the hall. That's a pretty bright observation. Seeing as how there's only one door and it's at the end of a hall. Yeah, yeah, that's the steam room. How do you know? 
By this little window in the door. What do you see? Steam. And by golly, it must be the steam room. Hey, I can't see nothing. Uh, Mr. Jones? Hey, ain't that some guy lying over there on the bench? Yeah, looks like it. Mr. Jones? Hmm. He don't answer. No. Oh, just look, I'm going over there. Keep the door open. I don't want anyone to lock me in this place. Oh, okay. Mr. Jones, I... Well, hey, Otis, it's just a bunch of towels rolled up to look like somebody. Yeah. Hey. hey! Otis, what's the matter? Uh, diamond. Yeah, 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 where are you? Right over here. Well, what are you doing there? I told you to stay by the door and keep it open. Well, I did stay by the door until I got pushed. Pushed? Oh, no. You, you know something? What? I think we're locked in. Oh, 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 shut up, Otis. Ah, oh, but I don't feel so good. What are we going to do? Oh, why don't you be happy? It's the only chance you'll ever get to sort off some of that blubber. Yeah, you want I should look like one of them atrocity pictures? Otis, you could lose 300 pounds and still weigh in with King Kong. Yeah, there's no time to get nasty. Well, relax. Read a magazine or something. What do you mean? Just what I said. Read a magazine. Isn't that one right over there? Yeah. Okay. Oh, for Pete's sake. How can I read this thing, Shamus? The pages is all stuck together. You couldn't read the first line of an eye chart anyway. Just look at the pictures and shut up. Okay. Hey! What's the matter? This magazine. Take a look at this. What is it? It's one of them movie magazines, uh, uh, Movie Stars Parade. So what? Well, get a load of these pictures. Ain't that you? Let me see. Well, how about that? Some guy acting like Richard Diamond, private detective. Well, it looks like you. Ah, uh, no, it's that Powell guy, that actor. Tear it up. Oh, no, no, it's a good magazine. Give me that. Ah, oh, hey, what'd you do that for? If it hadn't been for that juvenile, I could have been in pictures myself. Now try kicking in that little window again. Ah, uh, it's no use. That glass must be bulletproof. Oh, swell. First an icebox and now a steam bath. I'm going to start thinking I'm in California. Well, don't just sit there sweating. Do something. My uniform's shrinking. Well, maybe now it'll match your head. I just can't figure this. If someone wants to, well, someone wants to get rid of me, why did they do it the old-fashioned way? Oh, don't say that. Oh, how long do you think we've been in here? I don't know. Hey, Diamond. Yeah? My socks just disappeared. Well, go kick on the door again. It's your turn. I don't think I can make it. We've been in here for days. Hey, Look at your watch. It's all steamed up. I can't tell. You think there'll be anything left? Just your shoes, Otis. It'll take a blast furnace to get rid of those. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I thought I heard somebody outside. Yeah? Hey, hey help! Help! Shut up. Yeah. Hey! Hey, what's going on in here? Who closed the bowl on the door? We're saved? Uh, would you mind helping us out, old man? We seem to be a little limp. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? Hey, what are you doing in here with your clothes on? Trying to get them steam clean. <laughs> oh, fresh air. Now, would you two guys mind telling me what this is all about? Maybe you better tell us, Buster. I don't know what you mean. Who locked the door on us? How do I know? I give a guy a rub. When I come back, I find the door bolted. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? You sure he was in the steam room? Sure. He comes in and says he wants a steam. You should show up. I should send you back. I told him I was going to give a rub to stay in long as he liked. Did he ask you how long the rub would be? Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, he did. Uh, I said it'd be about half hour. I don't get it. I don't get it. He wanted me in that steam room for just a half an hour. He wanted me in that icebox for about the same time. What's with this? Diamond. Look at this uniform. Oh, I think it's lovely, Otis. You should always wear knickers. <laughs> This is stupid. Didn't the guy at the steam room tell you what this Jones guy looked like? Well, from the description, could have been anyone. Look, I'm just as mixed up as you are. Well, we'll keep after it. Just don't worry, that's all. Hey, Diamond. Miss Asher just called and I told her what's been happening. You mean you know? No, but I told her anyway. She said you should come right over because she had dinner for you. And she wanted to take care of you. <laughs> Isn't he lovely, Walt? Think what that head is going to look like in a bottle. Oh, 
Now you got him sore. It's going to be horrible around here. Well, isn't it always? Now well, I'm going on over to Helen's. Keep after that Jones guy and let me know if you run across anything. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Klumpkin? Lumpkin. Okay, how are you? Uh, come in, come in. Well, uh, what happened at the steam bath? Diamond and a friend boiled for a while. You think it did the trick? Look, when Pat... Uh... Uh, Kosak. Yeah, Kosak. Well, when I do anything, the results are guaranteed. I just hailed Diamond from the station. He went into his girlfriend's apartment across the way. Oh, goody. <laughs> Let's see what happens tonight. I'm staying home from work just to hear him not sing. Yeah. About my 50 bucks. Oh, look, he's never in that apartment more than 10 minutes before he starts singing. If he goes over 15, you get your 50. Come on. What are we going to do? Raise the window. I don't want to miss the lovely silence when he opens that big bazoo. <laughs> okay, that looks funny. I'm sorry, Rick, but your clothes have shrunk so much. You should see Otis. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. You don't know what I've been through. Oh, yes, I do, and Mommy's going to make it better. Here's a nice drink. I don't want a nice drink. Oh, it's strong enough. Well, put it in a dirty glass. You just drink it. Okay. Ah, oh, wow, my throat. Ha! You hear something? No, why? Nothing. Your throat's still pretty bad. Mm, don't know. Me, 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 me. Oh, hey, it's pretty good. That sounds great. Oh, no! Now, I heard something then. Yeah, so did I. It's a grouch again. Give it to him. Oh, you bet. I feel mean. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Get a load of honey bun tonight. I'm speaking of my sweetie pie. Only 60 inches high. Every inch is packed with dynamite. Her hair is blonde and curly. Her curls are hurly burly. Her lips are pips. I call her hips. Twirly and whirly. She's my baby. I'm her pap. I'm her booby. She's my trap. I am caught and I don't want to run because I'm having so much fun with honey bun. <laughs> Okay, but don't hit me again. You can keep the 50 bucks. And he wouldn't sing again, huh? Said you'd fix it. Well, I'll fix you. No, not that. Put down that chair. Oh. Go on, get out of here. That vulture is singing better than ever. Okay, okay, only don't hit me again. Hello. Yes, Rick? You know that ice box and that steam bath were the best things in the world for my throat. Yes. After you lost your voice this morning, I didn't think anything was going to help. But that ice box and that steam bath really did. Diamond! Oh, hello, Mr. Lumpkin. Did I hear you say you lost your voice this morning? That's right, Mr. Lumpkin. Then didn't think I was going to get it back either. Good night, Mr. Diamond! You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jack Crucian, and Stephen Dunn. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
Saturday night brings some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned every Saturday for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. NBC.